Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Orange County Board of County Commission meeting of May 23rd, 2020 23. As we begin this morning, uh, we will start with our invocation. Uh, we're going to have Commissioner Michael Scott introduce his guests who will bring the invocation. And following the invocation, uh, Commissioner Scott will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. And after that, our Communications Division Manager, Ms. Jane Wattrell, uh, will read a proclamation recognizing uh, Public Works Week. And Ed Torres, the Utilities uh, Director, will present the H2 Oh, uh, Pipeline uh, graduates uh, this morning, and they have joined us here in the audience. And with that, uh, Commissioner Scott, uh, you are recognized at this time. Thank you. Good morning, Mayor, Commissioners, and everyone. Um, I get the honor of introducing Pastor Daniel Ings. Pastor Ings was born and raised in Orlando, Florida. He is the son of the late Pastor Edward and the late mother Maddie Ings. Pastor Ings graduated from, and I got to say this right because Mayor's listening, the great Jones High School <laughs> in 1996. Go and went on to receive an associate's arts degree from General Studies in Valencia College. He's continued his educational endeavors while studying with various theologians in conference and seminary settings. Pastor Ings grew up in a fire-baptized holiness church of the God of Americas, and from a child he knew that God had a special plan and prophetic call upon his life. At the age of 19, he received Christ and the baptism of the Holy Ghost. In 1998, he accepted his call to preach. He was able to repeat the words of Jesus Christ, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, and set liberty for those that are bruised, St. Luke chapter 4, verse 18. For seven years, Pastor Ings has served faithfully as a youth pastor, inspiring and challenging lives of many young people. In 2005, he was anointed and ordained an elder in the Lord's church. Because of his, of his humility and power-packed communication of the gospel, God has allowed Pastor Ings to travel and preach in various cities and states. In 2010, Pastor Ings answered the pastoral call on his life and established the Fresh Breath International Worship Center in Orlando, Florida. Pastor Ings has been graced with the amazing ability to mentor youth and young adults, especially boys and men that are looking for guidance. In 2005, Pastor Ings began a journey with the Village House program that was sponsored by the Center for Drug League. Free Living, formerly, Aspire, formerly Lakeside, now Aspire Health Partners, which uh, focuses on reduction of drugs and violence prevention for after-school youth. Pastor Ings worked extensively with youth and families in the Ivy Lane, Richmond Heights, and North Lake Man, Pine Hills, and other areas throughout Orange County for the past 15 years as a prevention specialist and program manager. He assisted with the development of other professionals to be a prevention specialist as they continue to impact the lives of boys and girls. On January 8th, 2016, Pastor Ings established Boys to Men Mentoring. This program serves boys ages 10 to 18. These boys see him as a father, a positive moral model, and mentor, and even their pastor. As he teaches these boys spiritual development, possibility, responsibility, commitment, support, and forgiveness. His desire for these young men is that they will apply these tools that they have been given to be fit for the future. Pastor Ings also enjoys creating victory moments in the lives of others. He understands that exposure to great possibilities and significance is significant. Therefore, 30 to 50, or 30, 35 boys have traveled to him to Atlanta, Miami, Tampa, Washington, D.C., Nashville, and New York, just to name a few of the college tours that he's taken them on. His ultimate goal will be always be to witness the transformation of lives, whether it be boys, girls, or any adult in Orange County, to allow them to change for the better. One day he wants to build a transitional house, a transitional crisis center for boys and men mentoring, and he wants to capture the boys while they're at their most vulnerable state so that when society seems that they're not redeemable, they are and become productive members of society. Pastor Ings gives all the glory to God for the strength and ability to impact lives every day. Known for having a righteous discipline and leadership and integrity, Pastor Ings serves as the associate pastor of Agape Perfecting Worship Center under the leadership of Dr. Sharon L. Y. Riley, and he's the proud husband of Lady Naomi Ings for the past 17 years and is the father of one son. It's my honor to introduce you to you, Pastor Daniel Ings. Well, great morning to our honorable mayor, to our board of county commissioners, and to everyone that is present. Uh, thank you for such a warm welcome, Commissioner Scott. Thank you for your leadership and support as you, that you provide to us daily, even in our program. And I appreciate this opportunity to share the words of invocation. Uh, but before I proceed, I want to say thanks uh, to say that all of us have so much to be grateful for. 
um, especially for life after enduring one of the toughest seasons throughout the world, three years after a world pandemic and we're here today. We have so much to be grateful for. But this speaks to the diligence and the guidance of our mayor and our commissioners for keeping our city and our county informed and for the provisions that were made available and accessible uh, during the crucial time. It speaks volumes to the leadership of Orange County government, knowing that you wanted what was best for the citizens of Orlando, Okoye, Winter Garden, Apopka, Biffalo, and the surrounding cities. And for that, we say thank you. As we continue to move forward, and as we continue to embrace and adjust to new norms, the citizens of Orange County will always be resilient. Uh, we have the ability to bounce back because we, we, have, uh, we know what it is to, to recover, because we have recovered before. And from senseless gun violence to hurricane floods, yet we're still standing strong. Lastly, as each of us desire to see crime reduction in safer neighborhoods for our youth, our families, and seniors uh, to live in, I'm grateful to be on the team with the Orange County Sheriff's Department, OPD, along with many crime prevention programs that are doing amazing work here in Orange County. And I personally want to say thank you for allowing the Orange County government and the CRP to grant us funding to operate Boys to Men Mentoring Program, serving boys ages 10 to 18 for the past seven years, empowering parents, and providing tools for them to be successful citizens in life. But we know that there is so much more work to be done. We will always be Orlando strong, and love will always win. So let us pray. Will you bow your heads with me? Father in heaven, we give you glory, we give you thanks, we give you honor for blessing us to live to see a new day. And because you made this day for us, we pause to acknowledge you for your grace, for your mercy, and your love toward us. We are asking for your presence even in this meeting on today. Continue to guide and influence the leadership of Orange County. Thank you for granting them the knowledge, the wisdom, and discernment to make decisions for the enhancement of all of our communities. As we continue to embrace diversity, equity, and inclusion, let your love and kindness abide with each of us. Continue to bless our mayor and our county commissioners, protect and provide for their families and the districts in which they serve. We are declaring and decreeing a special covering over our city and our county. We are declaring your divine protection in our communities, in our workspaces, and even in our schools. As we are celebrating graduations and promotions, keep our youth, faculty, teachers, staff in your care. For we trust in you with all our hearts, and we lean not to our own understanding. But in all of our ways, we acknowledge you, because we know that you will direct our path. For this is our prayer. We believe and we receive, and we thank you in advance that it is already done. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. It is Public Works Week, and we are here to honor the men and women that do so much great work in our community. So, Mayor Demings and Commissioners, and ladies and gentlemen, the proclamation reads. 
whereas the American Public Works Association has selected Connecting the World through Public Works as its theme for the 2023 National Public Works Week and encourages its members to use this week to educate residents about the important contributions of public works professionals who stand ready to respond during natural disasters and trials in the field, and whereas public works services provided in Orange County are an integral part of our residents' everyday lives. And whereas the support and understanding of informed residents is vital to the efficient operation of public works systems and programs to ensure the health, safety, and comfort of our community. And whereas the quality and efficacy of public works activities, as well as planning, design, construction, are vitally dependent upon the effort and skills of public works officials. And whereas the productivity and morale of qualified and dedicated personnel who work in the public works profession are influenced by the community's attitudes and understandings of the very importance of the work that they do. Now, therefore, Jerry L. Demings, by virtue of the authority vested in him as Orange County Mayor, does hereby proclaim the week of May 21st through May 27th as Public Works Week in Orange County, Florida. Done and ordered this 23rd day of May 2023, signed by the mayor and all six members of the Board of County Commissioners. And receiving the proclamation will be Johnny Rosario. He is the Chief Engineer for Public Works. Mr. Rosario? Good morning, Mayor Demings, Commissioners, Mr. Brooke, and all staff attending over here. Uh, National Public Work Week calls the attention for the importance of public works in the community. It also recognizes the hard work of thousands of men and women in North America who plan, build, and maintain the infrastructure, who are dedicated to providing and improving the quality of life to present and future generations. This year, team Connecting the World to Public Works highlights the role of public works in connecting all of us through infrastructure, service, and enhancing the quality of life of the communities we serve. We want to thank Mayor Demings and we want to thank the commissioners, the Board of County Commissioners, for their support through the years to public works. We also want to reiterate our commitment to continue providing the high level of service consistent with Orange County core values and mission. At this time, I want to ask all public works employees that are here to stand up. and be recognized as I receive this proclamation today. Thank you and have a great day.
Mayor and commissioners and ladies and gentlemen, we have another exciting recognition. Uh, this is an impressive program. It's called the H2O Pipeline. And we have the graduates here in the front row dressed in purple. Uh, it's an impressive program these university, of, university high school seniors took part in. So to give you perspective about the H2O, H2O Pipeline program, we're calling Ed Torres up here, who is our utilities director. Ed. Thank you. And good morning, Mayor, Commissioners, and Controller Diamond. I'm here today to introduce and recognize some very special guests sitting here in the front row. Um, these students are the first graduates or, of our H2O program, a workforce program that was launched at the beginning of this school year by Orange County Utilities and Orange County Public Schools. This collaborative program answers a need in the utilities industry and also creates career opportunities right after high school. During their senior year at University High School, the students studied and participated in hands-on training to become wastewater treatment plant operators. Their dedication to the two-semester college-level curriculum was truly inspiring, and all of them, every single one of them, passed the rigorous California State University test. In addition, all of the students that applied were accepted for a paid apprenticeship right at our Eastern Water Reclamation Facility. I want to also recognize our staff, Magali Colon, for instructing the students through the material. Magali. Um, Jessica Green for managing the program and mentoring the students. And, and she's in the back and Bridget Tolley, who ran with the concept and didn't look back until it was fully implemented. And Bridget is sitting back in the middle of the road there. Um, we also have uh, Brian Elliott, who runs the Eastern Water Reclamation Facility and hosted our students several times at that plant. Um, so thank you all for your efforts in delivering this program. In the audience, we also have several representatives from Orange County Public Schools and University High School including Parker Antoine from Career and Technical Education, uh, Tom Ott, University High School Principal, Susie Overall, Career Specialist, and she was a force behind this program also at the school, and School Board Vice Chair Angie Gallo, who's sitting in the back as well. Um, we're grateful for their part uh, partnership and their support through this uh, program. And with that, without further ado, Please join me in congratulating the 2023 H2O Pipeline graduating class. And if, if you can come to the front, we'll take a picture. Thank you all. We will begin with public comment shortly. It was indeed good to have uh, all of the um, graduates here this morning. Uh, they, I asked them if they had already uh, 
had their last classes and everything, and they said yes. So it's just a matter of formality for them uh, with the graduations and moving to the next phase of their lives. So we're very proud of the program that our public works um, department has instituted. With that, uh, this morning uh, we're going to move forward uh, to the next item on our agenda, which is the public comment period. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, members of the public present to come forward uh, who uh, have various topics or interests of concern that falls within this board's authority. Uh, if there are other matters which are not appropriate for public discussion during this public comment period, uh, these matters would include such things as pending procurement or land use issues or concerns that should properly be brought to another board rather uh, than this board. Uh, we will solicit a public input during each public hearing that is scheduled for this afternoon. And with that, Mr. Boyce, do we have anyone uh, who's present who wish to be heard at this time for public comment? Good morning. Yes, sir. We have uh, four individuals from the public that wish to be heard during public comment this morning. Just a few housekeeping items before we begin. I'll call your names uh, three at a time, and if you'll stand on that side wall for me, I'll prompt you to go to the podium, and when you get to the podium, please state your name and address for the record, and you'll be given two minutes each. All right, with that, we'll start with Ms. Cynthia Harris, followed by Terry Bromley, followed by John Jennings. Cynthia Harris. Yeah, I don't see her here this Going morning. Going once. All right. We'll um, move forward to Terry Bromley. Just state your name and address for the record, ma'am. Uh, good morning, uh, Mayor Demings morning. and the Board of Commissioners. My name is Terry Bromley, and I am here today representing the Hunters Creek Community Association, which is located at 14101 Town Loop Boulevard in Orlando. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you about the topic of stormwater management, which is an agenda item scheduled later uh, this morning. Specifically, the potential negative impacts that any future residential or commercial development will have on our waterways. The lakes and ponds in Hunters Creek has been part of the suburban landscape since the establishment of this community. The primary purpose of this interconnected network of waterways was to control flooding and create a comprehensive stormwater management system. Additionally, the lakes and ponds act as catch basins collecting sediment and filtering pollutants, which minimize the introduction of these contaminants into the Shingle Creek. In early 2018, Hunters Creek contracted an environmental science firm to conduct an extensive evaluation of our 109 lakes and ponds in our stormwater management system. The purpose of this evaluation was to provide information on the condition of the current system and any required remedial action to reestablish the health and vitality of our water bodies. Additionally, an ongoing operations and maintenance solution was provided. At that time, the association pledged a long-term commitment to preserve our lakes and ponds and restore them to a healthy state. We have recently entered the fifth year of this 10-year project. There have been significant labor and financial resources, and to date we have made undeniable strides in our stormwater system. By the completion of this proposed restoration, Hunters Creek will have invested approximately $10 million. This is a significant commitment and investment to restore our waterways to their natural state, which benefits Shingle Creek well beyond the Hunters Creek boundaries. The impact of any development uh, of our Lakes and Ponds initiative, particularly as it relates to the golf course parcel, raises a detrimental consequence to the environment and more specifically to our water bodies. And the impact could be um, to, to, to disrupt and impact the delicate balance. I appreciate the opportunity to partner with our county officials and ask that you continue to support us in this initiative. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Romley, for your uh, presence this morning. Uh, we look forward to continuing to working with uh, the Hunters Creek uh, Homeowners Association. Uh, Commissioner Wilson, uh, would you like to make any comments? I just want to thank you, as always, for really, um, first of all, the partnership, the communication, and also for hearing about these things that are so important, not just to Hunters Creek, but to the surrounding area and to really the state of Florida, because that is the headwaters of the Everglades right there. So understanding sort of the impacts on that Shingle Creek and seeing that Hunters Creek has put their money where their mouth is as a group of residents. It's, it's to me a great example and I try to hold it up every chance I get. So thank you for being here and for partnering with us on this. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, we'll move to the next speaker, please. Our next speaker is John Jennings, followed by Thiago Cucci and Kyle Wilson. 
Just state your name and address for the record, sir. My name is John Jennings. My address is 8425 Sand Lake Shores Court on Big Sand Lake. Um, I've been on, uh, I'm here to talk about water, water quality and storm water. I've been on, lived on Big Sand Lake for 34 years. I'm chairman of the advisory board since 1996. <clears throat> I've worked with um, half a dozen commissioners over those, that period of years, um, half a dozen mayors also. And I continue to work for water quality and uh, storm water management. Concerning stormwater management in my life, living on Big Sand Lake, I've watched the, the water change. I've watched the 5,000 acres get developed that flow into a 1,300-acre lake. And the, even though we have retention and detention ponds, it has not been enough. Um, the water level has changed. <clears throat> um, significantly come up over the past 20 years as the land got developed. In fact, uh, 20 years ago, I went around putting these, these things on all the drains, okay? There was about 200 drains, and, and uh, the water level was significantly lower than it is now. I put these on about a year ago. There's 500 drains, at least five or 600 drains I put these on, and you could hear water coming underneath the street like, uh, like rapids, and, and it fills up this, this lake. Well, the lake is well above the normal high water elevation established by the county in 1985 at elevation 91. The part that bothers me is we let these, we, as me a part of the county, we let these developers, we need to hold them accountable for water retention, detention. And I have a hard time understanding why the Orange County uh, established 90, 91, but uh, South Florida Water Management will not realize that. Their elevation is 94. So why does our county continue to do different things Thank you, sir. the state, state feels is okay? Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Jennings, the time goes very uh, quickly, but we, we definitely understand um, the concerns that you're bringing forward today. Um, uh, I live in a neighborhood also off of uh, Ben Lent. Big Sand Lake, so I understand the dilemmas. But our public works, we're we're on it. We're well aware of it, and we will continue to work with you on long-term solutions. Thank you for your presence today. Thank you, man. All right, we're going to have to move to the next uh, speaker at this time. Our next two speakers are jointly together: Tiago Cucci, followed by Kyle Wilson, followed by Melinda Bridges. If you'll state your name and address for the record. Yeah, my name is Tiago Cucci. Uh, address three six six West Island Road. And good morning, Mayor, uh, good morning. Mr. Maribel, and everybody here. Thank and you. Uh, this is Kyle Wilson, same address, but basically wanted to talk today in regards to really helping underprivileged kids. Uh, we're business owners in the community. We live in the community, and one of the things that we're seeing is a lot of kids aren't having access to play sports. Um, so we, we own a local business, and we also have a 501c3 nonprofit. And what we see with a lot of organizations that are youth sports partners, they're not actually going into the community and helping people of, of need. So one of the things that we started doing is connecting with um, county schools. And we're going into, for example, Eckley Stone Elementary, and we offer completely free soccer classes for the community. And that's one of the things that we're trying to get into more of. And we would love the county support to say, listen, we want to get into more schools. Meadowwoods is one of the next ones. And there's one, I don't remember the name, but in Pine downtown Hills Orlando, well. and Pine Hills, one in downtown Orlando that we're working to get into where we can, again, support the community and kids in need because not enough kids are playing soccer or sports in general because the price is simply too high. So we go into these schools, and actually at Eccleston, we have a 40, uh, 40 children wait list where kids are wanting to play, but we don't have the access, the staff, the resources to help all these kids play completely free because there's too many kids with needs that don't have the financial resources to participate. So one of the things that we wanted to ask um, the commissioners and the mayor is what processes can be done, um, one, to help more kids play because a lot of sports organizations that are youth sports partners, they're nonprofits, but they don't do anything to actually help kids in need. And this is one of the things that we feel really we want to try and make an impact in is helping community kids that can't play sports. So even when we were at Bear Creek Recreational Complex, we offered from five to six twice a week free classes for kids to come in and they don't pay anything. And this is something that we feel is really important and impactful for the community. And we really just want help and see if there's ways that we can work together to help more kids play sports. And that's really our, our message for today. 
All right. Uh, thank you for your presence uh, this morning. Uh, we have well, quite a few programs and uh, new initiatives that we're working with you uh, through our Citizens Commission for Children, through our Parks and Recreation Department, <coughs> also uh, through our um, Crime Prevention uh, Children's Initiative and uh, various other things. And so uh, I'm going to look to the county administrator. Say, Tracy uh, Salem uh, will catch you on your way uh, okay. out. And so, uh, Dr. You. Tracy Salem, would you just raise your hand once again? I don't know if they saw you in the back there. But just, uh, if you don't mind, just stop and have a conversation with her. We have uh, a number of um, funding mechanisms that's in place uh, to help our community-based organizations uh, better engage with our youth to uh, involve them in um, positive uh, activities to uh, redirect away from some of the illicit youth uh, activities. Uh, so uh, they'll take time this morning and kind of get you engaged with all of that. Thank you for your presence. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for the great work that you're doing in our community as a, a, a business owner or business owners within our uh, area. Okay, we, uh, uh, I see several of our commissioners uh, push their button. Um, uh, Commissioner Bonilla. I just wanted to say thank you for what you're doing because, you know, growing up, I always wanted to play baseball and not softball, actually, baseball. But um, I couldn't even play safe ball, softball either because we just couldn't afford it. And, you know, I didn't have parents. Well, I was basically raising myself anyway. So it's good that you're going into the schools, too, and reaching out to the kids. So I just wanted to say thank you for what you're doing because there really is a need there. Uh, Commissioner Uribe. I want to say I agree. These organizations are charging a lot of money, and they're using our parks for very minimal fees, and the people who really want to play can't even get on a field to play. Um, I would love, my assistant will give you my card. I will find places for you guys in my district. I have District 3, and it's very infuriating. I'm, I'm fighting this. We're trying to free up some space at the parks because it's not fair. We don't even have a place for them to play. Now school's going to be closed, so you've even got more challenges. So you've got a whole summer with no activities unless they can pay $500 a month to go pay at one of these nonprofits. So keep speaking loudly. We need it. And um, I hope the county will invest because I don't even have a community center, so we're trying. But, uh, but we need it. And uh, let's find locations to do this because if you guys are willing to do this and the county can do it, we, we need it because we're not getting any of the funding over here and we got a lot of kids and we have nowhere for them to go. Agreed. Yep. Yep. Okay. Thank you. The only thing I'll say is it's not an us against them. Okay. Orange County is investing uh, heavily uh, in our youth, and we do engage significantly with community-based organizations. And uh, really, uh, I have to applaud our parks and recreation staff and that team for the work that they're doing. They do the best that they can do. Uh, we, we're a growing community. Uh, in the last decade, our population alone grew by 25%. And just uh, because of all of those demands, probably not enough, but government can never solve all of the issues by itself. It has to partner with businesses like yours. It has to partner with our philanthropic community to make certain that we're doing those things that we should be doing from the YMCA to... Uh, the Boys and Girls Clubs, we have a lot of partnerships on the way in our community. So uh, thank you. Uh, Commissioner gomez Cadero. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have to say thank you to you, too. Well, both of you, I have been in meetings with them as well, and we have been working through, you know, bring things to the community. Um, thank you. And also Matt from Park and Recreation, he also, you know, have been um, trying to help us also to get, you know, these parks and so so you know, it could be um, easier for the, for the kids to come and for you to provide it because we know it costs money because it's not that it doesn't cost. We know that, and I have been in your location. So, But, but thank you for, you know, having that um, initiative to provide that for the kids that cannot pay. But thank you, and we are here to help you as well. Thank you, Piero and Jason. Thank you. All right. Um, we are going to uh, move to the next item on our agenda uh, for uh, Mr. Boyce, I, I don't see anyone else here for public comment. I'm presuming no, sir. that's the last person. All right. Uh, to the, those from the public, thank you for engaging with us. The next item on our agenda is a consent agenda item, and I'm going to call on the county administrator, Mr. Byron Brooks, to present the consent agenda. 
Thank you, Mayor Demings. Have just one item to pull from the consent agenda, and that's item H1. That's H1 is concerning a non-substantial deviation amendment uh, for the quadrangle development of regional impact. That item will be pulled to be considered concurrently uh, with the matter that is subject of public hearing J23 this afternoon. Uh, so with that item, Mayor, pulling H1 to this afternoon, staff presents the remainder of the consent agenda for board consideration. All right. Uh, with the item that has been noted by the county administrator that will be pulled, uh, is there a motion for approval? So moved, Bonilla. All right. We'll have a motion and a second by uh, Commissioner Moore. Welcome. Uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. All right, we have uh, one no. Let the record reflect Commissioner Uribe is voting no on the consent agenda item, and uh, we'll move forward. The motion does pass, uh, six to one. Um, and uh, now we'll, um, we'll move forward to uh, the next item on our agenda, which is the discussion agenda. I'm going to ask, again, the county administrator, Mr. Byron Brooks, to kind of come forward and present uh, an item regarding the appointment of two board members and one citizen member to the 2023 Value Adjustment Board and the designation of two alternative board members and one al alternate citizen member. Uh, with that, uh, Mr. Brooks, you're recognized. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, the, this is item tab, under tab three, page 591 and 592 uh, appointments to the Value Adjustment Board. The Value Adjustment Board is composed of the following two members of the board of county commissioners with two designated alternates one citizen member appointed by the board of county commissioners uh, who must own homestead property within the county and one designated alternate and one member of the school board and one citizen member appointed by the school board this morning the board of county commissioners is being asked to appoint two commissioners and one citizen to the value adjustment board and designate two commissioners and one citizen as the alternates. Uh, currently, uh, Commissioner Uribe and Commissioner Gomez Cadero uh, serve on the value adjustment board and as noted in the backup mem uh, memorandum, they have indicated they're willing to serve again, uh, subject to the board's pleasure. And so with that, Mayor, uh, this item is open to discussion for the board. All right, uh, Commissioner Uribe uh, has indicated a desire to speak. Any commissioners who may be interested in serving, uh, now would be the time to speak. Commissioner Uribe, you are recognized. Yes, uh, thank you, Mayor. It's been a pleasure to serve on this board. I think um, Commissioner Gomez Cordero and I have done two terms, normally not a very attractive board, but we have enjoyed participating in this process, and I would uh, be honored to uh, be participate on this board again for the next year unless there's someone who is passionate about joining the value adjustment board and would like to do it <laughs> uh, and uh, comptroller diamond this is an awesome board isn't it yes <laughs> well, it, it is because we've got an awesome staff yes all right uh commissioner bonilla yeah i was just wondering what the appointments had been if we could get some of that history so yes in your it was provided. And, but if there's someone who already wants to serve like if there's two people then I guess we could skip the whole discussion because <laughs> the choice is easy all right uh, all right Byron do you have any oh I thought, were you asking for the history it was provided that was in your backup of the well, appointment who wants to serve on it like who I go okay, back to her question who's passionate about it and we could start okay. there so. that's part of this discussion this morning so uh, Commissioner Uribe has indicated that she's interested in serving anyone else all right Commissioner Gomez Cadero is uh, indicating that she uh, wishes to continue serving uh, if we don't sit I look down the road uh, uh, commissioners are, are fine with that and so uh, with that if we can uh have a motion so moved wilson Second one. okay we have a motion for commissioner uribe and commissioner uh gomez cadero to continue serving uh is there a second yes second. second uh commissioner moore all in favor say aye aye opposed no uh, 
The motion passes, and it is unanimous on that. And we have one citizen, correct? Uh, correct, as well as you need to appoint two alternates among okay. the commissioners. And so. now, uh, in terms of uh, commissioners who would like to serve as alternates, do we have any interest? Okay. Commissioner Moore is indicating that she would serve as an alternate. And Commissioner Wilson. Okay. So is there a motion? So moved, Jeribe. All right. We have a motion and a second. Uh, yeah. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. All right. At least these commissioners are, are, are present when you get nominated up. So they, they uh, <laughs> uh, so thank you all for your willingness to, to serve as the alternates. And now to the citizen. So the citizen uh, appointed currently, Robert Caldwell, serves as the uh, citizen member on the Value Adjustment Board. And he's expressed an interest in continuing to serve. And Rui Hawkins currently serves as an alternate oh, on that board. And All right. Expressed, uh, expressed a uh, willingness to continue to serve. Okay. So we have Mr. Robert Caldwell and Mr. Rui Hawkins. Uh, uh, is that correct, Baron? Okay. And given that, is there a motion uh, to... Uh, nominate uh, Mr. Caldwell uh, as the um, member so and moved. Mr. Rui Hawkins as the alternate. Okay. So uh, we have a motion by second. Commissioner Gomez Cadero. Uh, I believe the second was uh, Commissioner Bonilla first uh, on the second. Um, no further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Uh, the motion passes and it is unanimous. All right, thank you. All right, we'll then uh, move on to the next item on our agenda. This is a discussion agenda item. And Ms. Carrie Black, our Chief Sustainability and Resiliency Officer, will come forward to present the Orange County Sustainability and Resiliency Update. Uh, this is for informational action. Um, I have to say that since she's been aboard, she has been laser focused uh, in this area, and we're glad to have her as a member of our team here within Orange County. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Black, and then she'll make some additional acknowledgments. Thank you so much. Good morning, Mayor, Commissioners, Comptroller Diamond. I'm Carrie Black, Chief Sustainability and Resilience Officer, and it is a pleasure to be here with you this morning. Um, so today we are going to highlight the accomplishments in sustainability and resilience um, since the last time we gave a board update, which was around a year ago. Um, we will start with an update um, from our sustainable, uh, sustainability advisory board, and then we'll move into our community-wide accomplishments, grants, and then spend the bulk of our time on our sustainable operations and resilience action plan, or as we fondly call it, the SOWRAP. So to give our Sustainability Advisory Board annual report, I'd like to introduce our uh, recently promoted to past chair, Ms. Madeline Almodovar. Welcome, Ms. Almodovar. Hi. Thank you, Carrie. Good morning, Mayor, Commissioners, Controller Diamond. Uh, my name is uh, Madeline Almodovar, and I'm a successful project manager and environmental scientist with Jacob Solutions. I have been an Orange County resident for the last nine years with my three daughters. And I've been a member of the Orange County Sustainability Advisory Board, or SAB, for five years. I also currently serve as the Vice Chair of the Parks Advisory Board. It has been truly an honor to serve as the SAB Chair for the last two years, and I will continue to serve in my education and at large position moving forward. With us in the audience today is our new SAP chair, Susi Torriente. Thank you for taking over as chair. And our sustainability advisory board is composed of nine committed members of our local community with diverse expertise and experience, including academia, business, science, and engineering, law, health, and wellness, and nonprofit organizations. Since 2014, the SAP has provided oversight and direction to ensure implementation and continuous improvement of our sustainability and resilience goals and targets, including county operations and the overall community. We recently welcomed two new members, Mikesh and Shona. I would like to thank our former member, Ken Peach, 
and Shayna Carson, who will depart the SAP shortly, for their invaluable service to the SAP all these years. I would also like to thank Jeff Benavides, our former Sustainability and Resilience Officer, as we have now smoothly transitioned to working with Carrie Black. And as always, thanks to Lori Forsman for all her guidance and support, and our other team members and staff from the county that have supported us through the years. We are glad to report that in 2022, the SAB was actively involved in the review of the tree protection ordinance, as well as learning about and providing feedback on our greenhouse gas inventory, the Orange County Convention Center Sustainability Plan, and the implementation status of the Sustainable Operations and Resilience Action Plan, or SORAP. The SAB also actively supported several community efforts, such as the EPA building blocks, workshops on heat and climate displacement, and discuss legislation, programs, and initiatives, such as the Federal Infrastructure, infrastructure Bill, the Arts and Cultural Venues Sustainability Practices, and the County's Transportation Initiative. But I will say that in 2022, the staff dedicated its most substantial efforts to complete the process of updating and transitioning applicable strategies from the 2014 Sustainable Orange County Plan into the Vision 2050 Comprehensive Plan and providing additional input. And that is because the Sustainability Advisory Board recognizes the importance of the Vision 2050 Comprehensive Plan in guiding the future of Orange County. The Board worked to ensure that sustainability and resilience are addressed in every chapter so that the future of Orange County includes balanced, equitable growth, a focus on protecting and conserving natural resources and creation of vibrant communities um, that enhance health and well-being for all. The plan aims to strengthen the resilience of both our built environment and of our residents as we continue to prepare for climate impacts, especially in climate justice areas, while also taking the necessary steps to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in coordination with our partners. As part of our mission, to ensure continuous improvement. The Sustainability Advisory Board stands ready to oversee the progress of the sustainability and resilience goals, objectives, and policies embodied in Vision 2050. Also, as we updated our staff five-year strategic plan created in 2021, we incorporated the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals as, and the county's focus on people places and prosperity within each of our members' roles. Working closely with the Office of Sustainability and Resilience, we align priorities and goals to continue to track status and progress, streamline our annual updates, and provide focused year-round oversight. While doing so, we prepare to address the 2023's county's priorities. And these may sound familiar, as we are actively discussing within the board. For example, the wetlands ordinance, groundwater study, and stormwater plans. At the same time, we continue to monitor action items and metrics of the Sustainable Operations and Resilience Action Plan. We are also tracking the East Central Florida Regional Planning Council Regional Resilience Collaborative efforts and look forward to keep supporting these opportunities to build resilience throughout the community including ongoing and new grant opportunities. And talking about leading by example, optimizing our operations, and positively influencing cities and counties alike, we would like to again congratulate Orange County for becoming the first county in East Central Florida to earn the Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, or LEAD, for cities and communities, goal certification by the U.S. Green Building Council. We encourage the county to continue aiming high in all these endeavors. And as our county grows and develops in a sustainable and resilient way, we look forward to another year creating together the Orange County of the future that we can all enjoy today. Thank you. All right, uh, before you leave, let me just acknowledge uh, your volunteer leadership for these last several years. Uh, 
much of that was during some difficult times uh, with meetings because of uh, the pandemic, having to meet virtually and yet stay focused on the mission you have done, a yeoman's job. We appreciate uh, your work and uh, really um, the uh, enthusiasm that you have uh, you know, brought uh, <laughs> to this, uh, the, this space that we're in. We uh, do look forward to working with Ms. Toriante uh, as she comes in as the, the, the new chair. Uh, I'm sure she'll do just a fine job as well. So uh, thank you to all of, of the members of the uh, Sustainability Advisory Board for uh, the work that you're doing. I'm not sure if we have any of the other members who are present here today or not. Uh, I don't see others here, but uh, we thank all of them for your service as well. Appreciate thank you. Thank you, Mayor. All right. All right. All right. Commissioner Wilson, did you have a comment on this item? No, I can wait. Okay. All right. Um, thank you very much. All right. Uh, we'll turn it back over to Ms. Black. Thank you so much, Ms. Almodovar. And we do, we really do have great board members, um, and they are doing a fantastic job. So um, thank you so much for being here. So now we are going to move into our community wide accomplishments. So uh, last year, we celebrated the LEED Gold for Community Certification that Orange County earned. And we were one of only 18 counties across the nation to earn this. And um, I love how these pictures de depict how it, it sustainability really is cross-departmental um, and just the phenomenal work of all of our county staff. So we excelled in numerous areas, including public electric vehicle charging infrastructure, innovation and partnerships, as well as our unique programs such as diverting waste, special waste items from the landfill, as well as our septic to sewer program. And then this past fall, we, along with other area partners, held an election campaign sign recycling program. In 2020, when we had this program before, we diverted a little over 5,400 pounds of waste from the landfill. This past fall, we diverted over 11,000 pounds, so more, more than double. So as a, we have a growing need to meet mobile and flexible um, essential services for all residents, our office, along with OEM and Duke Energy, partnered to develop and launch the first for Orange County Resilience Pod, which we call the Help Now Mobile Resource Center. The mobility of this trailer allows it to act as a brick and mortar setup in areas that have been previously hard to reach, ensuring equitable assistance for all county residents by quickly rolling out community aid to impacted neighborhoods. It can be used after extreme weather events as well as um, just regular county um, outreach activities and is available for all county departments to use. And there really is truly power in partnerships, and we highlighted this in our uh, NACO Award uh, 2022 for County Resiliency. In this award, we highlighted our partnerships with the Solar Energy Loan Fund, also known as SELF, which provides financing to individuals who are rebuilding their credit so that they can do home energy efficiency upgrades and be able to see those savings on their utility bills. We also highlighted our partnership with SUN, Solar United Neighbors, which leads uh, solar co-ops for the counties. And then also our work with our fantastic team members in community and family services and the Senior Climate Efficiency Program, which addresses the HVAC uh, needs of our seniors in our community. So now we are going to move on to grants. It is a fantastic time uh, for funding, for sustainability and resiliency. Um, and so we have been awarded several grants that we are highlighting here, and then we've also applied for several grants. Uh, so the first grant is the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Block Grant, also known as EECBG. Um, we have submitted our pre-award application, letting the federal government know that we will be taking those funds, which are about a little over $800,000. And these funds can be used for energy audits, energy transition plans, ED plans, and more. So that is great funding that will be coming to our county to help with these efforts. Additionally, we have applied for the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant, or the CPRG. 
Um, this is a million dollars uh, formula funding that is coming to our MSA of Orlando, Kissimmee, and Sanford. Um, so it really actually includes four counties. And because this funding was so regional in scope, um, we determined that it was best to have the East Central Florida Regional Planning Council take the lead um, as the deliverable for this grant was to develop a climate action plan. Um, so that is moving forward as well. And then also our Resilient Florida planning grant. Um, you've heard about this in the stormwater presentations. We've received $420,000 to do a vulnerability assessment um, as well as community, or education and outreach. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. And then we've also applied to several grants, including the Environmental Justice Government to Government, EJG2G. None of these have very short names at all. Um, <laughs> But EPD took the lead, and Wanda Parker um, and EPD really um, created a partnership with the Coalition of 100 Black Women, and this grant application will focus on air quality monitoring. Um, it is a highly competitive um, grant, but um, regardless of how this goes, we are keeping our fingers crossed and we are optimistic, but it sets us up really well for other future funding opportunities as well. And then we've also um, applied for community project funding with our U.S. Uh, representatives, and so the funding goes for, uh, the requests have been for $2 million for Green Place land acquisition, as well as then funding for that Senior Climate Efficiency Program, and then funding also for transportation mobility hubs, which provide a consolidated uh, transit mode change location for our residents. So then moving on to our Sustainable Operations and Resilience Action Plan update. So just to provide a brief background update, uh, this plan was adopted by the board in January of 2021. There are 17 goals, much like the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, um, and they are cross-departmental, but essentially they fall into kind of six categories. So energy, building, water, mobility and fleet, supply chain and materials management, so waste and recycling, and then also our natural resources. So um, within these 17 goals, there are approximately 111 short-term actions, and they were not all created the same. Um, they vary in complexity, cost, and also then time requirement. And they are all time-based, so um, about 60% of these short-term actions were originally planned for completion by the end of this fiscal year, and we'll touch on that a little bit more at the end of this presentation. So moving on to energy and climate action, our first area. Um, in February, we did the final push off of the floating solar array at the Southern Regional Water Supply Facility. Um, the official ribbon cutting and final energization is coming soon, um, but this is a great initiative by our utilities department, um, and it will help meet 21% of the energy needs at this facility, as well as save $140,000 annually. So additionally, in this section, um, we have 4.2 megawatts of solar, um, either in construction and coming online, um, existing or purchased, and this is up from 1.1 megawatts in 2019. So this is, this is huge, this is a big investment. We're talking about megawatts, not kilowatts. So this, this is big. Um, but then to also put it in perspective, our second goal is to achieve 100% of the county's um, operations electricity load from clean renewable sources by 2035. And so to achieve that, we need 180 megawatts more of solar. So we have our work cut out for us. Um, but additionally, um, we also have great partnerships um, to help with solar and renewable and energy efficiency in the community. Um, so last year, uh, we funded a, a solar co-op, and it was the seventh annual, and 57 residents moved forward with solar, and so that will add 683 kilowatts of new residential solar um, within the community. And with the approval of today's consent agenda, um, we will be funding another solar co-op for later this summer um, and fall. We also partner with SELF and SEP, that's Senior Climate Efficiency Program for Home Energy Efficiency Upgrades. So lots of great partnerships in this area. Uh, for the short-term actions of the 25 in this area, 21 have either been completed or an in progress. And you'll see kind of this metric uh, ticker at the end of each of the slides in uh, different areas that we'll be talking about. So moving on to buildings and infrastructure. 
This past year, we signed the Department of Energy's Better Buildings Challenge, which really seeks to make uh, America's buildings more energy efficient. Um, and so with this challenge, they require that basically uh, your entire building portfolio see a 20% energy reduction within 10 years. And Orange County decided we are not going to do just that. We're going to go for a 30% energy reduction. So uh, we have signed on to that challenge and are working very diligently on it. So as part of that, um, our new construction projects are being built to high performance green building standards, um, which will just help make sure that all the new construction is already energy efficient from the, from the outset. Additionally, our energy data management has continued to improve. Lots of people have worked on this, um, but specifically Ruth R. in facilities has really been diligently working on this. We have over 500 meters, um, and what gets measured can get managed, and so it has really been a labor to get the um, energy data into Energy Cap so that we can analyze it and be able to take uh, appropriate action. And then also the vulnerability assessment um, from Resilient Florida will come into play in this area. So as part of this planning assessment grant, um, we will be able to assess the vulnerability of our critical assets as uh, defined by Florida state statute, and we will look at how they will do um, in light of several climate change scenarios as well as 100-year floods. And this grant is very helpful because then after we do this uh, vulnerability assessment, it will make us eligible to then uh, tap into implementation funds as well. So moving on to water use and quality. The Hamlin Water Reclamation Facility officially opened this spring and serves 40,000 Orange County residents. Uh, this facility was the first one to open in the last 30 years um, and is designed to use advanced wastewater treatment. So also in, waste, in water use and quality, uh, the Low Impact Development, or LID, design manual is nearing completion. Uh, that will help with on-site water infiltration. Uh, and our utilities department continues to successfully meet growing water demand. Um, we saw an increase of 1 billion uh, gallons of water from 2019 to 2021 in demand, and they successfully met that um, with conservation and uh, efficiency being key drivers in that. We also had a great partnership with UCF students to evaluate stormwater ponds as part of their senior capstone program, and this helps public works as they seek to prioritize the needs among the numerous ponds that they manage. And then also our groundwater vulnerability study was completed early, and they will be presenting that later this summer before the board. Mobility and fleet is our next section. Uh, nationally, the transportation accounts for one-third of all greenhouse gas emissions, and the national decarbonization goal is to achieve a 50% reduction in all greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. So transportation will definitely play a critical role in this uh, goal. And so in order to achieve it, it will require a multi-pronged approach, um, which are local goals of increasing EV charging infrastructure, fleet electrification, and fleet vehicle efficiency improvement all seek to address. And this image here is the site design for one of the DC fast chargers that we are partnering with Duke Energy to install at our East Orange Community Center. So goal 12 uh, was accomplished and accomplished early. This goal sought to improve vehicle, bicycle, and pedestrian roadway safety, resilience, and interoperability through traffic technology retrofits at 300 intersections by 2025. Uh, the goal was aimed at improving pedestrian uh, safety with the timing of lights and walk signals and allows for light traffic light synchronization so that way it helps reduce uh, vehicle idling, which helps reduce greenhouse gas emissions, um, and is also a great first step to um, our other plans of our ADA transition plan, so it'll help lead to more access accessibility improvements, as well as then lead well into our Vision Zero plan. For our other goals in this area, we are working on installing DC fast chargers with both of our utility providers um, at county properties around the, around the county. And then in April, um, the remote hybrid work policy was created uh, for Orange County employees and it was approved by the board uh, as a management tool that can be used when it is reasonable and practical to do so. And this just helps us address our own employee uh, vehicle miles traveled and then uh, greenhouse gas emissions as well. So moving on to supply chain and materials management. 
David Gregory and Solid Waste and the procurement team have been working very uh, hard and diligently to really uh, launch this RFP for our materials recovery facility, our uh, MRF. Um, and so this is a unique uh, partnership, so a public-private partnership, and they've been really working to make sure we can get industry feedback so that the RFP will be successful, so that the MRF will be successful. So they have both been working very uh, diligently on this, and that should be opening up soon. And our solid waste team has also been working with the Planning Council um, and, the, and the Planning Council's Waste Critical Assets Task Force. And this task force has been working to identify and develop a strategy to address vulnerabilities of the waste system in our region, uh, such as future capacity as well as CDL drivers. And that information from that task force will then help inform the development of our sustainable materials management plan that we are kicking off after experiencing some delays uh, due to pressing solid waste matters from the hurricanes. And procurement has gone paperless, except for that one piece of paper that they have to post for public notice. And this is just a huge testament to a process uh, for their RFP process that used to be very paper intensive. And now that they have gone paperless, they're really leading by example. And so a huge kudos um, to the procurement team for that. And then to, to round out this section, uh, Great Oaks Village has wrapped up their first uh, year of composting their food waste, and they have diverted over 4,000 pounds of food waste from the landfill and making that compost that then will be available for local farmers. So our last section, section is trees and lands. And this picture is from our latest uh, Green Place ribbon cutting um, over in Christmas, and it was part of our Earth Week uh, celebration, and this was at the Dell property in Christmas. So lots of work is happening in this area. The tree ordinance update is uh, scheduled for a work session later this afternoon. Green Place properties uh, purchases continue to increase. We've uh, purchased over 5,000 acres since uh, the board allotted the program $100 million and, and more are coming. Um, we've also received numerous recognition from the National Arbor Day Foundation. We uh, received our Tree City USA recognition for the 16th year in a row. Um, and then we're also looking to do a tree inventory next fiscal year with EPD heading that up. Thank you, Jane Gregory. Um, and then also the tree team continues to meet to review our short-term actions to ensure steps um, to ensure that those short-term actions help meet that tree canopy goal. So again, lots of work in, in this area. So we are going to move on to our next steps. So the so wrap, we have lots of aggressive goals and aggressive timelines, and with about 60% of those short-term actions set to be accomplished by the end of this fiscal year. Um, we've experienced supply chain delays, much like every, everyone else, and um, so we are going to kind of circle back with our internal stakeholder teams, review the timelines, and provide updates to some of those goals just in light of some of these um, kind of unanticipated uh, roadblocks that we have faced. But then we're also going to make sure that we go through and have uh, clear, concise implementation strategies, uh, review our KPIs, our key performance indicators, and make sure that those short-term actions support those. And if they don't, add in some to make sure that we are meeting those metrics and can achieve those goals. Um, and again, just uh, providing some more implementation strategy for those short-term actions. But this, is, this has been part of the plan from, from the get-go, um, part of that lean concept of the dimming cycle, which is plan, do, check, act. We are in check, and we've been doing, and so now it's a great time to kind of take a step back, reevaluate, um, and then continue charging forward because we have a lot of critical work to do. <coughs> so in summary, over the past year, the county has realized major community-wide accomplishments with the work and partnership of county departments and divisions, as well as with the assistance of our advisory board. We are actively pursuing federal and state grants, and the SOAP is progressing, and we're going to be adding in some additional implementation strategy. And with that, it concludes my presentation. All right. I'm going to open it up for questions or comments uh, by members of the board, and we'll start with Commissioner Wilson. Thank you so much, and thank you for spending some time with me this week and talking about this. I think that it's, you know, I want to really shout out to the advisory board that gets together. I think that a lot of people think that those things are window dressing. It is a heavy lift, and this advisory board is very much a roll your sleeves up and lift type of advisory board. So thank you for your continued work on this. Um, I also want to say to the team that worked on Vision 2050, 
I know there's been a lot of focus right now on the pieces and parts that we're trying to make sure we get right before transmittal. I am all in on that. But the reality of it is, if you go back and look at the last iteration, the you know, 2030 plan, and then you go through the Vision 2050, the one thing that is so consistent and threaded all the way through are these sustainability goals. And so I really want to thank you. I know that that was a huge lift, and we're not there yet as far as getting it to that transmittal, but you know, that is how we make these changes. Because quite frankly, so wrap, fantastic on paper. But until it's in all the governing documents, in all the layers and levels, we don't get the actual culture shift. And that's the part that I think is, is difficult, right? Because we understand that, to your point about the uh, moonshots on some of these things, we've got to put the goals out there and we have to have the under, underpinning so that everybody, as they approach budget season or their CIP or whatever else they're doing, that that structure is in place. And that it's, you know, not just because they want to do the right thing, it's because we've put it in place and it's now part of the way we do business here. So thank you so much for that. Um, I, I will say I hope that when um, we go back out to the floating solar array or to any of these things, that we try to get, I was disappointed not to see media in the room today. I think about the things that, that they show up for and I think this is some really big and important topics. And, and you know, they'll be here after the storm I would love to have seen them show up and, and listen to the things that we're doing and working on and that we need community buy-in for. Um, you look at the work that our utilities department is doing right now, and to me it should be headline news as far as what they're doing in order to make sure that we are resilient and sustainable. So anyway, thank you very much for all of your work. Thank you. Commissioner Bonilla. Yeah, I'll just jump on where you kind of left off. The media is interested in what gets clicks. <laughs> so they're looking for controversial stuff, not what we're doing, because this doesn't get the clicks. Um, but this is why we have a challenge, though. We're doing so many things here in Orange County, and the, the public doesn't know about it. We're trying to get, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get people to the town hall meetings for Vision 2050, and, you know, it's a struggle because, you know, just getting the word out there, unless it's something that this huge development's coming to your neighborhood, you know, it's hard to get the media to report on it and the people to show up. So, um, yeah, but we need that. We need the people to understand what we're doing so that they can then put in their feedback. And it's just that cycle of collaboration that we need. Um, but I will say, um, so Vision 2050, I was asking about that because I know in some of the presentations, though, it says that this... Now, I could be wrong, but from what I remember seeing, the so wrap was included in 2050, but then when I talk to you, it's not the SOWRAP that was included. It was the policies in the previous, well, our current comprehensive plan that was then transferred into Vision 2050, not the SOWRAP, which is more internal. I just want to confirm that I understood that, and that's what we mentioned in our meeting. Yeah, yeah. So it's from our Home for Life plan um, that was developed in 2014, which is more kind of external community-facing. That was the plan that we took and incorporated into Vision 2050. Okay. And then... I don't want to speak for, but I know that the, the language in the 2014 iteration is, was insufficient. I believe the newer iteration is, is a little more robust throughout each chapter. Okay, and another thing that um, I talked with you about at our meeting is, you know, I've, I've worked at, well, on the East Central Florida Regional Planning Council, you know, was there when we started the, the Resiliency Action Plan, and, you know, one of the, the things I wanted in there was health, the health pillar, because, you know, after all, like everything that we work on with resiliency, environmental, um, sustainability, all affects our health. And, you know, we want it to positively affect people. And because, you know, we're on this planet, <laughs> we're trying to survive, right? And so that was very important to me that that pillar was implemented. So I definitely want to make sure that that re regional resiliency action plan that we're working on with all these pillars that we've as Orange County had signed on to, that those are incorporated into our Vision 2050 as well. And so I just want to make sure that when we're going through this Vision 2050 that that's incorporated because, you know, that's a regional plan. And if we all don't do our part, then it's going to fall apart. So we really need to make sure that we are taking real action on that as well as other counties in our individual plans as well. Um, and I know you said that you were going to do a side-by-side -side comparison on that, so thank you so much for that, you know, proactiveness of yours. 
Um, I also, we talked about the solar panels because a lot of people are having issues with their roofs right now. Um, like, I'm even wondering, I have to replace my roof now before September um, because of the age of it or I'll be dropped from my insurance. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't have solar panels on my roof, but if I did, that would be very concerning because I would just add on to the cost. And I'm get, seeing in the news a lot of people actually being dropped from their homeowner's insurance because of having solar panels on their homes. So I would definitely like to look at our policies and where we can allow people to place solar panels besides on the roof. So like I have six acres, so if I wanted solar panels, I don't have to put it on my roof. I have space to put it someplace else, but I do know that with our county zoning policies, we have restrictions on where those solar panels can go. So I think we should definitely look at that to give people other options if they don't want to put it on their roof because of, you know, <laughs> her, well, insurance, you know, the, um, from what I read too, like it actually protects your roof better if you have solar panels with hurricanes, but the insurance companies unfortunately are not um, seeing that. So, you know, just we need to give people other options for that. Um, and then with Vision 2050 also, I want to like ask the questions, what can new communities and new developments do to provide community-based solar energy sources? Because I know there's some, I've been to, to and towards some develop, new developments that have incorporated these solar panel farms that feed their development. Um, they had, you know, the room for it, the place for it. Um, people are now starting to put solar panels on retention ponds. Um, so what can these new communities that are coming in, what can we require them to do in our Vision 2050 or ask them to do so that they're taking responsibility for, you know, sustainability and resiliency within their communities that they're building. Because it's just unreasonable that they come in, they make all these profits, they have these people move in, and then now it's on the county that we have to now help them become more resilient or sustainable when it could have been done when the development was made. And it would just save so much energy and money. And I mean energy as in people, energy <laughs> and money and tax dollars um, if we do it in the front end. Um, and also, you know, the, um, so I was at the Valent, no, sorry, I'm getting the, the Seminole College, <laughs> no, I say, and they have this whole automotive program and the, the dean there was saying how you know, we're trying to push people to get electric vehicles, but there's not enough chargers out there for it. So Envision 2050 also, what can we do to make sure that these new communities are providing these options for newly built homes, that they have a, a fast charger option that they could install? Um, I don't know if they're doing that now, but hey, if I was a, a home builder, like that would be one of my, hey, do you want this in your new home <laughs> options? Yeah, I mean, I, that would be good business, right? Yeah. So, you know, things like that. Um, and I don't know what, I'm sure there's other ideas too that we can incorporate into Vision 2050 that's new, um, trending, whatever that we can implement to make sure that these new developments are providing that. Um, I, I know, I think we all had our meetings with emergency management. Um, and that was another thing. I asked them if they were involved in Vision 2050, and they said not so much. But they should have been because, you know, we have these shelters and stuff that we provide during hurricanes. But there was this apartment complex that we had to go in and save people because the first floor of the apartments was flooded, like, above their heads. And then out in front was their office building, high and dry, but everything was low. So it seems like they knew what could possibly happen to me when I'm looking at that and how it was developed. But you know, if they're gonna do that, they should have had an emergency plan for that development and they should have been ready to shelter people in their office building rather than those people having to go to us looking for shelter. So that's an emergency plan that we could also require from new developments you know, in our vision 2050, like, can they also be resilient when it comes to emergencies so that we're not trying to do everything ourselves? You know, those partnerships and those collaborations should be happening. Um, so that's all I have. Thank you so much.
Yeah, it, um, there, so there was a lot there, but if I could definitely speak to um, the solar and um, potentially like uh, homeowners insurance dropping people because of the solar, that is the true benefit of these solar co-ops because Solar United Neighbors, they're a nonprofit, 501c3, and they help walk our residents through the whole process um, and making sure that it's a competitive bid process for the vendors and, and answering their questions all along the way. And so that is one of the biggest benefits of that co-op to help address concerns um, of our residents. So um, that way they can help, help answer any of those concerns if those come up for our, for our residents. Yes, thank you. Commissioner Uribe. Hi there. Thank you. That was a lot of information. I did want to point out the solar panel issue. It's become a growing problem, too. Um, we're seeing more and more people take advantage of our consumers and homeowners in our community. And, and have we looked at possibly doing something proactively to assist in this? I know that we have a consumer protection division, but I've, I've heard people who haven't, when they're installing, they're not installing them appropriately so that they're gaining the biggest benefit of the solar energy. Um, a lot of these companies are coming in, offering the world, not finishing. A lot of this, every time you look on the news, consumer reports are, you know, this person got left without the connectivity, so they're paying both the loan on the solar panel and their, and their light bill. And, and people are starting to get scared now. And so something that should have been great for environment and protection and going forward are now hesitant. And so... Any thoughts on that or, or us taking that on as more educational? And then also, do we, are we looking at offering any assistance to help people transition to that? I, I mean, they're usually very high bills. I think my quote was over $100,000 to do. That's another mortgage, you know? And so this is all on a hope and a dream. And just curious to have your take on it. Yeah, yeah. So, um, again, the solar co-op is great because you do get the economies of scale. So by going in with neighbors, that helps reduce the price of the, the solar. Um, and then also with the Inflation Reduction Act, that 30 percent um, being able to, to take that for getting solar. So there's federal things that are helping with bringing down the cost of solar. Yeah, but what's our role in this? Yeah, so by, by putting on the, the solar co-op, we're helping uh, – residents be able to take advantage of that economy of scales and also helping address some of that predatory, uh, making sure that the um, vendors that are putting in uh, bids to service basically all these residents, making sure that they are licensed, insured, and reputable. Um, and so we can definitely, there's definitely more room that we could act in this space because it is unfortunate. We, we need to go to renewables and alternative energy, and there are definitely um, some, some bad actors out there, unfortunately. And so there is, is more room that we can look into this to see what we can play um, to help kind of protect our residents in this area. But then this is uh, kind of one thing that we're doing right now is the solar co-op um, where they do provide kind of that uh, third-party guidance of here's, you know, based off of all of our experience and being able to provide some kind of knowledgeable advice along the way. So is this something you guys are going to try to do more? Because I don't hear about this enough, but I hear the concern. So I'm trying to ask what, 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 is, what are you guys going to hopefully try to put together so that we can get this message out to our residents? Because right now we're not hearing it. Um, I have heard also about the dropping on the uh, solar on the on the roof too, and that's concerning, because and I but I've heard it's because of the cost. If they do have to replace something, the cost to remove and re put is so high that insurance companies would just rather say, "We'll drop you." So there's definitely some big big issues out there, and we can definitely look more into this. Um, it's it's an area that we're just beginning to to look into, and so we can definitely uh, get with your office as well to kind of. Hear, uh, get that information that you're hearing from the residents, and then also, yeah, look more into this um, as we move forward, because it definitely is a concern. It's the area that we need to move into, and so we can kind of get with our industry partners as well, and then also uh, reach out to industry insurance agencies to find out the concerns and um, be able to do kind of some more research on that and be able to determine the next best steps. Because um, ultimately, this is where we need to go. We do need to go into renewables, but we do need to address some of these concerns. So it's definitely an area that we can do yes. more Yes, and I, and I hear a lot. I was recently at a climate change event in, um, at UCF, and, you know, they talk about these rechargeable, you know, cars, these electric cars and so forth. But what, so, what they don't talk about is the lithium batteries are actually more, more, harmless, more harming to our environment and explosives than regular batteries. And although we're not keeping up with the charging stations, Electric cars don't have alternators. So while they're taking us off the dependency of gas, they're forcing us 
to be dependent on electricity, as opposed to putting an alternator in these electric cars would not require all of this. I think it's quite interesting. When we brought that topic up, they totally dodged it because it's a new way of making us dependent on something else. So it's, it's quite interesting. And, I, and also, there were, before your time when Jeff was here, you know, OUC was transferring to, you know, becoming more solar generated and the costs went up to county residents. But then I asked, so when you go solar, are the residents of Orange County going to benefit off that? And they said no. And what we're seeing now is even now in June, we're going to see rising costs. Have we looked at this at how if you're benefiting off solar, if we're helping as consumers pay for it, but yet the return on investment is not happening, it's, it's just awing to me to now hear everybody's going up, but yet they're gaining off the solar panels. They're gaining off the grants and benefits, but there's no return. So I don't know. It just it, it seems like while well, we're making great strides, we're not helping the people so that they can become this part of this lifestyle too so and lastly are you watching like legislatively you know on how solar and may or may not and you know how our energy companies are lobbying to kind of diminish the value you know to continue to chip at that value and, and any thoughts on that Yes, so uh, Kelly is fortunately two doors down for me, um, so we stay connected, but um, yes, we are definitely keeping an eye on that. Um, it's been great with the federal legislation that has come through with the uh, Inflation Reduction Act and the um, bipartisan in, uh, infrastructure law, um, so that has really opened up the floodgates for lots of like EV charging infrastructure, um, so to be able to expand that, and we've actually... We're, we're doing really well, actually, in uh, Orange County, um, so much so that we weren't eligible for some of the formula funding for uh, some of the federal grants um, because we are doing so well comparatively. Um, so we are keeping an eye on what our utilities are doing. Duke Energy does have a great um, CEC program, which is a community solar program, um, where it does basically, after there is a point where then the... Uh, resident starts to kind of win on on that and that way you don't have to have a roof that is um, a good candidate for solar so that is one of those good programs where uh, basically uh, residents can opt in um, to, to purchasing solar but you don't have to install it on on your roof so there is a lot happening in this area for sure um, with electrification of vehicles the idea is that then it's kind of one source that has to go renewable, so your, your power plants versus everybody um, with their your internal combustion engine. So that's kind of the idea of, like, yes, you go electric, and then there's one kind of concentrated source that has to go renewable versus many distributed sources. So lots lots happening in this area. We're, we're trying to monitor and, um, again, address those energy burdens in these different uh, programs that we help partner with and, and sponsor. All right. Thanks. Okay, I'm going to look to uh, the county administrator and to my chief of staff, Roseanne Harrington. Um, I want to tighten the conversation up a little bit around these issues. Uh, so let's um, let's plan uh, perhaps uh, for some future board meeting uh, discussion around kind of emerging trends um, that may be of interest uh, to the board and maybe our regulatory authority in some regards uh, the regulatory authority is rests with the state in some regard and may rest with the federal government and then then there are local government authorities uh, but I think this is um, as the United States is trending more towards uh, solar and, and all other um, alternative energy sources um, there are some things that we may just kind of want to get an update on, a factual update, uh, and any of those trends that may be relevant to our um, planning processes. So if some point in the future um, we, we can do that, I want to just kind of tighten the conversation up. There have been a number of questions, comments, assertions made this morning, and I, I just don't feel like we're really adequately responding to them. So. Um, it, it requires some research. It requires some presentation um, uh, going forward. So if we can do that, I'd appreciate it and work with uh, Carrie and our sustainability uh, advisory uh, board as well. All right. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner gomez Cordero. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie, for the presentation and so on. My question is very, very simple. Um, on the slide 24, where it says um, goal 15, decrease the per 
customer landfill. Can you explain that, please? Yes. I want to make sure I understood that. Yeah, so we want to decrease. Uh, so since we operate the landfill and there is a, a, a ultimately an ultimate capacity of the landfill, uh, we wanted to help decrease uh, customer landfill uh, contribution by 15%. So basically trying to, again, um, there's an inverted pyramid when it comes to waste, so it's reduce, reuse, recycle. Um, so really just trying to see what efforts we can do to help um, residents in the area reduce the waste that is going to landfill. So whether that's diversion programs, um, so for e-waste, diversion programs, or whatnot like that. So really just trying to, yes, we control the landfill, and so trying to make sure, like, at, at some point, you know, it will reach capacity. So how can we make sure that it uh, lasts even longer? And so uh, that's that kind of waste diversion and reduction effort. So that would be like for the people to, you know, less go to the landfill? Correct. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Moore. Yes, good morning. Good morning. I would love to see a copy of uh, your strategic plan. I'm a, a big fan of that as a tool. For improvement, so I'd love to take a look at that. And uh, with the goals that we have, and I know the work with the, the uh, planning agency, um, how are we bringing in our municipalities who maybe don't have the sophistication and, and perhaps a, a sustainability officer um, on staff? Yeah, absolutely. So, for example, with our vulnerability assessment, um, we as the county will be reaching out to uh, the municipalities within our county um, that haven't already. Uh, applied for and received a vulnerability assessment and reach out to see if they'd like to partner with us as we do this review to uh, review their critical assets um, to vulnerabilities uh, in light of these uh, couple climate change scenarios. So that's one way that we'll be reaching out to other municipalities with this vulnerability assessment. Um, and then also for the climate pollution reduction grant, that's a climate action plan. And so that's for, for the entire county. And, in fact, actually four counties. So that will then um, and bring them in as well in partnership as we develop that climate action plan and then also help make them eligible for implementation funds as well. well great. I would love, um, I'm sure the rest of the commissioners might as well love to see the results from the municipalities in our district, see if they've conducted their own vulnerability assessment and then and how you would move forward to help them if they have it. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Commissioner Scott. Thank you, Mayor. Good morning, Carrie. How are you? Doing well. How are you? Um, just uh, so Mayor kind of covered it, so I'll just kind of add. Um, when it comes to uh, what you guys will eventually study and different opportunities to figure out where, where we can be more sustainable comparative to other counties in Florida, but across the nation, um, can you look at ways to figure out? We're a little fur further ahead of the game, but in about 20 or 30 years, most uh, solar panels last about that long. And so what happens when they're done with them? Um, what is the avenue to recycle them or dispose of them uh, from a residential side, but also from a contractor side? Because nine times out of 10, they'll probably have someone come to their house. What is that contractor going to do with those solar panels? Are they going to take them to our landfill? And so figuring out what that pathway is, that may be a utilities thing. Um, and then as it re relates to the overall sustainability, um, just looking at what we're doing in, in apartment complexes. You see a lot of recycling at the residential area. Um, you see little to none uh, in apartment complexes unless they have their own program. And so looking at uh, opportunities for us to take advantage of those. Um, and that's all I had. I really appreciate your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, all, all great suggestions. So thank you. All right. Commissioner Bonilla, final thoughts? Yeah, I just want to say thank you. Um, I love the idea that you came up with the, the presentation and that you, you know, heard of our, all of our concerns and questions, and that presentation is going to be so helpful. So I just wanted to say thank you for that. All right. Uh, thank you very much uh, to um, Ms. Black and uh, the whole team, uh, Ms. Toriante and uh, Ms. Amadova. Uh, Thank you for giving us that citizen perspective. Uh, one of the reasons why we have this advisory group is I think government does its best work when it gets input from the citizens that it is entrusted to serve. And so thank you all for bringing that citizen perspective to us. And with that, we're going to move forward uh, on our agenda. Um, at this time, we're going to get a legislative update um, we're going to ask Ms. Kelly Teague uh, to come forward. She's got her whole team. She's going to introduce them in just a few moments. Uh, perhaps uh, the legislative session in Tallahassee this year has been like 
none other in most of our lifetimes. Uh, so she'll delve into that. A lot of interesting things came out of that. And with that, we're going to uh, recognize Ms. Teague at this time. Well, good morning, Mayor, Comptroller Diamond, uh, members of the Board of County Commissioners. It's great to be with you um, now that session has concluded. Um, I want to first start off by introducing the folks who are here with me today. Mark Jeffries is our boots on the ground in Tallahassee, and he does amazing work um, and lives in Tallahassee during session. So we're so thankful to have someone on the ground who can respond quickly when things come up, and boy, do they come up. Um, I also want to introduce our intern from UCF. His name is Jacob Bertram. And he is graduating next spring and is unfortunately going to go to law school, it sounds like. But um, he was so helpful this session. Um, and a lot of the weekly report material that you saw each week, um, Jacob helped us format that and get it looking good um, and attend meetings so that Mark could meet with members um, and we could stay on top of the fast-moving action in Tallahassee. And, of course, Chris Carmody is here from Gray Robinson. He's going to speak um, at the conclusion of my presentation, give us a look ahead of what we can expect in the 2024 session. So I will move forward. This is the outline, and um, I'll start by saying, obviously, session this year was peaceful, calm, rational. <laughs> Actually, that's what I was hoping it would be. Um, I would describe it instead as very challenging. Uh, this, this one was a, a challenging session for local government. So let's talk through exactly what happened and what some of the implications are for your work. I'm going to start by the numbers. We had this session. 1,873 bills. A little down, and that's because um, the House Appropriation Project did not require members to file a bill. So that number in previous years was much higher, but those were done through a different process this year. However, if we go forward, we have 2,600 or so amendments, 3,222 votes. This is the number I want you to pay attention to, 356 enrolled bills. That means bills that made it through the complete process. They passed both the House and the Senate. And there were 450 bills followed by Orange County. That's about 100 more bills than in previous years. Um, that enrolled bill statistics, so just to give you an, an indication of how many bills made it through this session, um, in 2022, we had 285 enrolled bills. In 2021, we had 275 enrolled bills. And in 2020, we had 210 enrolled bills. So this is a large number of bills that passed through the full process. I want to start off by talking about some of the wins. We'll start on a positive glass half full approach. Um, we did run, um, we did get appropriations for Orla Vista and West Orange Trail through uh, the process. I will put a big disclaimer on that, though. Um, it is subject to veto when the budget is uh, presented to the governor. Um, we also were successful in getting language to protect design elements and existing plan developments. We know that's a particular interest to District 1. Um, this is an issue, you'll recall, came up last session and we fixed it and it required fixing again this session. On the loss side, um, you're going to hear a consistent theme, um, major impacts to home rule this session. I want to start off with the budget. Um, in your books, it will say Senate Bill 2600. I was slightly off on that, so I made the correction here on this presentation. It's Senate Bill 2500. So the budget for the coming fiscal year grows to $117 billion. That's 27% larger than the state spending plan just three years ago. Why? Um, obviously, increasing tax collection because our economy is growing, but we also have federal pandemic response funding that is still playing a part in the budget process. Um, the budget this year, um, that passed this year, includes $46.5 billion in general revenues and $70 billion in trust fund dollars. All right, let's get into board priorities. And as we transition to this section, uh, we're going to start off with one of the early wins of session, which was affordable housing. Senate Bill 102 passed early in session and has already been signed into law. The effective date is July 1st, so coming up here in a few months. It is the Live Local Act. Um, I think there are four things I want you to take from this bill. Um, it fully funds the Affordable Housing Trust Fund with a few nuances, but it's fully funded. Um, it does preempt all rent control measures. It provides several tax exemptions related to affordable housing development, and it provides several zoning exemptions related to affordable housing development. Um, when I say zoning um, <coughs> exemptions, for example, affordable housing is now allowed in any commercial or industrial zoned area. So that's a big change. On the appropriation side, this was one of the board's key priorities. You can see uh, the areas that were funded. I've mentioned two already. I also wanted to uh, highlight the Central Receiving Center. This is a statewide competitive grant program that was fully funded at $19 million in the budget. 
We also receive funding for CAT team, which is youth mental health, and naltrexone, I, sh I almost had that, naltrexone, which is Vivitrol, which helps with opioid addiction, funded in the budget as well. All right, this is what I was talking about. These are all the preemption bills, and um, I'm fairly certain that some of the more nuanced ones aren't actually up there, like things that were put in amendment later in the process, but uh, this is how many preemption bills we had this session. And I know you can't read that fine print. Uh, it was meant to illustrate just how many preemption bills we worked on this year. So let's start off with Senate Bill 1604. Um, so this is a bill that really kind of exploded in session because you heard about it in the news because it had the Disney language put into it late in session. So you, you probably saw the information about that. Um, but this really will impact us moving forward as you look at the Vision 2050 plan. Um, local governments can re require certain building design elements located in a planned uh, unit development or a master plan community created before July 1st, 2023. So perspective is preempted moving forward. Um, I will say also, not on the slide, but worth noting, the construction of new distribution electrical substations is permitted in all future land use categories and zoning districts as part of this bill. So this is a pretty comprehensive bill. Um, it, it's not very long, but it did cover quite a bit, and it became a must-pass uh, bill once the Disney language was put into it. And actually, let me go back. Mark Jeffries worked, I, I cannot tell you how many hours to get that perspective only language in, so it did not impact any of our, anything created prior to July 1st. So this, we're gonna call this a win, but it was a, a kind of win. All right, on residential tenancies, I wanted to also discuss House Bill 1417 expressly preempts all aspects of the landlord-tenant relationship to the state. Um, House Bill 1383 involves specialty contractors. Um, to provide a little historical background, back in 2021, the legislature passed House Bill 735. It essentially preempted all locally licensed occupations to the state. Um, they did have a two-year window in that bill to allow um, construction trade occupations to continue to be licensed at the local level, but that window is about to close. Um, we were hoping to see a fix because as we explained in the 2021 session, this would be incredibly problematic. Um, they didn't get the fix over the finish line, but they did put a temporary fix in. So I expect this issue will come up next year and we'll have to work on this quite a bit. All right, next section, uh, Senate Bill 346. This is uh, public instruction. It preempts existing local ordinances related to the procurement process when state funds are used. Uh, Senate Bill 1718, Immigration, prohibits a county from providing funds to any person, entity, or organization for the purpose of issuing an identification card. And I will note, um, the Immigration Bill was quite comprehensive. You've probably heard a lot about that in the media. Both re with respect to Orange County, this is one of the items that we um, saw pop up that directly impacts the work of the board. Um, I, also, and let me, let me also pause to say, this is the section involving home rule, existing authority, and funding. This is part of the board's adopted legislative priority agenda. Um, so I want to talk about Senate Bill 2502. This is in the implementing bill for the budget. Um, late in the process, an amendment was put in um, that would restrict new or modified local for fertilizer ordinances for one year. It initiates a study, um, which is funded in the budget, so it's in two different places. Um, as you will recall, uh, Orange County last reviewed its fertilizer ordinance in 2022. Um, so while it may not impact us immediately, we expect this will come back to the legislature and then efforts to interfere with this process might be on the horizon. So we'll be watching this one uh, very closely. Um, Senate Bill 7024, this is the one I've gotten the most questions about. <laughs> probably because we work for the county. Um, it is um, substantive changes to uh, the Florida retirement system. A drop eligibility extension from 60 to 96 months. It reduces the special risk retirement date um, that was changed in 2011 during the economic downturn. Um, and it does not include, I wanna put a big asterisk on this one. Um, when this uh, proposal first came out on the House side, it had a $1.187 billion impact to counties. Um, and that was because the cost of living adjustment of 3% in the bill. Um, during negotiations with the Senate, that portion was removed. 
So the um, fiscal impact to county, so this falls under the funding um, board priority, is uh, $325 million to the counties. So significantly less, but still an impact. Okay, so there were some successes. Um, we did have some failed proposals. Now, whether they will live to see another day in the 2024 session, to be determined. But for right now, we can take a deep breath. Um, the bill that I mentioned when I came before you a few months ago, Senate Bill uh, 740, which would have uh, studied and evaluated the effectiveness of realigning um, county boundaries in the state, um, did not move at all. It was not heard in committee. Um, it never received a House companion. So um, while it did kind of raise some red flags initially at the beginning of session, it, it did not proceed through the process. House Bill um, 1197, Senate Bill 1240, uh, this is a land and water management. Ooh, thank you, watch. Um, this is a super preemption of water quality, water quantity, and pollution control and discharge of removal to wetlands to the state. Um, this was that super water preemption that we discussed also during the legislative priorities presentation. It did not move through the process. Um, We'll put an asterisk on this one. House Bill 7053 um, was a bill out of the House. There was no Senate companion. It reshaped the funding mechanism for Visit Florida, required counties to help fund Visit Florida for a three-year period. It added a sunset to all existing TDT levies and added a referendum for enactment every six years. Um, that bill was not successful, but we'll come back to this in just a moment. All right, on our support and oppose statements. Um, we have a support position, uh, Amendment 1 legislation that directly impacts water quality and quantity, land preservation um, and acquisition. I just mentioned Senate Bill uh, 1240, the super water preemption, that bill did fail. So um, that was um, consistent with our support and opposed statements. Um, sustainability, renewable energy efforts, it was great to hear Carrie's presentation. Um, there was a massive energy regulation preemption bill that did fail this session. Um, which would have preempted you um, from having policy in this area when it comes to certain types of building materials or what you allow in certain areas. Um, support mitigation efforts to address advanced septic system requirements. I wanted to highlight um, House Bill 1379. Uh, this is um, a pretty massive environmental bill. Um, it does include um, a change, the wastewater grant program. It changed to the water quality grant program, and they added the potential for grant funding to retrofit on-site sewage treatment and disposal systems where um, central sewerage is, not, is unavailable, along with connecting to sewer. So to be determined on what the funding will look like, but at least the option now exists to provide funding in this category. Um, under oppose, uh, we had legislation that negatively impacts TDT funding and governance. Um, this is why my but statement um, from the earlier bill, the House bill that was unsuccessful, we did see very late in the process. Um, this particular language inserted into the House tax package, which ultimately passed the process, it did, um, it is limited language compared to what was in the House bill, but it was inserted and did pass. Um, counties are required to impose additional tourist de de development tax levies by voter referendum. Um, and it restricts how many cycles you can go after these referendums. It's every two years. So there, there are a couple caveats there, um, but that's for additional tourist development tax levies. They must be by referendum. Looking ahead, now I want to call up Chris Carmody to talk through um, the overall mood during session this year and most importantly what we can expect in 2024 because as you know our sessions are staggered so this was a march through may session they will be back and gaveling in in january so we only have a couple months between now and the start of the 2024 session so chris is here to kind of talk through what we can expect to see good morning mayor commissioners um as Kelly said, it was certainly an interesting session, one we haven't seen uh, like in previous years, kind of stating the obvious, and you saw it from the previous special sessions, um, uh, the, the governor who's normally important to begin with based on his constitutional authorities and veto pen and light item veto was pr probably the most important power position in the history of the state of Florida, no matter what timeline you want to look at. Um, the legislators gave a lot of deference to him and as a result, when you saw Kelly uh, mention 356 bills, that's a really high number. Um, they didn't leave a lot of meat on the bone, if you will. The presiding officers in both chambers and certainly the governor's office got a lot of their priorities through 
uh, and to the finish line. One note, uh, Kelly did note the preemption that Mark and I and others worked on. Um, definitely thank Mark uh, and, and the team. Uh, I feel like that's something that kept us up up until day 60 because uh, we just were convinced some of those folks that were pushing for it were going to sneak it in somewhere. Uh, but also thank folks like Senator Stewart and Representative Hawkins. Uh, they, they were real champions on that for us. We came to them early, pointed out that some folks were trying to sneak it in, and we didn't like it because uh, we had kept it out a couple years ago. And they were both very strong in their chambers and went all the way up to leadership, um, to the speaker and the president, to make sure that, that Orange County was protected, um, not projected, protected, uh, on, the, on particular developments, particularly Horizon West and others, that you had put in the works many decades ago and that this bill could have, uh, whether intentional or not, would have unwound. So we are grateful for their leadership and support. Um, look into next session. I think one thing, we're, we're, it hasn't gotten a lot of discussion, but it's going to, as I mentioned, Representative Hawkins, uh, he is likely taking on another job as a college president, and as a result, that will create a special election in District 35, which is both um, mostly unincorporated parts of Osceola and Orange County. Um, in Orange County, it's east of UCF, Bithlow area, um, down to the, the southern border with Osceola County, and then Osceola dips up a little bit to get St. Cloud. That's going to be a special election if he's appointed officially to that position and he officially resigns sometime uh, early fall or late summer, September, October range, given the, the governor's had a couple special elections he's had to call in the last uh, five years, and he's noticeably kind of delayed those sometimes. So I wouldn't be surprised if this gets pushed to fall for a primary and then sometime December, maybe January for a general election. So it will be interesting times because uh, he's probably later this week announcing for a different election. Um, and so there'll be a lot of elections we'll be talking about here. But that's going to shape be the first thing that shapes. We'll have a new delegation member be, by next session is my ex expectation. Uh, but as well, there are going to be things that come back next year. Uh, sovereign immunity. Uh, the sovereign immunity bill that, that comes up every year failed again this year in the House. There was a proposal that was very aggressive that was going to move the, the sovereign immunity caps that haven't moved at all in 10 years. It was proposed moving them in the millions, um, a, a several million range. That was obviously a, a non-starter with, with most folks who care about that. The Senate was maybe, if you could argue, the more rational, let's, let's give a percentage increase expected over 10 years and move it up to 400, 400, 500,000 on the caps. It went nowhere, um, but it will definitely be back. Um, the trial bar and others that involved in this process have been itching to get something moved, and the trial bar, if you paid attention this session, took a big loss on, to, on, um, on the tort, uh, tort language that came through, and some of that was also on sovereign immunity. They, they moved back the statute of limitations for tort claims and certain ones, and they did the same on sovereign immunity claims, so any kind of government. So uh, the government, that was kind of a win for us. The, the timeline when it, which a government can be sued is, sued is a shorter timeline than it was used to be four, now two years on certain claims. So that will be a win for us, at least in our legal issues that we may time to time have. Also, vacation rentals, that's a bill that almost got to the finish line this year. That was a pretty good balance. It was going to preserve um, the grandfathered, if you will, ordinances that we have and others have that, and how we um, regulate vacation rentals, but give some flexibility because they were talking about a registration program and others. Um, at the last, in like day 50, I'm looking at Mark, who was on the, in the lobby with us those days, I think day 7, 57, 58, a big amendment dropped in the House that was going to carve back some of that local control that was still allowed in that legislation that allowed the locals to keep their ordinances, and that just wasn't going to fly in the Senate. So that bill died. We fully expect that will be ne back next session. Um, and then uh, term limits. I know y'all are term limited at eight years, but I know there's been some discussions with the uh, Charter Review Commission of possibly extending that. There was legislation that didn't make it to the finish line that talked about putting those term limits in for county commissioners uh, and, or county officers, if you will. Um, that didn't go anywhere, but I, I can assure you they're going to bring that back next session. Uh, and with that will be the dynamics you always have in these off-year election year sessions. You'll have um, Speaker Renner and President Pasadomo kind of winding down their term and the people that are replacing them winding up their term. They always say the most powerful for those presiding officers are usually the session before they take over because they're the ones rising up and they've got everyone with them. So that creates some interesting dynamics in the House and Senate, although those people that I mentioned all have great relationships with the folks that are coming up from underneath them, but always makes for interesting politics in those election year uh, cycles. And then, as Kelly said, they're early. Committee weeks in the House will start in September. They'll start uh, in October for the Senate, and they'll run all the way through December. And then, as Kelly said, 
we'll have a January, February session that will end the first week of March. Um, and, you know, I, I got to say, as I started, the elephant in the room is the governor of the state of Florida is likely running for a higher office and it's likely to announce later this week, potentially tomorrow or early Thursday. And that will obviously shape a lot of the politics that, that we have in Tallahassee um, as, as, as it would appropriately do so, right? You, could, you almost can expect that when an election year. So that will certainly shape some of the dynamics that we're dealing with next year during legislative session. But with that, I can sit down and get out of the way or answer questions. I'll take cues. Oh, you're going to take all the hard questions. Okay. <laughs> Mayor, that's all I have on the presentation. Yeah. yeah. I think our governor has been running for five years. Yes. I don't know if there's anything new there, but uh, we, um, we still have, <clears throat> from my perspective, a major responsibility at the local level. This is where the rubber meets the road, uh, where people live, and we get to interact with them on a day-to-day -day basis. And I just think that um, um, personally and professionally and politically, uh, what happened in Tallahassee this, this past session uh, with the erosion and the preemption of local authority uh, does not work in the best interest of the citizens long term. And so um, I go on the record making that statement. Uh, as a board of county commission, uh, we have to wrestle with some tough issues on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we uh, have full public disclosure with just about everything that we do. We cannot meet in private and carve out, uh, you know, our positions as the legislature can do. And um, so this is where we have to kind of uh, wrestle with the, with the dif difficult issues. And so I, uh, I look forward to continuing to work with our colleagues here on the Board of County Commission, but also with the Florida Association of Counties and others uh, to preserve what we can in the fundamental way that our government operates, has operated for you know, centuries. And, and so I think that uh, a lot is going to happen uh, because of it. A lot of people, I think, are distracted by some of the political noise and losing focus on really what's important, and that's taking care of the people here in the state of Florida. And uh, I certainly intend to do what I can do to continue focusing on uh, really what's important. I'm going to open it up for questions or comments by members of the board. Uh, Commissioner Wilson. Thank you. I had to take deep breaths this entire time. It was like, okay, deep breaths. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> How are you all? You survived. Um, you know, I always say the most dangerous season in Florida is not hurricane season, it's legislative season, and it continues to be the case. Um, I, I know that, you know, so many of these things are tied and so many of them are meaningful to our residents and constituents, so I just have to start out by saying gay, 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 and I will continue to say it because we have students, young people, teachers that have been under full-scale attack and, you know, as a commission that's sitting here trying to do the work that we do, which is the infrastructure part and the planning part, and, the, and we're, we're watching, really, all of those things eroded by what I feel like is truly discriminatory policymaking from Tallahassee. And so the thing I wanted to ask, because I think, you know, I could criticize for a very long time, um, but my district, Reedy Creek, is there. You know, obviously, many, many, many of my residents are wholly impacted, have been impacted, continue to wonder what their future will bring. And so, you know, understanding that these policies, not just the discriminatory policies against our gay and trans residents, but also, um, you know, sort of this retaliatory uh, attack on the largest employer in the county, in the area, maybe the state, I don't know. Um, was there pushback from those industry folks up there? I mean, we heard from Visit Orlando last week that we're losing conventions, we're losing visitors, there's travel warnings because of this perceived discrimination here, and that doesn't speak for us. Orange County is welcoming and inclusive, and what comes out of Tallahassee, we all know, is not representative of the way that we treat people here. But I would love to have heard or seen the industry flying the flag upside down that we're losing business, we're losing employees because of these discriminatory type of actions, because of these retaliatory type of actions. Was there any of that dialogue? I'm going to let you take that one. 
Kelly's going to give me the easy one. Um, uh, you know, I, the, the folks you mentioned, many of them made the rounds in Tallahassee. Um, there's, there's, you know, some of the, the points you mentioned about um, for the district formerly known as Reed Creek, some of those amendments that affected them, besides the one that was done during the special session, um, they, they weren't always, I think one was done in committee, the one was on, on the floor, so it wasn't always an opportunity to publicly make statements and such, but I, I can assure you, um, you know, they, they made the rounds up there, and, and like I said at the start, it was an interesting session, because more like than anyone I've certainly been around with, and I've talked to folks who've been doing it longer than me, um, definitely hasn't had a session like this where um, the plaza level, if you will, the governor's office was shaping it in such a way like before. That being said, no, they certainly weighed in, and so did our legislators. We have, I, mean, I, I said it, I mentioned, I gave kudos to Hawkins and Stewart, but we have a great delegation on both sides of the aisle that do their best to work hard for, for our county. Um, and, and many of those delegation members also were pretty vocal in the House and Senate, and you probably, those got a little more of the headlines because they, they do have a, a microphone, if you will, and they can speak a little louder. But the, the industry folks did their part. I think, I think I'm stating the obvious, but I'll say it. I think they were all trying to take the tone of not making the situation worse than it was, because uh, I think regardless of which side you're on, I think no one thinks it's been a wonderful situation for, for anyone involved. And so I think ever, the folks that were engaged were trying to express their concerns and express uh, kind of ho rooting for and trying to sh shape a path forward without making it any worse than it already was uh, as far as the, the, the rhetoric and the certainly perception locally and across the state. I, can I follow up on that with the, uh, the question? So if we, you know, stay away from the discriminatory type of, of actions that we're taking and we go towards even just what we understand is um, you know, tourism is, is our bread and butter and water is sort of the cornerstone. Before Disney got here, we had beautiful springs and beaches and estuaries. And so to see even the attacks there, right, this idea that, you know, we, we were able to implement our and adopt our fertilizer ordinance in time to get grandfathered in. But we know that we oftentimes look at other counties when we're adopting policy and utilize their efforts, the hope is always that if we're doing that, other counties are also doing that, and now we know that that's going to be off the table. I understand that was part of the budget, a budget amendment. Can you kind of explain a little bit about what that means as opposed to an amendment that would have come in earlier? So essentially, you, you have it in two places right now. You have the policy of creating the work group to kind of look through the process, and then you have the funding for it. So if you did see a line item for the funding, you could probably ascertain that the, the funding is tied to the work group. So I, it came very late in session and it popped up really quick and passed really quickly. Um, so I, I think the timing was purposeful and um, we'll definitely be addressing this next session or the session after that. It's, it's going to be part of the conversation for certain. All right, thank you so much. No problem. Commissioner Moore. Uh, my, my question is basically what do we know about um, the governor's interest in vetoing? I know I was at a legislative luncheon last week, and they had, and you'll have to refresh me what their cute little line was about that. But what are your senses? Of, uh, it was a, a robust year financially. Does he have a good reason to, to, to be cutting out a lot of member projects? That's a, I mean... We've seen it both ways under the former governor. In some years there were a ton of cuts, uh, vetoes, and some there were zero. And so, you know, I, I think we're still trying to feel that out. What, our understanding, and we'll, we'll, I think we'll find out soon, is that uh, I heard the words, it'll be a light touch on the veto pen. Uh, for perspective, the governor, as he's constitutionally required to do, proposed a budget, um, 30, no, no later than 30 days for session. And his was around $114 billion. Um, before the legislature finalized their budget, but after the governor proposed his, based on the current projections, the revenue estimators in the state, who usually are pretty conservative, stated that there would be seven billion more surplus than we had already anticipated. Uh, and the Senate ended at 117 billion, only three billion higher than where the governor um, started. So they could have, in theory, gone you know, seven billion higher and still been in safe territory, if you will, of not overspending, but they only went another three billion above that area. They gave him, I want, I 
think everything. Not like some people say, well, nearly every. I think he got every single thing he wanted from a budgetary perspective, and almost everything policy. Um, and they they definitely stayed in touch with the governor uh, and the governor's office and his team that helps work this. So th there's good reason for him not to be heavy on the vetoes. But again, some of that's just hard to predict um, until it comes out. Um, I think there was folks last year who were surprised by some of the vetoes that came out. So from a just a pure math calculus, whatever you want to call it, they were only $3 billion higher than is projected when the estimations were way higher than that. They put a ton in reserves. We are very well positioned as a state. This sort of doesn't get the headlines right, but, you know, hurricane or whatever concern that comes to our state, we, we have so much in reserves that we can weather those storms um, probably for multiple years. Um, so the state of Florida is healthy, um, and so there's not, they didn't give him a lot of reasons to veto, but that doesn't mean he won't, right? Um, he may see a project he doesn't like. We, I can just say this on, on your behalf and working with Kelly and Mark and the team, um, we've certainly made the rounds with our sponsors and made the rounds with the governor's office to the extent we can to, to advocate for our projects, sort of like glossed over when the veto pin gets near it. Um, but you never know until it gets down to the finish line there. But they're, they're important projects, and we certainly made the case with OPB and others of why they stand out and why we, why we think they should be approved. So we're, we're hopeful, we're bullish, but, you know, let me manage expectations slightly and say, but you never know. Thank you. I, if I may on budget, if that's okay, Mr. Mayor. Um, one thing I meant to say uh, is part of the budget, and it didn't get in many headlines, is as you know, we have a new six district court of appeals when they realigned last year. There was, I want to say, four or six million set aside for um, design and study of a new location. And we're part of the six DCA, so uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be in Lakeland, where many folks thought it was going to be last year. It could be somewhere here in Orange County. So that's just something to pay attention to. I think they have a year to do designs and feasibilities and kind of research of a good location. I'm certainly rooting for my partners and others' sake that it gets here in Orange County or nearby so that they don't have to commute all the way across the state to have, handle hearings. But just some, that could be an interesting economic development um, uh, develop, uh, issue for the county if we we're able to successfully put the DCA here in Central Florida. So. All right, uh, Commissioner Uribe. Hi, guys. Um, so you did give us an earful. I, I actually have a couple questions that I wanted to ask. One was on um, Senate Bill 6104, right, which is the big one that we talked about. And I, I believe that's home rule, the home rule one, isn't it? 1604? 1604, excuse yeah. me, yeah. There's too many numbers. <laughs> um, have, have we here at the county started to dissect that on how it affects our comp plan and also our vision 2050 because while we could have you know when you talk about taking away a lot of that local home rule how when it, when are we expecting the governor to well it's, that's already been signed so the entire impact on what it'll mean for our local governing do we have any kind of idea and is it possible to get like all the details on that one like get the full, I'd love to look Certainly at that the one. Certainly the full bill analysis. That one and the immigration Absolutely. one would be okay. great. No problem. Because, you know, you get this idea of what we have as ordinances and policies, but if we're going to be preempted by the state, you know, what direct impact will that have as we are moving forward and establishing a future comp plan? Um, I did want to ask on the vacation rentals. I know that they those kind of cut short a little. Was any conversation had at them paying their fair share into TDT? That's one question, because I know this is going to come back up. And one of the biggest issues we hear from the tourism industry is these vacation rentals that are unregulated, essentially. They don't pay their share of bed space. I mean, if, if you ask the vacation rental industry, they believe they do um, as part of the conversation. Um, I, I will say this was the year we really thought that bill would make it over the finish line. I'm going to have Chris correct me. I think since 2014 this bill has come up, and it's, it's almost made it across the finish line every single year. And I think we thought this would really be the year um, until the very last day. Um, I will tell you from Orange County's perspective, what we watch most closely is that grandfather language. Um, right now, it's just Orange County and Monroe County that meet the grandfather language requirement. So as we approach that bill specifically, we want to make sure that grandfather language remains the same. Um, but to have the added flexibility of being able to change our ordinance without possibly um, losing the grandfather would be helpful. But it's something we watch very closely. And, and Chris, I think you represent CFHLA. We do. So could you share some light? Are they advocate? Because I, I think it's fair. If we're going to accept this and allow it, that they should pay their fair share yeah, into 
I don't think you're going to find some arguments from our friends at CFHLA <laughs> with your position. I mean, um, it, it's more of the conversation. Was that part of the conversation in Tallahassee? Certainly, and also safety regulations as well. Um, you know, some of these. This won't surprise you. There are in our own community. There's neighbors, neighborhoods in and around our major theme parks that no one lives there. People just move in Saturday and move out the next Saturday. And these are these these houses or homes, if you will, are completely run like businesses. Right. So the argument was, if you're going to run it like a business, we should treat them like a business and not just one of us who, hey, I'm going to be out of town for two weeks. Maybe I'll make a little money and rent out my place. That's that's not who we're dealing with in some of these communities. And the same thing with coastal communities. So we, I mean, when this bill comes up, Central Florida and our coastal communities are the ones, anytime like TDT, we become the focal point of the conversation because that's, we have a ton of Airbnbs here, no surprise, or VRBOs, and the same in the coastal community. So that's definitely been part of the conversation. Interestingly enough, on this bill, I don't think anyone loved it. I, I knew the Airbnb lobbyists, or a few of them run around, and they, quite frankly, were trying to kill it. Um, and I knew some local government folks that were trying to kill it because they didn't think it went far enough, right? They thought this is, if this is our one chance, one you know, bite at the apple, we want it to be perfect. You know, we kind of take the approach of once it's something's in there and folks, the Airbnb folks get used to being regulated a certain way by DBPR and the owners of homes get used to having the registry process at the state, it's easier to invite some of these other regulations that are about safety or about paying the fair share, whereas if nothing's passed, nothing will happen, but it's, it'll be back. What about, I want to go a step further on the rental cars, which we're seeing with these online businesses who are actually passing out cars at the airport, but not being imposed any of those airport fees, any of those rental car fees that major companies are having to pay. Um, did that go anywhere? That is also struggled to get to the finish line. I want to say it was a pre-pandemic session, right, how our mind works. So it might have been 19 or 18 or possibly 20 before the session shut down. There was a bill around Turo um, and that, and, and they weren't named, but that was essentially what it was about. Um, it didn't quite get to the finish line. Obviously, our friends at Goa pay pay attention to that because you know these are sort of rogue entities that are that are making a buck off our community without paying their fair share in and being regulated. I think there's an appetite to further look at that, but it, it always gets controversial because they'll lobby up those darn special interests, right? Uh, but they'll lobby up like we do and others, and they'll they'll fight and try to to influence it in such a way or just put love it to death as we call it in the process to the point where the bill dies under its own weight. So, but it didn't make the finish line this year. And I was going to say on the immigration bill, we can get you a summary. We were paying close attention to that for obvious reasons, given, you know, the demographics of our community. The first version of that bill was terrible. I, I won't say the last version of the bill was, was great, uh, but it was a much better version than the first one. Um, and there's certainly improvements that can be made on that, but, um, it, I will just say, thankfully, the first version is not the one that passed because it would have been very difficult, not just for maybe employers that have folks that, that, are, that are not documented, but for a lot of our charitable uh, community members that just are trying to do good by our, our folks that are living here, they would have been penalized or criminalized um, for, for just being good Samaritans, if you will. So. And, um, and lastly, it would be great to get a summary on the tort reform because that one seems to really affect the minority communities a lot. Um, I'm a victim of that where I just pay more because of my zip code as opposed to the zip code right next to me because of the, you know, all of these, all these lawsuits and so forth. And just curious to know, I know there was a lot of talk, while I believe that people should have the right to pursue that at the same time, is it being, do we need to kind of regulate that industry a little? And I would love to see the summary on what that happened to. We can get you that, and, and you probably noticed this in the news clippings or what have you. There was a, I think, a fair criticism after that bill, regardless of your, if you're trial or not, like that um, perhaps the insurance companies weren't, their feet weren't held to the fire enough on that legislation. Certainly our friends, the, the billboard lawyers, as they were referred to sometimes up there, they certainly, their feet were held to the fire. Um, and I think you're going to see some more on that next session. I, the Chair Gregory in the House, who helped chair and oversee some of that legislation, I don't think they're done. Uh, with that, so I think you'll see a little more on that. Well, and rightfully so, because I think the insurance companies are the ones that are penalizing the community, and, and there's got to be a balance, you know, there's got to be a balance. Well, they so. got to win, so if the rates don't go down, they're, they're, right. they're going to be held accountable to some extent. And so, then lastly, and anything else on uh, home insurance? Not since the special session, correct? No, they, they had did some insurance, mm -hmm. insure accountability stuff, which is a little more to your point. But they didn't go very far. They they did some stuff, but nothing to the levels that you're talking about. But From the special session, that's when a bulk of, and nothing to the level of protecting homeowners really. Because I mean, we're seeing people get dropped. 
I know that there was a lot of controversy over the citizens and, and those rates going up, but across the board, we heard people, their insurance doubled 50%. I, I got 50% higher, never filed a claim since I've owned my home. And it's just, it's, it's insane. I don't know at what point, because another tragedy hits us, at what point do we break as far as home ownership? So it'd be interesting to follow that too. Yeah. Great. Thanks, guys. Uh, Commissioner Gomez Cadero. Thank you, Mayor. Um, mine are very easy. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> I'm always easy, simple. Okay. I have two questions. First, um, and thank you for the presentation. Uh, Kelly, you mentioned um, that there was some fund and it was funded, um, the CAT team, but you didn't say how much. Do you know? That's including Cat mental I health. S I actually have it written down. Let's see. It's in this presentation. I'm going to flip through. Ask me your next question and I'll have that answer. Okay. And second. also, I would like, like an update or anything you know about immigration. I mean, we have been having some, you know, phone calls, people anxiety so if you can talk about that I mentioned it to the administrator and I know um, you know maybe later you can tell us about it but I would like to see any would you like the bill analysis sure. as well on yes the immigration please um, and if you can say anything just for the you know public to hear if you have any updates okay certainly Commissioner and on the CAT team side, statewide it was at 41 million I will say typically Orange County receives around 700,000, 600,000. So the fact that the overall state pot was authorized um, suggests that we'll receive some. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Commissioner Scott. Thank you, Mayor. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioner. Uh, so I guess if you could frame for us, uh, just from your perspective, like, Where's the motivation uh, when it comes to term limits for, for Orange County? Like, uh, to my knowledge, the school board one did pass, so those will be partisan races. Those will go from 12 to 8. Um, and is is that with the 24 cycle or the 26? What cycle is that? I'll let you. Did you follow that one for the school board? Yeah, it'll. It'll. It's going backwards. So if you just got elected, the 8 starts from this last cycle, but obviously any elections going forward. So. And there'll be partisan races as well, correct? That, yes. That, but I believe that when I got to double check, I believe that's a ballot initiative. Okay. I think to make that happen. But I got to double check on that. And then with the information as it relates to immigration, um, so my understanding of the bill, um, regardless of the changes, is that there is no funding associated with it. So by and large, it shouldn't have a significant impact the way it's being portrayed. So, you know, if, if someone who's undocumented is driving in a car and they maybe get pulled over by law enforcement, then there may be an opportunity where that may be addressed, but otherwise it's not, there's no one like proactively going out trying to find out who's the undocumented um, from the state or, or mandate from other agencies. Correct. The, the, there's, if, if, if I can, I can just go in quickly some of the provisions of that. There's, there's four, five major provisions on there. There's the E-Verify provision that got a lot of headlines. The state did some of that three or four years ago that if you work with a government entity like our firm we now do e-verify because we work with the county and others um, 25 or more employees you have to do e-verify so that there, there while there's no funding tag there is enforcement mechanisms for that on the what well, you're talking about the driver's license it, one of the provisions of the bill um, required that um, if driver's licenses from states that allow for undocumented immigrants to get a license, if you will. California is an example that a lot of folks think of. They have a specific classification. You can be uh, have a, a right to drive in California as a, uh, I don't know the title, so I'll just call it undocumented immigrant. Um, if you have one of those in Florida, you can get a citation if you're pulled over. Um, but it, it, you're, to your point, there's no, there's no um, money behind it, although part of the legislation did say that they have to do an education campaign. Uh, FDLE and, and the state troopers and such to make sure that people are aware of if you're coming from this state and you don't have the right driver's license from that state, you could be subject to driving without being allowed to drive in our state based on that law. Um, th there's, a, there's a provision where if you go to a hospital that accepts Medicaid, they have to ask a question of whether you're undocumented, documented, a U.S. citizen or other, uh, or you can re but they can refuse to answer. But if you do answer, or regardless of how you answer, um, those hospitals that receive Medicaid, which is pretty much most of them, have to provide a quarterly report to ACA, the Agency for Healthcare Administration, 
kind of giving the answer of what those are, and that's it's kind of you can see where that goes, right? The state or some of those want to hold up a something to the feds and say this is how much it costs us with these particular issues. So that's that. But they individuals can refuse to answer. The original version of the bill made it illegal to harbor or or to provide shelter to someone who was undocumented and to give them a ride somewhere. That language got carved out in the last week. The House had put forward some measures that, that pushed that away. Now they did increase the penalties for, for what they call, the statute's called human smuggling, um, especially if it's dealing with minors or if it's five or more uh, undocumented immigrants. But the whole traveling around the state or harboring or providing shelter, that was stricken out because I think they, the state. yeah. Uh, and, and just, as Kelly said, just into the state, which was already on the books, and a lot of that's governed by federal law. There's definitions on what that is. So um, whatever you were doing before, if you weren't aiding and abetting, if you will, you know, uh, undocumented immigrants coming into our state from another area, you're probably fine even if they are coming in maybe through your assistance because that's a federal law. So I would say that this is now. Um, because they didn't change that statute on just actually how you go about doing the smuggling. They just increased some penalties if it involved youth or five or more, or if you had a previous offense. And to be clear, um, we as a local government uh, cannot institute any community ID program or fund one or any yeah. variation thereof. It's funding it. The language is specific to funding an organization. <laughs> so if a local agency started issuing community IDs, we couldn't fund it right but there wouldn't be any issues with us like allowing it or not trying to stop it or discourage it in any way I'll uh, let, I'll let no. Jeff answer that. <laughs> well, let, let me recall uh, the board asked for a work session on that that topic we were waiting after session so right. that is still scheduled and we'll go until uh, specifically with that language and the full breadth of that language uh, what that means, as well as some other information associated with it. So that is scheduled for July 11th. Right. You can't, can't fund individuals who are in, not in the United States lawfully. Mm -hmm. So there's some nuance to the legislation that will be discussed at the August uh, work session that we're going to have. Thank you, gentlemen. And then my last question, um, where do you anticipate the uh, ballot initiative that's uh, kind of making its way through the process uh, for legalizing marijuana, do you see that uh, making its way to the ballot? I'll let you to a I mean, ballot it, just, just math, yes. I mean, it's, it's already, it's almost nearly gotten all the signatures. Attorney General Ashley Moody has made it clear that she's going to challenge the ballot language. That's a question for the Supreme Court. I mean, just the layman. I mean, it certainly looks like it's straightforward. I think that's going to survive. And there's ways to cure in our statutes and constitutions. So, there's, the signatures are there. I would be very surprised if that doesn't make the ballot, despite a legal challenge on the language. Um, just an observation I want to share for uh, members of the board and everyone. So as, as in, in my district, uh, it seems like every time I drive somewhere, there's a new uh, smoke shop or a dispensary. You know, Waffle House at West Colonial and Hiawassee being one of them. It's now a dispensary, and, and that organization isn't even from um, the state. And, and not that I have a problem with it, but it's, it's a lot, and it's increasing in frequency. So that's just something that's, that's uh, I'm wondering when, if it will cre increase should this measure pass um, and the Attorney General's not successful. So I just wanted to share that thought that, it, you know, I don't have a problem with it, but it seems to be a significant amount of folks that if they can't get a dispensary, then it's a smoke shop of sorts. And if you go in there and you say certain things, then you may get things that aren't necessarily legal or it's CBD or something like that. But it just, it's just an observation I'm seeing that they continue to increase um, every couple of months or so where I'm seeing a new one open up. So just wanted to share that observation. Thank you, Mayor. More to follow. Uh, Commissioner Bonilla. Yeah, there was a lot of good discussion here and questions. And um, I just like to say, you know, this quote, and I'm sure everyone's familiar with it, but I just want to remind everyone. Um, first, they came for the socialist, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came out for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. Um, right now, I could add to that list LGBTQ, Blacks, immigrants, atheists, women, Disney. <laughs> and then as far as some topics, our education, our water, our public safety, and our quality of life. 
um, they're all coming after. So it's very important that the people stay engaged, they pay attention to who they're voting for and what those people are voting for when they get up to Tallahassee. Because really we all have the power to not put them back into office if they're not representing the people. And I mean everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. All right, uh, I'm, I'm going to go to, uh, I want to hear the, from the county attorney's office if, before we leave this area, if there's anything else, and then I'll go to the county administrator uh, regarding the legislative uh, session or any issues that you may believe legislative, legislatively is something that we need to uh, monitor or um, be concerned about. I don't have anything, Mayor. Okay, uh, go to the county administrator. Just going to note, uh, Mayor, that uh, obviously the Little Local Act, and uh, Kelly made reference to it. Uh, many of you have also uh, uh, inquired about it as well uh, because of the nature of this morning. Uh, rather than uh, uh, really go into detail here, knowing that it would be in and of itself, that is a full discussion. Uh, we have uh, scheduled or, or slated that for a work session just on the Little Local. We can add that. Uh, language about 1604 about design elements as well as part of that but I just want to note that that will come back uh, for a work session in which we will uh, spend the time to really give the board uh, an opportunity to um, see where some of those areas may be what some of those implications could be for Orange County all right and uh, Mark Jeffries uh, quick, quick question for you sir uh, how many years have you been representing <laughs> Orange County and Tallahassee. <laughs> 19 years. So, uh, yay to Mark Jeffries. He's kind of like, uh, he's on the battlefield. He's up there. Uh, <laughs> and he has to stay up there essentially during the session. So, I just want to personally acknowledge the work that you're doing. Uh, because of those 19 years that he's had in Tallahassee, he has developed a lot of influence on both sides of the aisle uh, and with uh, the legislators. He has a lot of credibility with them. And uh, because of his relationships with staff and with the legislators, uh, he is able to sometimes advocate uh, very successfully on, on our behalf and uh, certainly um, our uh, contracted uh, lobbyists uh, with uh, Gray Robinson and Chris Carmody and his team, they've done a great job and uh, Kelly Teague has a yeoman's job of daily uh, responding to uh, you know, our nervousness uh, as uh, issues begin We're to develop, but uh, <laughs> like uh, no other time before. Uh, so uh, just collectively, uh, thank you. Um, we appreciate you for the presentation today. Um, we look forward to what the future will bring. All right. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, thank you Commissioners. All right, with that, uh, we're going to move to uh, the next uh, item. I believe this is the final item for this morning. Uh, we do want to uh, get uh, through the item um, as succinctly as we possibly can. I'm going to ask Mr. Brett Blackadar, the Deputy Director of Public Works, to come forward. Uh, he'll be presenting regarding the stormwater management and uh, moving toward a resilient future. This is the, uh, an item where no action specifically is being requested today, but one uh, doing public comment this morning. Several members of the public uh, weighed in on this issue, so it, it is something that our community is monitoring very closely and concerned about, as they should be, because of uh, the various uh, issues associated with flooding and other things that's been directly impacting our residents. So with that, Mr. Blackadar, thank you, and uh, you are recognized at this time. Thank you, Mayor, and good morning, uh, Board and uh, Comptroller Diamond. And this is session two. We had the first session uh, on May 2nd, uh, three weeks ago. And uh, I'm glad to be here on Public Works Week. However, stormwater management goes well beyond public works at Orange County. Uh, there's multiple departments that are involved, and today as part of this presentation, we'll have three different departments represented. Uh, myself and Mike Drozik, our stormwater manager, we'll, we'll talk from Public Works. We'll have Ed Torres from our utilities department, and we'll have Jennifer Thompson, uh, our NPDS program supervisor from EPD and PEDS. Uh, so we'll try our best to go through these slides. We have a lot of material, 
uh, on stormwater, but we'll try to work through as, as quickly as possible with the time constraints. Um, we're going to, first of all, um, you know, um, reintroduce the purpose uh, of these presentations. We'll, we'll re quickly recap that May tw uh, second presentation. Uh, we'll talk about a stormwater innovative lab workshop we had. Uh, and then we'll go into the five focus areas that we introduced last session, which are climate change, rainfall intensity changes, master basin study updates, uh, collaboration with the sustainable, sustainable Operations and Resilience Action Plan, as Carrie Black uh, presented earlier this morning. And we'll go into various innovative ideas and funding needs. And then we'll make some um, recommendations for short-term, mid-term, and long-term. The purpose, uh, as we mentioned last time, came from the October 25th board meeting. Uh, that was after Hurricane Ian, shortly after Hurricane Ian. And there were concerns about the intensity of the rainfall events that have been happening, the sufficiency of our existing design standards, and our current maintenance standards. So these work sessions, as directed by the mayor, were to address those concerns and look forward in stormwater management in the future in Orange County. So at the last presentation, we did connect the SOAP and stormwater systems. Uh, we looked at all the flooding um, that happened in 2022, uh, and some of the conclusions that came out is that most of the homes that were, were built uh, in or near the floodplain did experience flooding. Uh, the county's current design standards are in line with other jurisdictions. Uh, we talked about our extensive maintenance operations. Uh, we did talk about that we need to revisit the rainfall intensity data. We currently uh, design based on the 25 and 100-year design storms, and the question is, is the data that we use for those design standards still applicable uh, with changes in climate. Uh, we also um, talked about uh, funding needs and how the funding needs for the future are higher than our current annual budget amounts. Uh, some of the comments from the board were coordinations with Seminole Osceola and the Water Management Districts, coordinations with DOT, uh, and there were discussion about retrofitting the stormwater infrastructure in older neighborhoods uh, and making homes more resilient. And also there was discussions about necessary resources for the future, including staff and funding. So on March 14th, um, in preparation for these work sessions, we had the county's innovation lab team uh, put on a three-hour work session. Uh, they did a wonderful job, and we were able to have 35 different staff from various departments and divisions in the county that touched stormwater in one way or another. And we also were to have a few uh, consultants that did work there. And it was a great opportunity to share knowledge across the different departments, uh, capture innovation idea innovative ideas, and try to strengthen those relationships and break down some of the silos we have in Orange County. So we focused on five areas. We focused on climate change, flood mitigation, water quality, resiliency, and funding. And some of the uh, insights that came from participants were on climate change, that our current design standards don't consider the effect of climate change. On water quality, uh, the question was, why do water bodies continue to be added to the impaired list? What is causing that? Uh, and flood mitigation, preserving wetlands could help reduce the risk of flooding. We'll be talking about that later in the presentation. On resiliency, we talked about how some areas are more vulnerable than others, and we need to protect critical infrastructure. And then funding, uh, needs for studies and projects exceed available funding. So a lot of the discussion at this workshop actually was the basis for uh, what is being discussed this afternoon as we move towards the future. So the first program focus that we introduced last time uh, was climate change changes in rainfall intensity. And we asked these questions at the end of the last work session, which is how will climate change affect rainfall intensity frequencies of storms in the future? And are those standard design storms and intensities still accurate as people design for 25 and 100 year storms moving forward? Is the data we're currently using, is that going to be able to plan for the future? Uh, and so are we still able to meet those level of service criteria, that 25 and 100 year design storm? So we did um, do some research, and uh, we came across one study that South Florida did in the recent year, which is called the Adoption of Future Extreme Rainfall Change Factors for Flood Resiliency Planning in South Florida. And um, we'll talk about a little bit. There's lots of different agencies that are doing different analysis right now, uh, and this is certainly one study and one agency. But what we wanted to look at is, you know, if you applied some of the data for here from this study to Orange County, how would that affect our design standards and our capital improvement projects? So this uh, study developed what's called climate uh, median change factors, and it did for all the counties in the South Florida Water Management District. I know that's hard to read, um, but basically what this table did is it said if you took your existing design storms and you applied a factor, this would apply for you know, designing for the next 50 years and potential changes in rainfall intensity. 
So using this as an example, and again, this is, this is one study, um, it would be a change in 22% increase for the 25-year storm and 28% for the 100-year storm. And that changes the 25-year storm from 8.6 to 10.5 inches and the 100-year storm from 10.6 to 13.6. So uh, with help from our consultant, we analyzed this and how would this affect uh, kind of some hypothetical um, projects in Orange County. So for a standard subdivision, um, a 50-lot subdivision, this is, would be in an, um, an area that was a closed basin where we would have the 100-year design storm. If you were to apply these design storms, it would, it would require us to expand the pond into the red area sh shown. And as a result, that would reduce the number of lots down by four from 50 to 46 if you were to accommodate that change in design standard. When we looked at the existing roadway project, if you take Old Winter Garden Road, uh, that pond there um, is actually uh, in the middle of the screen is an existing pond. If you apply our, our future design standards using these median, uh, our potential design standards using this median change factor, it would expand that pond into the uh, next door park and would require that much additional space. So the pond on the left side of the screen is an additional storage that would be required to meet the future design standards. And again, this is just an indication of what could happen uh, if you applied these factors. So some of the things that, that we have to be, you know, look at with these type of uh, change factors, potentially changing design standards, would be uh, increased stormwater design standards could also increase housing development costs. Certainly the stormwater uh, changes could mean more area for stormwater development and increased cost. And for our own county capital projects, uh, it would be increased right-of-way acquisition area for larger pond sites and increased costs. And also uh, this could affect uh, the 100-year floodplain uh, and, and the risks for residents and uh, who may have to pay insurance moving forward as well, depending on what the mortgage companies require. So what we want to do um, is we'd like to do a study um, to look for, look for these, you know, potential rainfall data and what's changing. We're certainly going to collaborate with a lot of different agencies in the study. USF has their uh, South Florida Flood Hub for Applied Research and Innovation is working on this. Um, also, I had a recent conversation with uh, Tara McHugh at the East Central Florida Regional Planning Council, uh, and, and they are working on um, planning as well for uh, future rainfall events, and there's lots of different agencies, including USGS, so we would hire a consultant to kind of collect all the studies and data and then come back with recommendations of what we could possibly do in Orange County to address these future rainfall intensity uh, concerns. Um, so that is one of our recommendations. Uh, and then we also would uh, study those cost impacts to housing development if these changes are implemented. So we're aware of that and we're coordinating that effort. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mike Drozik, our manager of our stormwater uh, division for the next section. Okay, thank you, Brett. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. I will be discussing the uh, Master uh, Basin Studies proposed updates and changes. Okay, if we complete this rainfall study, how will changes in rainfall intensity and frequency affect the basin study and recommendations? Also, how will this updated rainfall data change the 100-year floodplain maps? How can we implement projects that improve both flood mitigation and water quality? And how will these changes affect the funding needed for our capital improvement projects? The update of the Master Stormwater Basin Studies is estimated to be completed by 2028. And the scope of these studies include an inventory of drainage structures and conveyance systems, analysis of drainage patterns, and modeling of storm events, identification of deficiencies, and preliminary evaluation of alternative solutions. The updated plans will be important tools for planning of capital improvement projects designed to alleviate flooding, <clears throat> updating the FEMA floodplain delineations, and evaluation of proposed development impacts. We can incorporate new rainfall intensity data in the updated studies, work with FEMA on updated floodplain maps and communicate to affected residents as part of our CRS program. 
Solutions and projects may take the form of regional combined or enlarged stormwater ponds, incorporation of water quality components where ponds and systems outfall into impaired water bodies, formalization of outfalls and canals, including the acquisition of maintenance corridors for historic natural systems, and expand maintenance programs. Our recommendations increase funding for the study updates to accelerate those completion dates, incorporation of changes in rainfall intensity, and update of our FEMA 100-year floodplains. Based on the needed capital projects generated by those updated basin studies, evaluate funding and staff resources to manage the increased workload. I'll turn it back to Brett. Thank you, Mike. Um, we're going to move into uh, coordination with our, our SOWRAP. And as you saw this morning, Carrie gave a great update. Uh, we asked the question last time when we do these, uh, um, you know, when we're doing the vulnerability assessments that Carrie mentioned that we got for the Resilient Florida Grant Program, you know, how can we coordinate the two when we identify critical assets uh, that are vulnerable based on that assessment? What can we do in the stormwater um, realm to help address uh, and hopefully may relieve um, the vulnerability of those assessments. And then one of the goals of the SORAP is the low impact design strategies, which Carrie mentioned. Um, so how can we utilize that to retrofit existing systems, uh, especially for areas that do not have water quality improvements currently implemented as part of those areas? And then how can we utilize funding? There are a lot of funding sources, and how can we make sure that we're utilizing those sources to do as much as possible in the county? So we have been coordinating uh, with the Sustainable Operations and Resilience Action Plan. Um, we'll be co we're continuing to coordinate with that vulnerability assessment. Um, and uh, what we want to do uh, in, in a future year is budget for a resiliency study specifically for stormwater. So to look at what comes out of that vulnerability assessment and what are the possibilities if we have um, vulnerable roadways or uh, some type of other critical asset, what can we do from a stormwater resiliency point of view to help protect that? Um, and then, as Carrie mentioned also, there's that state resiliency implementation funding, which is the next step. Um, based on the vulnerability assessments and other work we're doing, how can we utilize those state funds to do changes in stormwater and resiliency? I won't talk too much about this, but there was a, um, a new stormwater rule that's in place we don't know exactly. Uh, how it's going to affect us, but it's likely that it's going to increase the requirements for water quality. Um, so this is where looking at retrofitting systems, new systems will come into play, and most likely the, uh, the LID techniques that we're developing will be appropriate to address some of these new rules. And we talked about this, that's LID, and LID really refers to systems and practices that use or mimic natural processes that result in the infiltration, evapotranspiration, and use of stormwater in order to protect water quality and associated aquatic habitat. So really primarily, you're trying to remove pollutants before they get to water bodies, particularly nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, we're developing that manual. It'll be finalized later this year. Uh, and this will help to meet that new stormwater rule, but also will help to go into those, those areas. Uh, a lot of these areas, you cannot uh, build very large facilities because you just don't have land in older neighborhoods. LID may be a, a technique that can go in and retrofit older neighborhoods to get the water quality benefits without impacting too much property. And also on grant funding, uh, we have a lot of different sources. FEMA has their hazard mitigation grant funding. Uh, part of the, the, that program, we could possibly purchase properties or relocate residents if that is something that comes out of uh, the vulnerability assessment and other studies. That's a possibility. And then recently, the county got the HUD CBDG DR funding. Uh, and that can certainly be used to address resiliency issues in certain areas. So we're starting conversations on that um, with uh, various county departments and divisions on how we could use that for potential resiliency projects too. The other thing is we're in the process of reclassifying an existing position in our stormwater department to become a project manager uh, over stormwater resiliency. And that person will be coordinating closely with Carrie and her group uh, and will hopefully manage some of these future stud studies, resiliency efforts, and really important that person will be the point person on grant funding and making sure that we're applying for grant funding uh, and getting as many grants possible to address these. And also that person will be hopefully giving a lot of presentations and updates back to uh, this board on the uh, progress of all the initiatives that we're proposing. 
So from the resiliency point of view, uh, we want to put some funds in, uh, not next year, but the following year's uh, budget for resiliency study to follow up on the vulnerability assessment. We want to build a program, if possible, uh, with long-term funding to retrofit those existing neighborhoods with LID techniques or other techniques, and then obviously become more aggressive in pursuing those uh, FEMA and other grant opportunities. And now we're going to turn to some innovative ideas. Certainly one of the things that we really wanted to look for is how can we be uh, innovative um, and basically reinvent our stormwater program uh, into the future. So this was a really great collaborative effort with EPD utilities and many different uh, resources at uh, the county. So the four things that we're going to look at today is predictive stormwater models to help prepare for future events. Um, Ed Torres is going to talk about partnerships with the Utilities Department of Integrated Water Resources Projects. Um, we're going to turn to our consultant, Lee Mullen, to talk about impacts of wetland loss on flood risk and water quality, kind of a continuation of the other wetland um, presentations that have been coming in front of the board recently. Uh, and then Jennifer uh, Thompson, who's our NPDES program manager, will talk about uh, improvements in the inspection compliance of private stormwater systems, which is a continuation of the discussion from last meeting. So I'm going to start with real-time flood forecasting, predictive modeling. Uh, and this is very exciting. This is something that we've already started to do uh, in Orange County. We had this in place ahead of um, Hurricane Ian for Orla Vista, and it helped actually predict the type of flooding that was going to happen and helped us to make the decision of who to evacuate and when to evacuate during that storm. And what we'd like to be able to do is implement this real-time flood forecasting countywide. And this can use to, can use to store, you know, forecast larger storms one to three days in advance, and it can send notifications to certain key staff in the county. So it's constantly working and constantly looking at it. It's also something we can use for planning purposes and put certain storm events in there to see how they would impact areas. And the good news is it can be used with the existing models we have. We're updating the models as part of the basin studies that Mike talked about, but we can develop them now with the existing models. And then when the basin studies are done, we'll update those models as well. So uh, one of the uh, you know, things that we just talked about is that if we have these uh, countywide studies, we can do uh, evacuation orders ahead of major storms. Uh, it also can help us to, to protect assets. We'll talk about an example here next. So if we knew two or three headed, days ahead of storm that one area was going to be particularly impacted and we had certain assets there, we could do some type of protection possibly to prevent those assets from being damaged or possibly relocate if that's possible. And that also is going to help us for emergency response. Um, emergency response planning, if we know particular areas of the um, county are going to be more vulnerable due to the type of storm that's coming to us, we can use this ahead of time to dedicate the right emergency response to those areas ahead of the storm. Uh, and that also helps us to do that proactive analysis for resiliency planning. Uh, if we know a type of storm is one area is more vulnerable, we can start pouring our resources there as far as planning and programming funding. So uh, one of the things, we did not have the, um, the predictive model in place for the Little Econ area, but uh, we are developing that now and uh, in the area around that flooded. And so um, one of the things we, we did not know is that the type of storm we were going to have in that area around uh, Rouse Road and Buck Road. Um, and due to that, we had $3 million in damage to a uh, master lift station. Had we had this in place, and known two or three days ahead of time, the utilities department potentially could have protected that uh, asset and could have mitigated the damage. Also in that area, uh, there were several apartment complexes, multifamily complexes that had a lot of flooding. Had we known ahead of time, potentially we could have uh, evacuated and relocated many of those cars and preventing some of the damages to those cars. So it would have been a great tool or could be a great tool in the future for resiliency planning and also prevention of damage. Another thing that they're doing now is they're coming out with a water quality model. Uh, and this is just in the preliminary. So there will be also uh, innovative uh, predictive stormwater modeling for water quality as part of this in the future as well that we can add. So with that, um, in summary, uh, you know, these are something that we can, an innovative idea that we can move forward to now that we've already started. Um, and then we can update them once they're complete. It's estimated to be about a million dollars in 18 months to do the whole county. Uh, but we could start with the critical basins like Little and Big Econ, and they could be done at a cost of 175000 And we could prioritize those uh, for upcoming hurricane seasons. And we also have said initial, some initial discussions on what are some grant programs uh, that we could use uh, to fund this, uh, this innovative uh, 
model as well. So with that, I'm going to turn the next one over to Ed Torres, our utilities director, to talk about our integrated water resource solutions. Thank you, Brett, and good morning. Um, so I will be talking about integrated water solutions and some of the innovations in that front. Um, and traditionally, most flood control projects are really good of getting rid of that excess water. But again, using some of these integrated water solutions, we look at doing both, providing that flood control, but using a portion of that water for water supply. So you probably have noticed when we have some of these large storm events, most of our surface waters and, and lakes, they stage up in elevation, they rise, the water levels are pretty high. And depending on their connectivity to the aquifer and that hydrogeology, those water levels may stay high for a long period of time. It may be two months in some areas or two years in some you know, different uh, lakes for, for that matter. So with integrated water solutions, what we do is we slightly lower that surface water body throughout the year, and that in itself creates that attenuation, extra attenuation volume for flood control. Um, that surface water that we withdraw out of the surface water bodies, um, then we use it beneficially to supplement or augment or reclaim water systems. That's what we use for irrigation. Or we can use it for recharging the aquifer. Um, but generally, when we're talking about integrated water solutions, the, the real question that we get asked most of the time is, hey, guys, how are you guys using that water when it's raining? Right? And what people don't realize is that our service areas are so large, over 600 square miles. So it could be raining in a portion of Orange County, and it could be dry in another portion of Orange County. So with integrated water solutions, we can take some of that excess water and move it to the area that we need it. We can use it right away. We can store some of that water if we don't need it right away or we can recharge the aquifer. And this type of innovative solutions have been used before in Central Florida. Some of you I know are familiar with the AFIRST project um, in the Altamont Springs area. Um, and that project was implemented for the I-4 Ultimate project in a landlocked basin similar to Orla Vista, the Crane's Roof area behind the Altamont Mall. And what we did with that project is we took the stormwater from I-4 Ultimate and stormwater from this landlocked basin, and we treat it to reclaim water standards, and we use that water within the Altamont service area if we needed it at that time. But if we didn't, and we have excess water, we build a six mile long pipeline to the city of Apopka where they can use that water right away if they needed it. Again, it could be raining in Altamont and dry in Apopka. They could store that water, or they can recharge the aquifer. So that's a win-win from a flood control and, and water supply uh, perspective. Also, um, we saved, the Department of Transportation saved tens of billions of dollars with that project because they eliminated the need for a 20-acre stormwater retention pond that they were going to build for I-4 Ultimate. They eliminated a 96-inch pipe, imagine an eight-foot diameter pipe, that was going to bring stormwater from I-4 to that stormwater pond. And moreover, they eliminated bridges that they were going to build over um, Crane's Roost to create additional flood compensating storage volume under those bridges. All of that infrastructure was eliminated because we were able to use this innovative uh, solution with integrated water uh, resources. And an added benefit was that we're treating that water. Imagine the nutrients associated with the stormwater that we were collecting there. That used to go to the, uh, in that case, to the Little Wakaiba River, which was now uh, being treated and used beneficially for irrigation. Um, and again, this project has been operationally now for over six years, and it has been truly proven um, through Matthew, Irma, uh, uh, Ian, and Nicole operating, again, successfully providing that flood control for a major highway and interstate and providing that water supply uh, portion. So really good project on, on, on the win-win side of things. Um, now, you heard Public Works talk about Orla Vista, and you know that uh, the Public Works Department is currently, right now, building a really robust 
flood control project designed for a 100-year, 72-hour storm event. And that's going to mitigate some of the flooding that has occurred there. Great project. Uh, but in addition to that and separate from that project, we're looking at potentially implementing an integrated water solution project at that location as well. Uh, again, providing a little bit more flood attenuation volume and using some of that uh, water if we can. If you look at the figure there on your right um, in, in the slide, you can see that yellow line is the boundary of Shingle Creek in the portion uh, within Orange County. And in orange, you can see the boundary of Shingle Creek, but that portion that is within Osceola County. Uh, in red, you can see the uh, hydrologic unit uh, for Orla Vista or the sub-basin for Orla Vista. Again, that's that landlocked basin where water gets in, but we can't, it can't get out unless we pump it out. Um, and in blue, you see Shingle Creek going downstream. I also have an arrow showing our south uh, water reclamation facility where we produce uh, reclaimed water there. But what we intend to do with this project is, um, again, we draw some of that base flow water from Orla Vista throughout the year. That, in turn, provides some more attenuation uh, volume. And then the flows that are removed from there are released to a portion of Shingle Creek, and we recover that water downstream at our south water reclamation facility. And notice that those flows are recovered before they reach Osceola County, where they have some flood concerns, right, for that downstream area. Um, and when we take that water out of Shingle Creek, we're treating it through our south water reclamation facility and generating more reclaim, uh, again, that we can use for irrigation or we can use for aquifer recharge. Um, and the result is a win-win solution because we are providing additional sustainability because we're not discarding that water, right? And we're also providing added resiliency because we're recovering after a storm event a little bit quicker than we would otherwise. Um, now, the icing on the cake, it will be if we get that appropriation that Kelly mentioned from the legislature, uh, which has $2 million for, for this project. Um, and again, when you live, when you think about integrated water solutions, we're doing three things. We're addressing the flood control issue, we're addressing a water supply issue, and usually we get a little added benefit of that water quality uh, improvement. So with that, I'm going to turn it over now to Lee Mullen, who's going to go over some wetland issues. All right, good afternoon. So you've heard my team present twice to this board before on two different projects, including the Welland Ordinance Review and Update Project, as well as the State of the Wellands Project. So I'm going to talk about new information that wasn't really covered in those previous presentations, and that is understanding the effects of wetland loss. And specifically, wetland loss we know is often viewed as negatively impacting both flooding and water quality. So we wanted to answer to Simple questions, you know, does wetland loss from development increase flood risk, and does wetland loss from development degrade water quality? And so this is how we went about that. So we conceptualized a you know, hypothetical development. Now, to be clear, this does not currently exist, but it's an example of a development that could come before the board. So it's 50-acre, envisioned as a planned development, mixed-use, residential and commercial areas. You know, um, stormwater management, and then the colored areas you see are green. So the green would be the off-site wetlands from the development, and the red would be those wetlands that would be impacted, about five acres. Now, this was conceptualized to meet standard regulatory and environmental criteria. And what we did was we looked at this scenario that you see here, which I would characterize as more conventional design approach, and compared it with other scenarios. Um, including those that adopt LID, low impact design practices, lower amounts of impervious area, and things like that. And we analyzed this using standard engineering tools and models and methodologies to look at the flood risk and the water quality risk. And so here's what the results show. And I'll, I'll walk you through the graphs here on the right. So each um, in the green bar is the represents the undeveloped condition. Now the blue bar represents the kind of typical or conventional design scenario. And the orange bar represents that LID scenario. And so starting at the top, you see that the current stormwater regulations generally provide protection against flooding from wetland loss. And basically the green bar is higher than the blue bar and the orange bar. And that's really not surprising because we, we looked at the standard design storm. This is the 25-year, 24-hour storm. That's regulated. 
you know, developments and applicants need to demonstrate they're meeting that standard. Now, we're not saying that the 25-year, 24-hour storm is the perfect design storm to look at. You know, both Mike and Brett earlier presented on the fact that we're seeing all this new intensifying rain conditions, back-to-back -back storms, and so maybe we should be looking at a higher level of service for these types of developments. But as currently defined, that standard has been met. Uh, so moving down, uh, development around wetlands can impact wetland hydro periods, and I'll get back to that term in a second, and contribute to wetland change and functional decline. So that's that middle bar, middle graph you see where the blue and the orange bars might be, you know, a little bit higher than the green. And what that is saying is that over the course of a year, the total amount of stormwater runoff that's leaving that developed site is going up. And that's not surprising because we're adding buildings, we're adding roads, we're adding sidewalks, we're adding all this impervious area that restricts soil infiltration and promotes new surface water discharges. And if you don't manage that well, you can impact that regional or even just local hydrology that's downstream. Uh, and finally, on the bottom right, we look at water quality, and we're showing this in terms of nutrient discharges. You know, countywide nutrients are the largest driver of surface water impairments. And we see that development meeting environmental regulatory criteria can still increase pollutant discharges off-site and contribute to surface water decline. Now, we in the stormwater industry know that you know, things like um, uh, wet stormwater detention ponds you know, just really aren't up to the task at fully mitigating our environmental and pollution footprint from these developments. Uh, that's why you see you know, that blue bar can be significantly higher than the green bar, but then that LAD scenario and really just design approaches that you know, maximize infiltration-based solutions where possible and other LAD and more modern technologies you know, give you a better outcome often. Now, it's important to note that these are just a, a snapshot scenarios, and these results can vary widely. So this isn't the full spectrum of possibilities. And also, I just wanted to highlight that natural wetland systems in and of themselves generally don't treat runoff and stormwater pollution. Really, nature didn't design those to handle our pollution from our development systems, nor do we want to be sending all our pollution to those systems. We want to be maintaining those in as pristine environment as we can uh, so they can thrive. We want to manage pollution on site wherever possible or regionally. So I mentioned hydro period. So just to define that really fast, well and hydro period is simply how wet is a wetland and for how long. So I mentioned the design methodology, putting in a bunch of new buildings and impervious area, you're changing the hydrology. And if you're not managing that and if you're not kind of mimicking what that pre-development hydrology was, you can cause hydroperiod changes. So either wetlands being becoming a lot more wet or a lot drier, and that can drive functional decline. So if you remember back in the state of the wetlands presentation, we're actually seeing this in our monitored systems in the county, uh, pretty much countywide, where you're seeing a consistent decline in function and wetland function uh, through time. And we think that changes to hydrology and hydroperiod are drivers of that in part. So a few recommendations to step through in regards to development review standards. So uh, one, we recommend applicants provide kind of a more detailed flow map to show how that existing hydrologic patterns will be better mimicked after construction. So this basically helps provide tools to the uh, county staff to work with the applicants to make sure that they are uh, meeting that objective. Uh, second, for wetland hydro periods, staff is already are working with applicants to ensure that off-site hydro periods are maintained in different situations. But really, right now, that's not well codified in rule. And so we recommend formalizing that in the ordinance review that's being updated currently. Next, for mitigation wetlands, we're recommending requiring groundwater monitoring and reporting for about 10 years to assess long-term hydro period effects. So this would be a new requirement, but we don't think it'd be a major new uh, effort because there's a lot of monitoring, reporting, and maintenance ongoing for these systems. This would just be one extra step. And then that data over time can be used by the county to assess are these groundwater changes really affecting our wetlands and natural systems. Now changing land development code because of changing groundwater conditions isn't new. Broward County did that a few years ago uh, because of the, some of the challenges they're seeing with sea level rise. 
And finally, the final recommendation is for projects that incorporate low impact design and achieve a high pollutant reduction criteria, you know, those should be provided those well and review modifiers, those so-called positive incentives that we talked about earlier this month, that would reduce the timeline on those projects. And next would be Jennifer. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. As a follow-up to my previous presentation, I wanted to take a few minutes to uh, introduce some specific projects that we have implemented and some others that we hope to implement in the future in order to better protect the integrity of our natural and constructed stormwater management systems. To start, we've recently taken a closer look at how we implement our private pond inspection program. As I reported in the last presentation, there are approximately 8,000 private ponds in unincorporated Orange County. While this may seem like an insurmountable task, uh, to inspect all of these systems, it's really not necessary for the, for the county to, to put eyes on, on all of these ponds and all of these systems. Last year, Orange County kicked off the Comprehensive Structural Inventory Project, or CSIP. As the name implies, this project will provide an inventory of private and publicly owned structural components of Orange County's vast stormwater management system. Once complete, the CSIP will serve as an excellent tool to help identify the critical locations where private stormwater systems connect and have the potential to impact the county stormwater infrastructure. Once these critical connections are identified, we can allocate the required resources to perform targeted inspections of these private systems that intersect with the infrastructure that we manage. Another project that deserves attention is updating county code to adopt more comprehensive stormwater management operation and maintenance requirements. Some examples of how our code may be improved include the requirement for an updated operation and maintenance plan for previously issued permits and projects. Another option may be to expand the scope of existing code to require all new private projects to perform regular assessments of their stormwater management systems by a professional engineer and submit their findings to the county. Another consideration may include updating our county code and enforcement procedures to strengthen the county's legal authority to compel a property owner to remedy a failing system. Lastly, the county may also consider adoption of certain elements of the statewide stormwater rule. The current rule, as well as the proposed updates, place an emphasis on operation, maintenance, inspections, and reporting on the condition of permitted systems. The adoption of all or at least some key elements of the statewide stormwater rule may also address certain preemption concerns. Finally, I want to mention that the proposed budget does include a request for an additional NPDES staff person who would play a significant role in, in allowing us to tackle some of these projects that I've outlined for you. I think next is Brett. Thank you, Jennifer and uh, Ed and Lee. Um, we'll go through quickly through these recommendations. I, I did want to say this picture was up here before, but this came out of our stormwater innovation workshop and this was an exercise we did to design some improvements uh, out of strictly paper. And that was our water quality group that made that, that uh, LID tree box. So it was quite impressive for that group. Much more artistically talented than I am. Um, but we want to just review those four innovative ideas. We'll go through quickly. We want to uh, look at you know, moving forward with that predictive stormwater model. Hopefully we can get that funding uh, in the legislation um, for uh, Ed's uh, Orta Vista. Um, uh, integrated water resource project. Uh, we want to continue what Lee is talking about and, and explore um, putting some of those additional requirements in the code and continue to, uh, to look at uh, Jennifer Thompson's inspection needs and uh, do some internal and possibly external brainstorming of those requirements moving forward as well. So the last area we're going to look at is funding. And uh, before we go too much into that, we just want to give a snapshot of the last five years just to give you an idea of the type of uh, capital funding and grants we've had. So we do capital projects uh, here in Orange County uh, primarily in three different groups, the Stormwater uh, Management Division, the Roads and Drainage Division, and EPD. 
And if you look at those three over the last five years, the total was about 70 million for all three of those divisions for the capital projects. Uh, if you remember last time we talked about the Order of Vista project, and that project alone is at about 23 million. So about one third of the total five year budget uh, could be used up in one project like that with today's costs. Uh, over the, the past uh, five years, we've also totaled about $22 million in grants. So we're around $90 million uh, in, five, in five years, which for the scope of what those three different divisions do is very limited. Uh, and currently, we, we fund a lot of that from the Transportation Trust Fund and then also the MSBU program. Uh, but we have future needs that are currently not unfunded uh, that include many of these capital projects that will be coming out of our master basin studies that Mike talked about. Uh, retrofitting in older neighborhoods that Commissioner Rebate brought up last time, we do not have an active program to do that. We don't have an active program to implement low-impact design uh, retrofit projects. Uh, as we just talked about, if we're going to do more inspection for the NPDES permits in the future or increase private stormwater systems, we do not have additional funding for that. Uh, and also inspection of removal of sediment. This has become a, a recent concern where we have outfalls in the lakes uh, that you know, process is very challenging, so removing some of those sediments is also something we, we need to have a program for. And as Ed talked about, the integrated water resources solutions. So the current funding we have is, is just not adequate to cover all of these needs that we have in the program. So we talked about last time um, about the stormwater utility fee and just some background on some of the utility fees in other places. Uh, there's 156 cities and 14 counties. Uh, that have it. In Central Florida, Alachua, Brevard, Lake, Marion, Pinellas, Polk, Sarasota, and Volusia already have fees. Um, in, our, in our county, Maitland, Echoe, Orlando, Winter Park, and Winter Garden. Uh, and the average uh, monthly or annual fee is about $96 for all of those jurisdictions. In comparison, our MSBU rate is currently about 78 annually. In comparison with Orlando, Orlando collects about $10 a month, $120 a year, and they generate about $25 million. Uh, last year for that stormwater fee. Hillsborough County cuts a little less, about $6.40 a month, and they generated about $32 million. So that just gives an order of magnitude of what a stormwater fee in those type jurisdictions does generate. So we mentioned last time that we already do have a stormwater utility in place. It was put in place in 1996, so a lot of the, the work was already done. Uh, but the rate was set at zero, and at that time the order, uh, ordinance was implemented the county leadership um, decided to move forward with the ordinance but not implement the fee and wait on that at that time. Recently, uh, Mayor's uh, transition team report uh, did uh, make recommendations from their um, sustainability and smart growth task to increase the county stormwater fee to fund water quality projects by residents and to utilize the stormwater fee as a dedicated funding source to address stormwater and water quality. So there's many uses that we could use it for, uh, such as improved maintenance activities, um, capital projects that could do both flooding and water quality. Um, certainly regional stormwater systems, as we talked about before, more stringent NPDES in private, uh, sediment removal, and really importantly, matching local grant funds. A lot of these uh, projects, like FEMA, require 25% matches or other require 50% matches. These fees could be used to match those grants to, to leverage more funding. Uh, and then all those updated basin studies. Uh, and then, you know, one thing to consider is what would happen to the MSBU program. Um, and if we did implement a stormwater fee, we could look at that uh, replacing the MSBU program we currently have potentially. So what we're recommending for this is to do a stormwater utility fee study. Uh, the first phase would be uh, starting later this year and the next year. And that would basically look at all of our, re uh, our needs, what would the rate model be, um, and we would be coordinating with a lot of different departments, certainly divisions to do that. And then we would come back to the board to present that. If the board decided to move forward, we would go into the phase two, which would be public awareness, uh, you know, ordinance support, creating the database, policy and procedures manual uh, before if it was implemented. So uh, one of the recommendations we're making today is to move forward with that phase one uh, study. Phasing our study, we have funding that could be utilized for that in the current year budget. Uh, and then, you know, if the board uh, wants to move forward, uh, we would then, you know, present those recommendations and then look at uh, the next step in that. So we're going to look at uh, next steps. I know we presented a lot to you today. Um, and so we broke these next steps into kind of short-term, long-term, or mid-term and long-term. So with the existing budget we have, uh, we want to move forward now with that rainfall intensity study. We estimate that to be about 100000 in the current budget. We want to start that phase one of the stormwater utility feasible study 
stormwater utility feasibility study. We estimate that to be about 250,000. So that combination there we have available in the current budget that we can allocate. We've talked about that project manager position. We want to fill that soon. Um, and then we want to see if we can have enough funding to move forward with predictive stormwater modeling in the key areas such as the little and big econs. We want to do that in the next year if possible. Uh, and then do the internal uh, discussions and analysis of the stormwater compliance uh, options for the private systems. So then midterm, uh, once we have that uh, phase one, if the board wants to move forward, uh, we'll go to phase two. We'll budget that in the 24-25 budget. We also want to put money in the 24-25 budget for the resiliency study as a follow-up to the vulnerability assessment, uh, addressing those needs. Uh, and then we want to look at trying to uh, budget about $1.5 million for those stormwater basin studies. That would update the studies, uh, expedite them, and would include the new data that comes out of the rainfall study. So that would be something we'd budget over a couple of years. Uh, and then any changes to the private stormwater systems we want to implement, and hopefully we can implement some of the integrated water resource solutions uh, in the mid-year too. And then long term uh, would be the board's decision on implementing the stormwater utility fee. Um, and then also, you know, budgeting that stormwater uh, management model for a countywide predictive model would be longer term. And then if additional funding is approved, then we would look at, uh, you know, possible budget and staff resources for the variety of those unfunded programs now, especially like retrofitting existing stormwater systems, LID systems there, uh, we could have a more comprehensive program for, for neighborhood retrofit in there. So with that, I know that's been a lot today. Thank you for your patience. We, uh, we wanted just to focus that you know, the stormwater program is critically critical for managing flood and water quality issues. Uh, we certainly um, have had many departments and divisions uh, involved in this effort, um, and we want to make sure that we expedite those mass and basin studies, rainfall data, stormwater resiliency. We've looked at these innovative ideas, move forward with that. Uh, the utility fee study, we think it's important to start that as soon as possible. Um, and then, you know, look at that additional funding for those upcoming budget years to support these recommendations. I'm sorry. With that, Mayor, we're open to any questions. We have many staff here from different divisions and departments that we can help answer those questions. Okay. Um, well, I think you and your team have done a very good job today of taking, you know, the conversation about wetlands, rainfall, and uh, no pun intended, that's a pretty dry subject. <laughs> we don't <laughs> that, think so. Uh, that you all have made very interesting. And I, I, uh, in my observation, I have to uh, look at the county uh, uh, administrator. He made this an immersive experience for us today because he changed the artwork in the uh, chambers today. <laughs> And if you look at the artwork around the wall, and as we talk about climate change and wetlands and rainfall intensity, I think we got immersed in this whole conversation today. <laughs> so uh, as I listened to you carefully, uh, while you were not requesting a specific action, what you were um, inferring was that you wanted uh, I think at least some affirmation from the board uh, that you all should move forward uh, with uh, doing the um, rainfall intensity study and and then perhaps uh, moving forward with the stormwater uh, fee feasibility analysis uh, for a future BCC mm -hmm. yes. discussion. So that's what we have before us that we'll talk about. And... Uh, all six of our commissioners have uh, indicated a desire to speak. And so uh, with that, we're going to start, as usual, with the one and only, Commissioner Nicole Wilson. He says the one and only, and everyone's like, oh, thank goodness. She's the one and only. I, I, I know I've said this to you personally and to the people that have been working on this. I am incredibly grateful for this work and to be in the position I'm in entrusted with helping guide this effort through, because I do think that, um, I mean, we, we really are at that crossroads or, you know, cross rivers, if you will. So I think there, there are parts that I really wanted to make sure I was saying very publicly that I support are um, the integrated um, water resource. Th that is critical. So I can't say that enough. 
Um, I think the LID, you know, if anyone has any curiosity about this, actually at Horizon West, if you go to the Publix there and the, and the Walmart, it, they used LID for that drainage there. You won't find a drainage pond, but you do see sort of what looks like little rock beds, and it kind of it has an interesting shape to it with some native plantings. And, you know, it's been the only place that I can think of that I could actually even point to something like that. And, and, and having the ability to really implement those things, understanding how critical this is and what the limitations are and the amount of land that we can just eat up. You know, the, there has to be an end point in turning land into retention ponds. So um, the part that I want to approach with caution and I want to ask some, you know, you, you all are the, the brilliance here, so I want to make sure that we're being very deliberate. The interactions I have with my residents, the ones that were impacted by floods even before I got into this seat, including the people um, in the Gotha area and to some extent um, areas outside of my district, they were given studies by the county. There were very expensive studies done. And I know that predictive modeling is obviously, we see the tangible end point of that, right? We see sort of the application. It is very, um, I think, for me, hard to go with a straight face to the people at Gotha and say, hey, we're coming back with another study. If, without actually saying after that, what next? What do we do with that information? I have a, a shelf of binders of the studies that were handed to me as I walked in that were just sitting on that shelf without any actual action plan associated with the studies. That being said, I know that data is how we make good policy. So I'm, I'm not saying that we don't need the studies. We need the studies, but I also want a commitment from our board to support whatever efforts those studies point to as being good planning for the future. Um, I think the other part that I wanted to approach with caution, I think it's important that we look at the fiscal, um, what, what this is gonna cost and what the, uh, our responsibility, and we need to be good stewards. But I also think factoring in the cost of doing nothing is important, and I'm not sure if that goes into our CIP, CIP evaluation. And so, um, you know, looking at what we're having to do in areas now that potentially we may have known or should have known or could have known or a study is telling us um, that potentially an expenditure that we weren't willing to make at the time is now going to cost us even more seven, eight, ten years down the line. How do we bake that in as we come back and look at these studies and decide what to put those dollars towards? So I just want to make sure that we are being intentional every step along the way. Like I said, I, the data-driven approach is, is, is important for all of this. This is obviously such technical information. But a study without the action plan is, is not, I think, um, where I want to go out to my residents and give them updates for. And I want to be able to say, look, we know because of this research, the next expenditure makes the most sense because it will save us long term. Um, but thank you so much. I can't tell you how grateful I am. I know the, um, you know, the cross collaboration has been intensive and time consuming. And I think, you know, maybe one of the greatest thing that this county doesn't know happened was getting this dream team back together of Ed and Brett, right? You all were together before and seeing the innovative approach to all, all these um, really critical issues. So thank you. Thank you. And certainly the, the challenges, you know, as we do these studies, uh, is the, you know, the cost of the improvements that come out of the study. And, you know, that's often the challenges in looking at the benefits for what their costs are doing. And, and that's something that, you know, we'll have to look forward to. Obviously, something that is $10 million that benefits 10 residents versus $10 million that benefits 100 residents. And we have to look at that. And that's some of the challenges of some of the studies we've done. The cost to, you know, to fix those issues has just been cost prohibitive uh, in many cases because of our funding, uh, but still certainly prioritizing that. So I, I know it's... It's sometimes you say, oh, you did the study, but sometimes we just don't have, you know, the resources to, to move forward uh, to do everything that we've studied. That's the, that's the challenge we have. I, and I, I can't believe, you know, for all the times that we sort of look back at our, our predecessors and criticize, I'm going to say something just, you know, groundbreaking. Thank you for putting something in place <laughs> that we may now be able to utilize that had a, you know, a, the work was done on putting the ordinance in place. It had this, you know, zero, zero amount associated with it, but I, if you asked me um, about what kind of deal this would be for my community to pay $78 annually, I, you know, I would sign on today, understanding that the costs of doing nothing or, you know, keeping the status quo, or it's just really not, it's not going to, we can't do it. 
you know, we're, we're, we're talking about higher costs in, in life and suffering. So, um, you know, I look forward to supporting whatever those efforts are in finding uh, the funding. I know that's going to look multi-tiered, um, but I support also going back and revisiting that ordinance that was put into place in order to be able to have a structure there. I hear you, uh, Commissioner Wilson. Um, sometime in life you don't know what you don't know, and so that's why we study it. And as uh, Mr. Black and I indicated, uh, once you know you have that information by which to make some decisions, there's usually a cost to it. And, uh, uh, you know, as we move forward, uh, our board will certainly have to make some decisions, just like every board prior to us has had to make some decisions, and every board that will come after us will have to make some decisions. Uh, but we all still have to live within a certain budget, within the revenue stream that we have, and that's the challenge. And, and as we go forward during this next um, budget hearing cycle, you're going to hear a, a, a lot of the challenges that we have. And I know in advance we will not have uh, all of the money that is needed in order to address all of the issues that our community is facing. Uh, it's just a sad reality, I think, of government sometimes, uh, especially at the local level. We cannot run deficits. We cannot spend one dime more than what we bring in. And uh, you, you see those issues coming before us, us every board meeting. Someone comes in with an issue, a need, and um, I don't know if you're like me, but when the citizens engage with me, uh, Rarely, uh, they come in and say, hey, we got a boatload of money to give you uh, to, to, for, to help us. No, it works the other way. They say, uh, Mayor, we need this, we need this, we need that. And, you know, I politely say, yes, I understand, uh, you know, but we have to deal with it in the context of what we can afford. So even a conversation about uh, the fee feasibility, feasibility uh, analysis that has to be done, um, you know, that's what we have to do is try to understand how we're going to pay for all of it. So I look forward to uh, the, the conversation and the dialogue with our board. I, and I think, Mayor, if I could respond really quickly, I think also looking at, you know, when we talk about the design standards, that's, that is not a fix for us. That's a fix in the process as far as like that kind of yeah. CIP or big investment. And I think that looking at those opportunities, finding those opportunities also would be I believe the public would feel very grateful for that work. Yeah, yeah, I, I hear you. Uh, Commissioner Michael Scott, you're up. I'm second. That's rare. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so just three things for me. Um, when it comes to uh, the private ponds, um, I think that we should put eyes on it, not necessarily frequently, but I think it's important um, that we have consistency across the county in our public maintain, public maintained ponds and the private ones because, you know, private issues become public issues if not addressed properly. And so um, whatever the frequency is, I think that we should definitely put eyes on it at a, a pace and, and, and a schedule that makes sense to ensure that what they're putting on paper and saying they're doing is actually what we observe out in the field. Um, when it comes to the fee, um, uh, as you get the study and you start to, to craft the process and come back to us, I think it's important to figure out you know, how those dollars are allocated um, putting a, a system in place to be able to look. It's like, hey, we may allocate, you know, a set amount of dollars this particular fiscal year, and the next year the need may change. And also maybe the, the, um, um, the need and the cost may change. So putting measures in place that are kind of automated so that we're not uh, making a longer process when the needs change, when the fiscal change. And then the last piece for me is just Orla Vista, Orla Vista, Orla Vista. Um, I think you guys have done a great job of, of meeting the need. Um, and the concerns expressed, but um, as I shared in our conversations, we need to be better storytellers of what we're doing. And so when it comes to that community and Bonnie Brook and others, um, just cognizant of what we've done, what we're doing, and what we're planning to do beyond these presentations, because a, a 60 or so point PowerPoint presentation, um, no one's going to sit through that. And so just being able to articulate in, in everyday terms, you know, how what we're doing is going to impact them, more importantly, how it's going to improve their lives um, and why we need to do something or why we don't do something. So thank you for the presentation and for the work for you and the other members of the team. Yeah. It's certainly something yeah. that you know, Joe and I have been talking about, uh, storytelling with our public involvement um, in trying to, to, you know, to improve that. And that is, you know, these are technical issues that are challenging 
to try to get across, and especially, you know, expectations in some of these, we can't solve all of the flooding. There's always going to be something beyond our design storm. And so if we make an improvement, we have to manage that expectation, which is a challenge too. You know. Thank you. All right. Um, yeah. You know, we, we all want, we want uh, success. And um, clearly what I take away from the presentation is the rainfall intensity is going to increase in the next 2,500 years. And we better plan for that. And I don't want to have to look at uh, people like the residents of Orla Vista or any of these other areas that experienced flooding in the recent past uh, and, and say that um, this board failed them because, or, or this a team of um, county staff failed them because uh, we didn't adequately plan for it and, or anticipate you know, what some of the, the fixes could be. But I still buffer that with knowing full well that we are dealing with uh, Mother Nature, and uh, we cannot predict the future and uh, the exact time that we may deal with some natural disaster, major storm that will exceed our current capacity, but we are getting after it. And so we, we do need to reassure the residents that we, are, that we got a plan, we're moving forward, we're working it, uh, and uh, do what we can to mitigate any uh, impact in the near f future. So, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Moore. I don't really have that much to add. It was a very comprehensive report. I think you did an excellent job with your first steps, uh, second steps, and third steps. The only thing that I would add, you know, that um, which may come from the communication shop is when these studies come back in. I think it, if, if we see trouble areas, we know we're going to have to wait for funding. We just need to let them know, like you said, in a couple of those pictures, if there had been proper notification, maybe that we would have saved cars. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's important that what we learn, we share with the people so that then they can make appropriate decisions. And thank you for your great work on this. Thank you. Commissioner Uribe. Brett, you and your team have done phenomenal. Um, I have to commend you for just even your role since you've come on board. It's been fantastic at helping us deal with these. It is worrisome when we know these issues are happening and we don't have the funding because there's not going to be a solution. Um, there's short-term solutions like making sure our pumps and our generators are ready and, and we're cleaning um, the area. But ultimately, Rio Pinar and, um, and these different areas are going to have, if we have what we had last year, there is no fix that certainly can happen this summer that's going to prevent that. So um, my, my biggest concern is can we try to find some sort of way? Because it's hard when you've already got an infill. Mm -hmm. There's not much besides eminent domaining property or, or things like that. So I would love to find a way at least to prioritize the clearings and things like that so we know we have the best capable opportunity for the circumstances that come up. And I'm already getting constituents who are scared of the summer, right? They're calling and saying, what's our clearing like? Have they checked the ponds? Have they checked the pumps? And I think it's even been fearful to see in the excessive rain we've had this week. So <clears throat> it's worrisome to us, just as Commissioner Wilson mentioned, yeah, we've got studies and those studies require a lot of funding, and then the mayor says he doesn't have an open bank account, so we can't fund it all. So we're really stuck in this catch-22, and it's almost like what's the best circumstance for the bad circumstance? Um, I do want to go a step further. Um, the private ponds and things like that. A, a major thing we saw, and I, I'll stick a one neighborhood, was Gulfstream Harbor. It's a 900-plus mobile home unit where 300 units were underwater. The pond was private and they weren't pumping it, they weren't prepared for it. So we had 300 mobile homes with seniors underwater and no electricity. Um, luckily for our first responders and our fire, they ordered pumps, we got stuff moving. Um, but really, what kind, of, um, what kind of rules or what kind of infractions can we set? Because they're actually causing the problem that is affecting our citizens. So although we, uh, citizens calls and we're like, well, that's a private community, 
that doesn't resolve the fact that they're in a flooded circumstance and don't know what to do. They call us. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and, and this also goes to our FDOT ponds. Um, mm -hmm. They're private. They're not, they're, you know, FDOT is not going and doing a checklist on all their ponds. Normally, when we get FDOT to step in, it's because a neighborhood has said, hey, mm -hmm. the runoff pond is horrible. It's this, it's that. And so we then push FDOT and then they come in and kind of get into compliance. I know that's a lot of labor, that's a lot of hours, but ha do you have a way of identifying these private ponds, you know, locations and FDOT roads because, or ponds because retention, because that, you know, if you guys don't get that help, no matter what you do, that's still gonna exist. So I kind of feel like my, my whole point here is we've got circumstances that we just have to deal with. What's the best outcome for those circumstances to try to prevent the least amount of impact if this happens to us again? Yeah, certainly on the, you know, looking at like an existing areas like a Rio Pinar, we certainly would want to see if there's something that we can do to help the situation today. And, you know, we are looking at that across the county. Um, some of the challenges are, you know, you can do something, but it may, you know, solve part of the issue. And so, you know, do we want to invest in, a partial solution, um, that's the managed expectations part of you. But certainly, we didn't talk today much about it, but we did last time. You know, we have very extensive maintenance units, and, and Jeff Charles, who oversees our stormwater maintenance group, is, is fabulous. And um, Jeff's got an extreme knowledge of those areas. And But we now have learned everything. From each of these storms, especially Ian, we've learned a lot. So we know, you know, the hot spots better than we did before. And we'll, right. we can try our best. Of course, there's a limit with Mother Nature, as the mayor said. Um, on the private stuff, uh, Jennifer uh, is here and may be able to give you some more. But that's really kind of what her presentation was. Let's look at what can we do. You know, could we require um, these types, these type private ponds to give us inspection uh, reports over a certain amount of time? Um, some of the other water management districts are doing that so that we have to have an engineer working for them say, I inspected the pond um, and it's worth uh, it. Maybe we can add that to Vision 2050. Yes. <laughs> Jennifer, Especially in new development. I mean, at the, min at the minimal, in new development. I'll just add a little bit to that. So, you know, prior to a storm event, you know, we're, we're working closely to, you know, to try to ensure and, and compel these uh, private system operators to, to perform the required maintenance for their systems. However, when it's an extreme event like we all experienced this past fall, um, you know, in the particular example that, that you gave, I, I don't know a lot of the details about exactly where it's located or where it's designed to drain to, but you would have to be very cautious too. You know, if, uh, if, if let's assume that may, maybe that system had been fully uh, maintained prior to the event, but now it's just above capacity. If everybody is out there with their pumps and discharging offsite to another system, that could potentially exasperate the issue. Again, without knowing some of the details of yeah, what well, this circumstance like. was very specific because when fire department ordered the pumps, they said, "Whoa, how much is that going to cost us?" You well, know, so then yeah. so that was their first response when we took on that that you know that cost to help these residents. Sure, and one of the questions that that we as a county would be asking, you know, if they had said yes, well, where is that? Where is that water going? How much water are you pumping? Who's downstream? Who could that affect? So. There are a few other... Yeah, I mean, and, and when I talk about the private, because the circumstance, they had not done the clearing. So although we had the next part available, they had not maintained their end. So Understood. that inadvertently caused that much to rise. And then eventually, when they pumped it, they pumped it under our canal that was ready, but they had never properly cleared their area, so it caused it to happen. But my whole point is, can we put into policy, especially moving forward with development growing as quickly and rapidly as it is, that, 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 you know, they, we keep a list of these ponds that are on their property, because we also see what happens, especially multifamily, those change hands within four to five years is the average multifamily sale. So when that happens, you know, the responsible parties moved on and, and investors come in, it's, it's not the same as the person who developed it. So that's the point of that last bullet there. Yeah. Uh, that is what that analysis will, will do, Commissioner, so we'll even have a better understanding of what those options are with respect to the private ponds. Yeah. No, definitely, but I, you know, I'd still, just any scenarios that could put our established communities in a better 
case scenario is a sense because I understand we don't have the money but what is the best thing we could do for the best circumstance out of what we have would be nice to start getting especially us with older established communities understood so. okay thanks Commissioner Gomez Cadero thank you mayor thank you for the presentation and I want to go and um, talk a little bit about I almost Got run off of questions because everybody already <laughs> said them. But the, um, well, you have to do like Commissioner Wilson. You have to boom. hit your button fast first. <laughs> okay. So, but going back to the private ponds and so, well, I have been, you know, um, meeting with the Public Works and Joel and so because of all these issues going on with the HOA, they have, you know, gated. My district have a lot of gated um, community and, you know, these private ponds saying they call the county for whatever happens, they call the county every time. And it's true what commissioner said, we should get, you know, something that go alleviate because they still our citizens anyways, you know? So okay, after that one I wanted to also talk about um, the the challenges of our, about the studies already answered. Um, just one thing, how long does it take a study to be completed? There's a there's a, a wide range. Um, certainly, um, six months to you know I'd say 18 months. Uh, it depends on a lot a lot of what makes a study take a long time is data collection. So these master basin studies, you know, part of that is just the extreme amount of data that's being collected in the field to document every single stormwater you know, piece of infrastructure. So that's that's the depending something like a stormwater a rainfall intensity study. Hopefully, you know, it's, it's taking data, you know, that's more out there and not having to collect in the field. Hopefully that's something to be done quicker. I think the phase one of the stormwater utility feasibility study we were estimated made a year yeah. on that one. So, you know, um, we're, we're the, the consultants that we're using uh, are unfortunately popular among many other places too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, we're, they're busy, they're, they're doing a lot of work. So we have to balance, you know, those resources, but it, it just depends on, it depends on the scope. But, but you, know, you know, certainly generally in that, hopefully a lot of them can be done in the nine month to a year time frame, depending on what they are. Okay, so if that takes that time, let's see you completed the, the study tomorrow. Mm -hmm. how, how long does that study last? For example, we have the challenge in that recommendations, we don't have the money to do A, B, and C. Right? So that we stay there and we stay there and we stay there, I guess. I don't know. Or maybe we will get some alternative that, okay, but what, how long does that study last before you are requested to do a new one because it didn't went through or however? How, how long? Yeah, and that, of course that, can, that, that it ch it depends on, you know, what the area you're studying. Um, obviously, if you studied Horizon West 10 years ago and you said, I want to use a study from Horizon West 10 years ago, there's been so much rapid change out there in development. But something, you know, in, in maybe in District 3, you know, in, in the Conway area hadn't changed because of the development. So that's, you know, one factor is the development patterns in the area. Obviously, if we um, change uh, some of our design standards, um, if we do move forward with that, that would obviously, you know, require those studies to be updated. If there's a new stormwater rule uh, passed, that would obviously affect some of what we could do, and uh, depending on the studies. Uh, so, you know, obviously you don't want studies to stay on the shelf for a long time because, you know, uh, things change. So that's one of the challenges when, you know, if you don't have a uh, extensively funded program, you know, you're limited. If you pay for a study, you really want to make sure that that study has a chance. Exactly. Now, luckily there are a lot of grant programs out there, and obviously those grant programs usually require a study. So, um, you know, we, a lot of times we're doing the study so then we can justify, you know, a grant or benefit cost or something that the grant requires. Um, so. Uh, Daniel and Mike Drozik, uh, and then I know uh, many people in EPD, Liz and others, they're very aggressive in you know, pursuing whatever funding we can. So rarely do we put something on the shelf and do nothing. We always try to see what we can, we can do. Um, there's limitations on St. John's funding. There's limitations on that funding. So, you know, it's hard to, if you look at Orta Vista, we had three different funding sources to put that, you know, grant funding sources, and that becomes complicated managing multiple grants. Um, has been challenging, so you know that that is one of the other things. But we, you know, obviously, if we do a study, the intent is to try to move forward as much as possible. But sometimes you have multi jurisdictions, uh, as we have in, in one of them we're doing now. Uh, many jurisdictions that obviously adds challenges too. You know, if you, a canal doesn't just stay in a jurisdiction; it tends to go through. You know, can go through multiple cities or a county and city. 
So coordinating that cost obviously adds uh, additional challenges. Um, but you know, we we had the same conversation on the transportation side too. You want to make sure if you do a study that it doesn't that you have the next step to move forward to, you know, because it can get obviously get outdated as well. Okay, that was good. Okay. It sounded like the answer was it depends. <laughs> I could have, I could have got you got a lunch and just said it depends, right? Yes, and my last question, um, Brett. Um, in one of the slides, it says that. Um, it, the LID manual will be finalized this year, 2023. It hasn't been finalized yet. No, it's very close. Uh, Jennifer's here. Uh, uh, Jennifer Cummins has ever seen it, but yeah, we're we're at. Uh, I think we got the 90 percent submittal, and so we're working towards that final submittal. But we're pretty close. I mean, we have okay. uh, you know the, uh, uh, very getting very close, but we want to make sure that it's you know uh, okay. meets all of our, our requirements and all that. So yeah, later this year, okay. hopefully later this summer. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Commissioner Bonilla. All right, so I definitely want to say thank you because, you know, I've been here since December 2016. Um, been through a couple of hurricanes and more than a few studies <laughs> where... You know, nothing really came out of it. But this here is really different than what I've seen before. Um, this is really thought out. It's really well outlined with, I just love it. You know, you have like ideas, action items, innovate, innovative potential projects, funding. Like you really covered everything that I have in my evidence-based policy-making worksheet that I would have asked for. Um, so this is excellent. Um, but I will say that I, you know, what was it um, past behavior predicts future behavior? So I just want to reiterate and, you know, some of the concerns that I've heard here and say that I just hope this doesn't stop and it continues because I know in 2017 when we had the hurricane you know I, I asked for studies because you know I said even back then the storms were going to get worse we have climate change they're getting bigger they're holding more water they're dropping more water you know we really need a plan for this we need some studies and then studies were started um, I'm looking at my notes here there was one um, at, in 2020 I'm looking at the email so it, um, it was called a three-year flood study at 2020 was the three-year mark, and I was asking for virtual community meetings um, or community meetings to update my residents on this because this had affected us during a hurricane. We asked for this study. You know, this the the community meeting never happened. We had COVID, you know, and and so just things. You know, COVID happened, the pandemic, and mm -hmm. and other issues, and it's just, you know, I'm just hoping that. We, what we really need is just this consistency of moving forward on things, and they just don't stop because of whatever may happen. Um, so I just want to reiterate that, and you know, like I said, this is excellent, but I want to see it continue moving forward. Um, and you know, we have a change of board, you know, so I mean, I really hope that any new board members, new mayor, whatever, continues this and doesn't put a stop to it. But you know, it's politics, and that could happen to you know I'm realistic but so I want to you know we have different um, communities that have been flooded a couple of times now we know these storms are getting worse I love this predictive um, uh, model he modeling here that you could tell you where is where it's going to flood um, I like the innovative ideas of using using the water um, but, you know, I was just thinking about, and I've, I've said, like, like that apartment complex I had mentioned earlier that was all flooded, you know, that would be a perfect area since we know the water goes there to add a reservoir. Um, and, you know, I was reminded of the reservoirs that I've seen one in Phoenix, Arizona, or maybe it wasn't in Phoenix, but it was somewhere in Arizona. And then um, there was one in, I think it was Tennessee or North Carolina. I can't remember where it was. I was in a family vacation, we were looking for a lake to go boating in, and this lake was actually a reservoir. 
that so the snow melts it fills up this this area it's dammed and then by the end of summer before winter starts it's emptied and so you know things so they these other areas these other states they prepare they hold you know it's excess, excess water they use it and then you know they use it for resources or whatever you know during the time that it's there and then they reset for the next season so you know, I know you're looking at ideas. You know, there's one um, that maybe we could look at. But, you know, the studies will tell what we can and can't do, right? Um, I'm concerned about the stormwater utility fee. Um, I do want to see funding happen. I do feel that a fee like this is transparent because it's dedicated funding. Um, but I'm also concerned about the fairness of it because I do have lake boards, and they, they pay to maintain that lake and it's a private lake there's no public access to it and they've asked me well why doesn't the county pay for it or why doesn't other taxpayers pay for it and it's like well other taxpayers don't have access to this lake it's affecting you it's you know it's it's your lake so it's only fair that you pay for it and not other people who don't have access to it you know so if we do like a fee like this, a stormwater utility fee, though, then, well, now everyone's paying for everyone else's impact or what they get to enjoy, because now are we paying for those private lakes, you know, other taxpayers who doesn't get to enjoy that lake? Um, and, you know, in the rural area, you know, we're always complaining about, you know, we did move to the rural area for a rural lifestyle. We understand that when we move there, we do not have access to all of these um, infrastructure and utilities and stuff. We get that. We understand that. We know that. Um, but when you go put in a 2,000-unit development that's now using up our infrastructure that we cannot expand anymore, and our taxes go up, but we're not benefiting from it because there's nothing that can be done because of the environment and a lot, you know, the inaccessibility of adding more lanes or whatever, you know, but we're paying more taxes, but we're not getting anything out of it. That's not fair. So I have six acres. I have a pond on my property. My neighbor, they filled up their pond. So now their property is flooding into my property, which isn't fair. Um, I'm actually thinking of built, built, like doing a berm to prevent their flooding from coming onto my property. And on the other side of me, they had bought a lot of dirt to try to lift up their property, which guess where that water would go? To mines. Um, but they bought the wrong dirt, so we had, like, for months we saw piles of dirt just sitting there. Um, but, you know, that if both of those properties on the side of me are affecting my property, I have a pond which gets flooded from the properties to the side of me. Well, really the one who built, who covered it in their pond. And then I have the road, which used to be a dirt road. The county paved it, but they didn't put in any retention ponds or anything like that to collect the water. So guess where all that water from the county road goes? It goes into my pond, right? So my property is flooding. The county's not paying to maintain the pond on my property. But now if this goes through, so now I'm paying a tax, which I don't benefit from it from no infrastructure, is the county going to, with this fee now, fit, you know, clean up the pond on my property and help pay for that, which is, you know, it's being filled up with water from the county road because they didn't put in enough infrastructure for that. You know, so it's, it's not fair for someone like me to have to pay taxes and not benefit from it at all. And that will be the case for a lot of the people in the rural area. So I just, not that I don't want funding, because I do, um, and I do care about my neighbors in the urban service area, but it needs to be fair, you know, that, you know, everyone, if everyone's going to pay for it, everyone should benefit from it. Um, so I just, I'm just concerned about that. And, you know, that's the reason why you have a lot of people in the rural area who just doesn't trust government, you know, because of what I just explained. You know, they're paying all these taxes and that, you know, and our quality of life is being impacted negatively from the decisions of government, and they're not putting any money into fixing it. Um, and then, you know, this big econ study here, which I was supposed to have a community meeting in 2020, 
you know, what happened to that, and now we're doing more studies, and, you know, it's just, sorry, I sound a little bit frustrated, but it's because, again, when I've been at this for years, and, you know, I'm just hoping that we finally get somewhere, but not in a way that's also going to impact my finances, because now I have to replace my roof and all this other stuff, and, you know, I'm in the same boat as everybody else out there, you know, so I feel them. I'm human, too. I'm also a taxpayer, <laughs> so I get it. Um, so I just want to kind of express what I'm feeling and what I'm sure a lot of the other people in the area are feeling too. Thanks. And, and, and I am far from an expert in stormwater utility fees, but we're lucky that we have one of our continuous services consultants has done a lot of them statewide. So a lot of the issues you're bringing up have, you know, are similar to a lot of other counties that have stormwater fees. They have rural areas, urban areas, and I know that they've, they've you know, addressed those areas in other places. So that's part of why we hire an outside expert that's done this in other places so they can bring that back and say, hey, here's how you address these private, public, rural, urban areas. And I, I can't say that I have much expertise at all on that, but that's why we're, you know, we're doing that and we'll bring back those recommendations. But certainly something to take into consideration as, you know, there's different functions and people are already, you know, one of the things people are already in neighborhoods paying MSBU, how do you address that? What do you do with private? So those are things we're going to have to certainly study. Yeah, well, we had a consultant for Vision 2050, though, who brought up all these terrible ideas for the rural service area. So that doesn't bring me a lot of comfort that we're bringing another consultant. Um, so, you know, and unfortunately, some of the things we've been seeing from consultants hasn't been that great either and really needs to have staff take a, you know, a closer look at some of these, this work that we're getting from consultants. Uh, also, right, I think a number of, uh, of other jurisdictions. So we have uh, this model to work from with respect to utility fee. And I was around in 1996, perhaps Joe Kunkel and I may be the only two uh, remember this discussion. And that's why I was at zero uh, at that day. But uh, we do have a good body of work. So when we come back after end of phase one, uh, ready for a good discussion with the board that uh, can uh, certainly reflect all these different uh, kind of interests in terms of crafting uh, what the board may want to consider with respect to a fee. All right. Uh, we're going to run out of time. Um, from here, I think the, the consensus is um, to kind of move forward with uh, the rainfall intensity study and uh, move forward with um, the stormwater uh, fee uh, feasibility uh, analysis. We'll make the decisions once we have all of the information. Okay, We're going to uh, go into um, recess and we'll reconvene at uh, 2 p.m. for the afternoon portion. Thank you all.
All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm going to welcome you back to the May 23rd, 2023 uh, afternoon portion of the Orange County Board of County Commission meeting. Uh, as we begin this afternoon, uh, we will uh, have the first item, and uh, this is the Board of uh, uh, Planning, Board of Zoning and Adjustment. That No, that's not correct. Uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission recommendations. Uh, at this time, we're going to ask uh, Mr. Jason Sorensen to come forward, uh, who is going to frame this item, and we'll move forward from there. All right, Mr. Sorensen. All right, thank you, Mayor, and good afternoon, Commissioners. On April 20th, the Planning and Zoning Commission considered three conventional rezoning cases, all of which were recommended for approval, and we have not received any appeals. The action requested is to approve the April 20th PZC recommendations, and staff is available for any questions. All right. Uh, to the commissioners, uh, you all have uh, the information before you. Is there a motion for approval? So move, Gomez. Second. second. We have a motion by Commissioner Gomez Cadero, second by Commissioner Scott. Uh, all in favor, let it be known by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The motion passes, and it is unanimous of the members who are present. Uh, we do not have Commissioner Wilson or Commissioner Uribe present at this time, just for the record for the controller. All right, we'll move forward then uh, to uh, the next item on our agenda. I'm going to call on Mr. Tez Kozak uh, to present the May 4th Board of Zoning Adjustment uh, Recommendations. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. On May the 4th, the Board of Zoning Adjustment heard 17 cases. Twelve of those cases were recommended for approval. Two cases were recommended for denial. One case, ZSE 2208-064, was, was withdrawn by the applicant, and two cases were continued. The BZA appeal deadline was Friday, May 19th, and no cases were appealed. We wanted to note that one of the cases recommended for denial Juan Santa for commercial kennel, case SC 2302-152 was withdrawn by the applicant after the BZA meeting. With the exception of the two cases that were withdrawn and the two that were continued, we request the BCC accept the rec BZA recommended action and findings. All right. Uh, you've heard the presentation by Mr. Kozak. Is there a motion by any commissioner to accept? Some of more. Second, Gomez. We have a motion. Um, by Commissioner Moore, second by Commissioner Gomez Cadero. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Uh, the motion passes and it is unanimous. Uh, all members of the board are present with the exception of Commissioner Uribe. Uh, with that, we will move forward on our agenda to the next item, and this is item A1 regarding a municipal service benefit unit. I'll open the public hearing on this item. And we have uh, Ms. Ann Dawkins, the MSTU supervisor, who is going to frame this item. Ms. Dawkins, you're recognized. Good afternoon, Mayor Demings, County Commissioners, A1. This public hearing is continued from March 21st, 2023. This request is from a property owner to establish the Fernway and Conway Estates MSBU for street lighting. Ballots were mailed to property owners. 72% of the ballots returned were in favor of the establishment of the MSPU. The street lighting assessment will be $86 per lot for operational expenses and administrative fees. This subdivision area is located in District 3. This establishing MSPU for street lighting will be effective November 1st, 2023, if approved today. All right, thank you, Ms. Dawkins. Uh, in that this is an administrative item, uh, there is no uh, applicant on it, but I will open it up for any public comment. Uh, Mr. Conklin, do we have any members of the public present who wish to be heard on this item? I have no speaker cards for this item, Mayor. Okay, then I'll close the public hearing, and then Commissioner Uribe is absent the district commissioner. I, I'll move for approval. Second, Gomez. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Motion passes and it is unanimous. And then we'll move to item A2. I'll open the public hearing on this item. And Ms. Dawkins, uh, will you frame this item? A2. This request is from a developer to establish the Valencia Isle for street lighting and for retention pond maintenance, which consists of 60 lots. The street lighting assessment will be $87 per lot for operational expenses and administrative fees. 
The retention pond maintenance will be $78 for operational expenses and administrative fees. This subdivision area is located in District 3. These establishing MSBUs for street lighting and for retention pond maintenance will be effective November 1st, 2023. All right. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Dawkins. Uh, Commissioner Uribe, we're on A2. Yes. Uh, are there any members of the public present who wish to be heard on this item? I have no speakers for this item, Mayor. Okay. Uh, then we'll close the public hearing at this time. Uh, we'll go to the district commissioner for a potential motion. Commissioner Uribe, would you like to offer a motion regarding item A2 uh, uh, yes. at this time? Motion for approval. Second. second. Okay, we have a motion by Commissioner Uribe, second by Commissioner Gomez Cordero. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. A motion passes and it is unanimous. We'll move to the next item on our agenda, item A3. We'll open the public hearing on this item, and Ms. Dawkins, you'll recognize. A3. This request is from a developer to amend the Waterlay Area MSBU for street lighting and for retention pond maintenance to add 388 lots from Waterlay Phases 4B and 4C. The street lighting assessment will be $132 per lot for operational expenses and administrative fees. The retention pond maintenance assessment will be $78 for operational expenses and administrative fees. This subdivision area is located in District 1. These are many MSBUs for street lighting and for retention pond maintenance will be effective November 1st, 2023, if approved today. All right. Uh, thank you, Ms. Dawkins. Again, administrative item, no applicant on this, uh, uh, generated primarily by staff. Uh, are there members of the public present who wish to be heard on this item? I have no speakers for this item, Mayor. All right. Then we'll close the public hearing at this time, and we'll go to the District Commissioner. Commissioner Wilson, would you like to offer a motion? Yes, I moved. Wilson. Second, second. Moore. Okay. A motion by Commissioner Wilson, second by Commissioner Moore. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, no. A motion passes, and it is unanimous. We'll move to item A4. Uh, we'll open the public hearing on this item, and Ms. Dawkins, you're recognized. A4. This request is from Orange County Utilities to establish the Wikiwa Spring Septic to Sewer Retrofit Program Phase 3 MSBU for the construction of a central gravity sewer system to include the Palm Section 3 and the Palm Section 4 subdivisions. 214 ballots were mailed to property owners to determine majority opinion. Of the ballots returned, approximately 92% were in the favor of the establishment of the MSBU. The wastewater system improvement fees will be for a period of 10 years at a 3.1 interest rate. The estimated total cost per property owner for the project would be $6,000 for annual assessment of approximately $709.48 for operational expenses and administrative fees. This subdivision area is located in District 2. This establishing MSBU for wastewater system improvements will be effective November 1st, 2023, if approved today. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, once again, an administrative item. Are there any members of the public present who wish to be heard on this item? Yes, Mayor, I have one speaker card, Robert Sampson. If you'll approach the podium, you'll have two minutes. Over there, yes, please. And then please state your name and address for the record. I'm Robert Sampson. I live in Bent Oak, one of the affected communities there. And I'm really here today to thank uh, the mayor and the commissioners for their support in this matter. Uh, I would like to especially thank uh, Commissioner Christine Moore for her foresight in supporting sewers for, in this District 2 area. Um, it's called the Wakiva Springs Corridor. She's worked hard to educate homeowners to bring a solution that protects both Orange County and property owners. Mm -hmm. By approving a sewer plan for Wakiva Springs area, you have secured the value of our largest personal investment. Uh, it's the value of our homes. Since the passing of the Springs Protection Act in 2016, Orange County homeowners with septic systems have had only two choices. One very bad one, putting our own treatment plants in our front yards. 
The high cost of these unproven systems would have lowered our home values, changed our daily lives in many negative ways. All this would have resulted in less revenue for Orange County, and uh, the, uh, the home values would have been dropping. Your approval of Gravity Fred sewers is also a win for the environment. The sewer plan in District 2 removes all harmful nutrients from the groundwater. That's 100%. It also is the best solution for removing the future liability that Orange County has with respect to the Springs Protection Act. This cannot be said of any other solution that was ever proposed by the Florida Department of Environmental Protection as part of that Springs Protection Act. Our district homeowners, District 2 homeowners, now look forward to becoming an example of how to solve environmental issues. Yes, property owners, the state and the county can work together and provide a clean future for our children. I hope that some of you will stop by in the next several years and as the plan unfolds, uh, it'll work every place in the county. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you for your presence, Mr. Sampson. Uh, do we have any other speakers? No other speakers, Mayor. All right, then we'll close the public hearing. We'll go to the district commissioner, Commissioner Moore, for any comments or motion. Yes, I just want to say, you know, when I started on that journey of, of, of persuading neighbors that this was a good course of action, you know who was with me the first step, and those were very difficult meetings, 400 people at a time, very angry and upset. And there was Bob Sampson, and we honored him as our District 2 person of the year last year. So I invited a half dozen people to be here today to celebrate this. And look who is here again, <laughs> Mr. Samson. So I can't thank you enough because he was a big part of this. So with that, I guess we're going to do it again in a minute, but that I'd like to move the recommended Second, action. Second, Wilson. All right. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The motion passes, and it is unanimous. All right. Uh, to the group who came in support of that, thank you for your presence today as well. We'll move to the next item on our agenda. This is item A5, and uh, I'll open the public hearing on this item, and Ms. Dawkins, you'll recognize. A5, this request is from Orange County Utilities to establish the Wakiwa Springs Septic to Sewer Retrofit Program Phase 5 MSBU for the construction of a central gravity sewer system to include Bent Oak Phase 1, Bent Oak Phase 2, Bent Oak Phase 3, Bent Oak Phase 4, Bent Oak Phase 5, Bentley Woods, Carroll Woods, Carroll Woods Phase 2, Sweet Air of Wikiwa, Silver Rose, Silver Rose Phase 2, and Wikiwa Ridge Subdivisions. 423 ballots were mailed to property owners to determine majority opinion. Of the ballots returned, approximately 93% were in favor of the establishment of the MSBU. The wastewater system improvement fees will be a period for a period of 10 years at a 4.7 interest rate. The estimate total cost per property owner for the project would be $7,500 for an annual assessment of approximately $957.18 for operational expenses and administrative fees. The, these subdivision areas are located in District 2. This establishing MSBU for wastewater system improvements will be effective November 1st, 2023, if approved today. All right, thank you, Ms. Dawkins. Um, another administrative item. Are there any members of the public present who wish to be heard on this item? I have one speaker card, Mayor. It's Robert Sampson, if you wish to address the board. Uh, Mr. Sampson, he is probably consistent with, with his previous comments. Do you want to follow up or just take the previous comments? Uh, as I understand, the county engineers have merged. Okay, if, if you're going to speak, we'll have to have you come to the mic. Sorry. As I understand, the county engineers have merged phase four and phase five to, for economic reasons, which is a, a, a good thing. Um, my subdivision is actually in phase five, the largest of the group, and uh, we're looking forward to that project. Uh, uh, 
it, it, we will probably uh, be starting in 2024. And again, thank you for the commissioners. Th these are good solutions for our county. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sampson, once again. Uh, any other speakers? No other speakers, Mayor. All right. Then we'll close the public hearing at this time. We'll go to the district. Commissioner, Commissioner Moore, would you like to offer a motion? Yes, but i got to add one more thing. I want to thank uh, Orange County Utilities, uh, FDP, St. John Water Management, and, of course, all of you because, you know, this took – a lot of funding partners and the citizens who are also contributing. And so it's been three or four years, but here we are. So with that, I'd like to move the recommended action. Second, Second Scott. <laughs> okay. Um, I heard Commissioner Uribe, I believe, first, so we're going to give her the second on the motion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Uh, motion passes, and it is unanimous. Uh, we're going to move to... The next item, which is A6, A6, and we'll open the public hearing on this item. And Ms. Dawkins, uh, you're recognized. A6. This request is from a developer to amend the West Ridge Park area MSBU for street lighting. The amendment will add 140 lots to include West Ridge Park Phase 2. This will allow all of the 277 parcels to be assessed for street lighting. The street lighting assessment will be $159 for operational expenses and administrative fees. This subdivision area is located in District 2. This amending MSBU for street lighting will be effective November 1st, 2023, if approved today. All right. Thank you, Ms. Dawkins. Uh, another administrative item. Are there members of the public present who wish to be heard on this item? There are no speakers for this item, Mayor. All right, we'll close the public hearing at this time. And Commissioner Moore, would you like to offer a motion? Yes. Move the recommended action. Second, you reading. All right. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. A motion passes, and it is unanimous. And uh, it's my understanding on the next item, B7, that item has been canceled for today. Is that correct? That is correct, Mayor. All right. So no action on that item. And uh, I think that's it for you today, yeah, Ms. Dawkins. We'll see you at the next board meeting. Okay. Thank uh, you. So we're going to the next item that was uh, on the agenda was C8. And that item, I understand, has been withdrawn. Is that correct, uh, Mr. Weiss? Okay, that, that item is withdrawn. So we will move forward on our agenda now uh, to items uh, D9, 10, and D11. Uh, we're going to open uh, all three together. Uh, and with that, uh, I'm going to ask Mr. Tim Hall from our Environmental Programs uh, Office to come forward to frame that item. And Mr. Hall, you're recognized. Good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. Today I'm presenting three um, shoreline alteration dredge and fill permit applications. Um, just want to check with uh, County Attorney. Mayor, I think we need to open all three of these together. Would you like to do that before I start? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's what we okay. said. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. So uh, the application numbers are SADF 22030309, SADF 22030110, and SADF 2203011. The applicants are all neighbors. That's uh, Matthew and Annika Umbers, Andrew Burr and Marlena Fox, and James and Carol Hansen. Here is a location map. The subject properties are located at 1000, 1008, and 1016 Hal Branch Road in Winter Park, Florida. You can see them identified in red there on the map. Here is an aerial photo of the properties. You can see them outlined in yellow, and you can also see the signature of the canal that they're interested in modifying. And here are some photos of existing conditions of that canal. Um, the photo on the left is taken from uh, 1000 Hal Branch Road looking east, and the photo on the right was taken from 1016 Hal Branch Road looking west along the canal. Here is the site plan. The applicants are requesting to dredge a 0.16 acre area, which is outlined in red on the exhibit for you, within this man-made canal, which is adjacent to their properties, to provide better accessibility to Howe Creek and further upstream to Lake Maitland. The accumulated muck and silt, which is approximately 900 cubic yards estimated, will be removed through hydraulic dredging down to the canal's natural sandy bottom. 
Prior to beginning the actual dredging, there, there is some dead tree limbs and other debris that will be removed from the bottom of the canal, and that will be hauled away before they get started. Here's a cross-section of the plan. The depth of the muck and silt ranges from two to three feet within the canal. The natural sand bottom and the bank of the canal will not be disturbed during the dredging activities. Here's a site plan which depicts some of the means and methods for the project. So they'll be using a hydraulic uh, dredge pump, which is a, a, a suction type of dredge pump. It'll be located on a small pontoon barge in the canal. The muck and organic sediment will be pumped through a four inch tube into a larger geotech tube that'll be located on the shoreline where that blue oval is. That's located on the 1000 Howe Branch Creek Road property currently vacant and owned by the Umbers. The geotech tube is approximately 22 feet long and it'll be staged within a circular containment pit that they're going to excavate, which will be 30 feet long by three feet deep. The geotech tube will retain the dredge sediments while allowing the water to be released in the cont containment pit. Uh, imagine, if you will, a giant sock that all of the dredge material will be pumped into and then the water will run out of that sock. <laughs> The applicants expect the pump to run approximately eight hours a day and to last up to three weeks. Once the geotech tube is full of the dredge material, it'll be allowed to dry in place for several days and then hauled away to an appropriate landfill. For sediment and erosion controls, the soil removed from the pit during construction will be placed around the pit to act as a berm. And then some additional measures to be utilized include staked hay, hay bales and double silt fencing around the pit, and then they'll also put double silt fencing along the canal as well as a floating turbidity barrier. So the applicants have submitted a water quality monitoring plan, which is very important to make sure that there's no turbid water, turbid discharge that escapes to Howe Creek or Lake Maitland. And so I'll step through that plan now. They'll be collecting surface water samples and data once at least 30 days prior to conducting the dredge operation. Then again, once a week, every week during dredging, and at least twice during the 60 days following completion of the project. During the dredging activities, the samples will be taken within the work area, also just outside the work area, and then further downstream of the work area. Those field activities will be conducted in accordance with FDEP standard operating procedures. The samples will be analyzed for some key parameters by a NELAC certified lab. And then lastly, the reports will be submitted to EPD following the initial pre-dredging pre sampling event, weekly during the dredging, and then twice after the dredging is completed. So some considerations for you. The project was reviewed in accordance with Chapter 15, Article 6, and the review criteria and conditions of issuance therein. As I stated, no alteration to the natural canal bottom or the banks are proposed. They will uh, implement this water quality monitoring plan that I described. And notification of this public hearing was sent to the property owners within 500 feet of the project, and no objections were received. Our finding is pursuant to Orange County Code, Chapter 15, Article 6. EPD staff has evaluated the proposed SADF permit applications and required documents and made a finding that the requests are consistent with Section 15.218. And so I have the three actions requested on screen for you. The first is acceptance of the findings and recommendation of the EPD staff and approval of shoreline alteration dredge and fill permit SADF 2203009 for Matthew and Annika Umbers, subject to the conditions in the staff report. These are all in District 5. Secondly, acceptance of the findings and recommendation of the Environmental Protection Division staff and appro approval of shoreline alteration dredge and fill permit SADF 2203010 for Andrew Burr and Marlena Fox, subject to the conditions in the staff report. And lastly, acceptance of the findings and recommendation of EPD staff and approval of shoreline alteration dredge and fill permit SADF 2203011 for James and Carol Hansen, subject to the conditions listed in the staff report. That concludes my presentation, Mayor, and thank you very much. All right, thank you, Mr. Hall. Uh, is the applicant present on this item? And if so, would you like to come forward and um, make any comments? Okay. Okay. 
applicant is indicating that he's available for any questions or comments later. He's waiving on any form of comments at this time. Uh, do we have any members of the public present who wish to be heard at this time? I have no speakers for these items, Mayor. All right, then uh, we'll close the public hearing at this time and we'll mm -hmm. go to the District Commissioner. Commissioner Bonilla, would you like to offer a motion? So moved. Second, Gomez. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Uh, the motion passes and it is unanimous. And so now we'll move to item D12. And on item D12, uh, we'll open a public hearing on this item. And Mr. Hall, we'll look to you to frame this item as well. All right. Thank you, Mayor. This is another shoreline alteration dredge and fill permit application, number SADF 2303009. This one is for applicant Weller Family Trust. Here is the uh, location map of the subject site in red on Lake Burkett. The address is 4605 North Landmark Drive in Orlando. Here is an aerial photo of the subject property outlined in yellow. And here are existing conditions. This is a request to replace a wooden uh, seawall that is in poor condition. You can see that there in the photos. And here is an aerial photo showing the location of the existing seawall that we just looked at. It's shown in, as the red line in this exhibit and extends along the northern 250 feet of their shoreline. The remaining 190 feet of shoreline to the south is heavily vegetated and there's no current wall or proposed wall in that area. EPD staff were unable to find a permit for the existing wall, but we have determined that the structure was constructed sometime prior to 2003 and prior to the applicant's purchase of the property in 2020. And so due to the fact the existing wall was constructed by a previous owner many years ago, no enforcement action is being taken. Here is the site plan. The applicant's proposing to construct 250 feet of a, a vinyl wall to replace the wooden one and they'll do that directly in front of the existing wall. There is an adjacent seawall to the north. However, that wall is actually also in disrepair. So the applicants will install a 10-foot return at the northern end of their replacement wall, and they'll also be installing a 10-foot return at the southern end of the new wall. The applicant will install riprap and native plantings waterward of the re replacement wall. Uh, with the exception of those three areas that you see the little gaps in between the golden circles, that's the riprap, and those little gaps there are actually locations of mature cypress trees, and so they won't be installing riprap there so as not to damage the cypress tree roots. Here is a cross-section of the site plan. And the considerations on this one project was reviewed in accordance with Chapter 15, Article 6, and the review criteria and conditions of issuance therein. The, no, the public hearing was uh, notified to property owners within 500 feet of the project site, and no objections were received. The finding is pursuant to Orange County Code, Chapter 15, Article 6. The EPD staff has evaluated the proposed SADF permit application and required documents, and has made a finding that the request is consistent with Section 15 to 18. And our action requested is acceptance of the findings and recommendation of the EPD staff and approval of shoreline alteration dredge and fill permit SADF 2303009 for the Weller Family Trust, subject to the conditions listed in the staff report. This is in District 5, and that concludes my presentation. All right. Is the applicant or a representative of the applicant present? And if so, would you like to come forward and offer any comments? She's indicating no. She's going to wave on coming forward at this time. So I will move to any public comment. Do we have members of the public present who wish to be heard on this item? There are no speakers for this item, Mayor. All right. Then we'll close the public hearing and we'll go to the district commissioner. Commissioner Bonilla, would you like to offer a motion? So moved. Second, Gomez. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. The motion passes and it is unanimous. And with that, then we'll move to the next item on our agenda, which is item D13. And we'll open the public hearing on this item. And Mr. Hall, you're recognized to frame this item as well. All right. Thank you, Mayor. Last uh, shoreline alteration judge and fill permit for today. This one is number SADF 2302001. The applicant is Norma Sidnor, and 
she is requesting to install a replacement vinyl seawall on the shoreline of a canal on Lake Conway. Here is the location map. The property is shown in red. The address is 2820 Montmartre Drive in Belle Isle, Florida. Here is an aerial photo with the property outlined in yellow for you. You can see the canal there in the rear of the property. And here's a photo of existing conditions looking to the south. You can see there's an existing concrete wall there. Uh, this one also, staff was unable to find a permit for the wall, but we did determine the structure was construct uh, constructed sometime prior to 1999. And since the wall has been in place for uh, so long, no enforcement action has been taken. Here's another photo looking the opposite direction towards the north. Uh, that boat dock you see is in disrepair but it'll be removed during construction of the replacement seawall. Here is the site plan. The applicant is proposing to construct approximately 79 feet of vinyl seawall directly in front of the existing wall. The wall that's there now meanders along the shoreline and it actually doesn't currently tie into existing seawalls on the adjacent properties to the north and south. But the new wall will be, um, it will tie into the existing seawall to the north uh, and it will have an eight-foot return on the southern end. Here is a cross-section of the proposed replacement wall. And then some considerations for you. This project was reviewed in accordance with Chapter 33, Article 2, and the review criteria and conditions of issuance therein. Riprap and native aquatic plantings are not being requested on this wall uh, since it is located on a canal, and that could potentially create a navigational concern. Notification of the public hearing was sent to property owners within 500 feet of the site and no objections were received. Our finding is pursuant to Orange County Code, Chapter 33, Article 2. EPD staff has evaluated the proposed SADF permit application and required documents and has made a finding that the request is consistent with Section 3337. Our action requested acceptance of the findings and recommendation of the EPD staff and approval of shoreline alteration dredge and fill permit SADF 2302001 for Norma Sidnor, subject to the conditions listed in the staff report. This is in District 3, and that wraps up my presentation. All right, thank you, sir. Is the applicant on this item present? Uh, okay, she's waving again as well. She's, uh, all right, so we'll move to the public comment. Uh, do we have any members of the public present who wish to be heard on this item? No speakers for this item, Mayor. All right, we'll close on the public hearing and we'll go to the district commissioner. Commissioner Uribe, would you like to offer a motion? Yeah, motion for approval. Second, Gomez. All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The motion passes and it is unanimous. And we'll move to the next item on our agenda. And this is item E14. <laughs> And we'll open the public hearing on this item and we'll call on our public works director, Mr. Joe Conkle, to frame this item. And you're recognized. Thank you, Mayor. Public hearing E14 is the Silver Leaf Plan Development Regulating Plan, Silver Leaf South Track A Subdivision, Preliminary Subdivision Plan. The subject site is located north of Schofield Road and west of Avalon Road in the Horizon West Town Center Village. The request is to subdivide 53.6 acres generally located north of Schofield Road and west of Avalon Road to construct 293 single-family residential dwelling units. The uh, slides are not up. Okay, there's the uh, regulating plan. Um, all right, the property is designated uh, corporate campus mixed use on the uh, Zoning map on the Horizon West Land Use map within the Town Center Village and is zoned PD as the Silver Leaf Regulating Plan. There we go. There's the PD. And I'll uh, note uh, Schofield to the south, um, uh, Avalon Road to the east. Um, right. The aerial shows the surrounding areas uh, in the process of development for the mixed single family, multifamily, and commercial entitlements. And then here is the preliminary subdivision plan. The recommended action is to make a finding of consistency with the comprehensive plan and approve the Silver Leaf PD RP, Silver Leaf South Tract A subdivision PSP, subject to the conditions listed under the DRC recommendation in the staff report. 
The mayor and commissioners have been briefed on this request. This case is in District 1, and staff is available for questions. Thank you, Mayor. All right. If the applicant or representative is present and would like to come forward, they're Hey, good afternoon. Forward. Welcome. Scott Gentry, 1700 North Orange Avenue uh, in Orlando, uh, KCG Civil Engineering. I want to thank staff for getting us this far, and we're here to answer any questions you guys might have. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Gentry. I'll stand by for a moment. Are there any members of the public present who wish to be heard on this item? There are no speakers for this item, Mayor. All right. Then we'll close the public hearing on this item. We'll go to the District Wilson, uh, District Commissioner, <laughs> Commissioner Wilson, for a potential motion. Thank you. So this is not anything to do with you. I just want to bring you something to my colleagues really quickly. If you could take the go back to the aerial really quickly. Oh, sure thing. Because we're getting ready this afternoon to hear from Mr. Marshall about our tree ordinance. We are seeing this PSP. Okay, so this is the preliminary subdivision plan. I want you to take a look at that lot. So um, just kind of put it in your brain and we'll talk about it later. Um, with that, uh, I will recommend the uh, requested action. Second, Scott. All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Uh, the motion passes and it is unanimous. All thank right, you. thank you, Mr. Gentry. Uh, we're going to move to the next item on our agenda uh, for this afternoon. This is item E15. Uh, we'll open the public hearing on this item, and Mr. Conkle, we're asking you to frame this item. Thank you, Mayor. Public hearing E15 is the Oaks at Lake Standish preliminary subdivision plan. The subject site is located south of West Lester Road and east of Plymouth Sorrento Road in District 2. The request is to subdivide 24.7 acres to construct 80 single-family residential dwelling units. The property is designated low-density residential on the future land use map and is zoned R1 single-family dwelling district. The aerial shows the surrounding area developed with single-family residential development. And here is the preliminary subdivision plan showing the proposed lots and retention on the south. The recommended action is to make a finding of consistency with the comprehensive plan and approve the Oaks at Lake Standish PSP subject to the conditions listed under the DRC recommendation in the staff report. The mayor and commissioners have been briefed on this request. This case is in District 2 and staff is available for questions. Thank you, Mayor. All right. Thank you. Uh, is the applicant or representative on this item present? If so, would you like to come forward and offer any comments? Okay. They're indicating they're waving, but they're here. Uh, we'll then move to the public comment portion. Are there members of the public present who wish to be heard on this item? There are no speakers on this item, Mayor. All right. Then we'll close the public hearing. We'll go to the district commissioner, Commissioner Moore. Would you like to offer a motion? Yes, I just want to preface. Can, um, can you put the map back up there? <laughs> okay. I just wanted to point um, the other one. There we go. I just want to point this out to my colleagues because you're in the Wakiva study area. You see the large a section of the 35 percent that is natural lands. There's a 80-foot uh, drop off there, and they were able to make trails around it. And that's mm -hmm. Lake Standish at the bottom. And a year ago, we approved. Um, I think they're coming back for the PSP, but at least the land use issue just to, would be to the southwest of this. We have 500 units, uh, affordable housing. Two of that is senior. So, 80-foot drop off only in Apopka. Could you have those kinds of elevations? Yeah. And so um, I, loved, I loved this area when it, he first came in. And so 50-foot small lots so that they could preserve as much of this land contiguous and really be a good steward of the environment. So I wanted to point out this is when it gets done well. Yeah. So with that, I'd be, pro I'd be happy to make the motion to Second, approve. you repeat. All right. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion passes, and it is unanimous. All right. Thank you. We'll move forward then to the next item. Uh, we're up to item F16. F16. We'll open the public hearing on this item. And Mr. Conkle, you'll recognize. Thank you, Mayor. Public hearing F16 is the Pet Alliance of Greater Orlando Planned Development. The subject site is located on South John Young Parkway, south of the I-4 interchange, and north of Holden Avenue. The current PD is approved for a veterinary service services facility, which was approved with the condition that required outdoor areas used by the animals to be located on the southern portion of the property. The request is to amend that condition to allow the area to be located toward the middle of the property due to site constraints. 
The request also includes one waiver from code to reduce the required parking ratio. The property is designated commercial on the future land use map and is zoned PD. The aerial shows the surrounding areas developed with commercial, institutional, and multifamily. And here is the PD land use plan. The recommended action is to make a finding of consistency with the comprehensive plan and approve the PET Alliance of Greater Orlando Plan Development Land Use Plan subject to the conditions listed under the DRC recommendation in the staff report. The mayor and commissioners have been briefed on this request. This case is in District 6 and staff is available for questions. Thank you, Mayor. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Conkle. Is the applicant or representative on this item present? If so, okay. He's is indicating that he's going to waive on any formal comments. Uh, are there members of the public present who wish to be heard on this item? There's no speakers for this item, Mayor. All right, then we'll close the public hearing at this time, and we'll go to the District Commissioner. Commissioner Scott, would you like to offer a motion? Very happy to offer a motion of yes. Second, Gomez. Okay, Commissioner Gomez Cordero is the seconder on the motion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Uh, the motion passes and it is unanimous. All right, uh, then we're going to move forward to the next item on our agenda. And this is item F, uh, correct, yes, F17. Uh, we'll open a public hearing on this item as well. And Mr. Conkle, you're recognized. Thank you, Mayor. Public hearing F17 is the Hamlin Southwest Plan Development, Hamlin Southwest Medical Office's Master Development Plan. The subject property is located north of Porter Road and west of State Road 429 in the Horizon West Town Center Village. The request is to amend the development plan to add buildings M, N, and O within Lot 2, add self-storage as a permitted use and associated design standards to the plan, and to construct Building O, which is the self-storage facility. The property is designated corporate campus mixed use on the Horizon West land use map within the town center village and is zoned PD. The aerial shows the surrounding area in the process of development with a mixed single family, multifamily and commercial entitlements in the immediate area. Here is the development plan. The self storage facility is the purple building in the top left corner. The next slide shows the architectural elevations, which comply with the code required design elements by providing appropriate building modulation in wall planes and roof lines, providing required transparency, and the units are only accessed from the internal driveway. The recommended action is to make a finding of consistency with the comprehensive plan and approve the Hamlin Southwest Medical Office's Master Development Plan subject to the conditions listed under the DRC recommendation and staff report. The mayor and commissioners have been briefed on this request. This case is in District 1 and staff is available for questions. Thank you, Mayor. All right, thank you. Uh, is the applicant or representative present? Okay. They are coming forward. Mr. Mayor, commissioners, <clears throat> good afternoon. My name is Jim Willard. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm here on behalf of the applicant. Um, Mr. Mayor, we have a staff recommendation of approval, and I don't believe there's any speaker cards, so I'm going to shut up and uh, just be available to answer any questions. All right, Mr. Willett, stand by for a moment. Do we have any members of the public present who wish to be heard on this item? I have no speakers, Mayor. All right, then we'll close the public hearing. We'll go to the district uh, commissioner. Commissioner Wilson, would you like to offer a motion? I will, but first I do want to thank you for spending some time and talking to me about this. I think there was some sensitivity to this um, type of use in a different location in a much more uh, neighborhood residential setting. This is obviously corporate office uh, setting. So uh, with that, I make a motion for a second, vote. Scott. All right. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Uh, the motion passes Thank and you. it is unanimous. All right. Thank you, Mr. Willett. We'll move to the next item on our agenda for this afternoon. This is item uh, G18. We'll open the public hearing on this item. We'll call on our Public Works Director once again, Mr. Joe Conkle, to frame the item. Thank you, Mayor. Public hearing G18 is the Nadine Tanmore 2 plan development. The subject site is located north of World Center Drive and east of International Drive. The request is a land use plan amendment 
to rezone 41.2 acres from A2 Farmland Rural District to PD Plan Development District and to add the property into the existing PD as parcel 5. The request is also, convert, also to convert 80,473 square feet of commercial uses to 415 <coughs> multifamily residential dwelling units and assign those units to PD parcel 5. There are also two waivers for a reduced parking ratio and a reduced PD perimeter setback to the north. If approved, the overall entitlement program for the PD will be 100,000 square feet of commercial uses, 481 hotel rooms, 897 timeshare units, and 1,618 convention hotel rooms on parcels 1, 2, 3, and 19,527 square feet of commercial uses, 300 hotel rooms, and 756 multifamily units on PD parcels 4 and 5. The property is designated Activity Center Mixed Use and Activity Center Residential. The area to be added to the existing PD is currently zoned A2 and shown with uh, the red boundary. The aerial show and is zoned PD. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this aerial shows the surrounding area developed with multifamily and tourist commercial uses to the um, west. Here is the PD land use plan with the uh, additional properties on the far right hand of the upper box. The recommended action is to make a finding of consistency with the comprehensive plan and approve the Nadine Tanmore to plan development subject to the conditions listed under the, the Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation in the staff report. The mayor and commissioners have been briefed on this request. This case is in District 1 and staff is available for questions. Thank you, Mayor. All right, thank you, Mr. Conco. Is the applicant or representative uh, on this item present? All right, he's coming forward. Uh, good evening, commissioners. Uh, Nathan Milch with Kimley Horn and Associates, 189 South Orange Avenue. Um, here rep representing the applicant. Um, we uh, re respectfully request your approval on this. We've been working with staff, and um, as you can see on, on parcel four there, we are uh, just adding it to the land use plan in order to accommodate some additional parking for the multifamily as well as some stormwater retention, and we're not proposing any wetland impacts. Uh, so thank you. All right. Thank you for your presence. Stand by. Are there members of the public present who wish to be heard on this item? There are no speakers, Mayor. All right. Then we'll close the public hearing. We'll go to the district commissioner for a potential motion. Uh, thank you. Thank you to the sensitivity of the wetland issue. And I know it's been something we've all really cared about and talked about today, and we'll continue to. So with that, um, I'll make a motion for the recommended action. Second, second. Uribe. All right. Uh, commissioner Uribe is a seconder on the motion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Uh, the motion passes, and it is unanimous. All right, thank you for your presence. We're going to move to the next item at this time, uh, H-19, and we'll open the public hearing on this item, and we'll call on the Public Works Director, Mr. Conkle, once again to frame this item. Thank you, Mayor. Public hearing H-19 is an appeal of the DRC decision regarding a lot split in the name of Kendall Keith and Allison Yurko. The subject property is located, excuse me, the subject property is 9.89 net developable acres in size and is generally located north of McKinnon Road and west of Windermere Road in the West Windermere Rural Settlement. The applicant has requested to split the subject property into seven lots, which exceeds the maximum of three lots allowed by the county lot split policy. At the March 22, 2023 DRC meeting, the zoning manager's determination to deny the conventional lot split request was upheld. The property is designated on the future land use map as Rural Settlement 1-1 and is zoned RCE, Country Estates District. The aerial shows the surrounding areas developed with single-family detached dwelling units. Here is a proposed lots. Here is an exhibit showing the proposed lot split. Each of the proposed lots do meet the lot size standard for the RCE district. The recommended action is to uphold the DRC decision of March 22, 2023 and deny the lot split request. 
The mayor and commissioners have been briefed on this request. This case is in District 1 and staff is available for questions. Thank you, Mayor. All right, and with that, uh, I see Ms. Yorko here today, so she, I'm presuming you're representing the applicant on this item? Yes, I am, and right. Mr. Keith's here assisting. Thank you. He's going to be handing out a, um, some, a package, a petition in support. I'm Allison Yurko with Allison Yurko PA. I have the pleasure of representing Lowell and Jacqueline Teal, who have lived on this property since 1952 or 62? 62. 62. Their daughter, Martha, is next to them, her husband, John P.K., and Kendall Keith, who you all know. Um, we have a very unusual situation here today. Uh, we are asking for less density than would otherwise be approvable if a developer were to come in and do a PSP and do a cluster plan. And the reason why is the Teals are both in their 90s and would love to stay in their home there, which is on the corner, and have the opportunity to sell off um, a lot or two as they age in place. We all know the ever escalating costs of aging in place. Um, and um, with that, I am going to turn it over to Kendall. He's going to give some detail on the process um, that we've been through so far. Thanks. Thanks, Allison. Again, my name is Kendall Keith, Oak Hill Planning Studio, uh, 3674 Lower Park Road, Orlando, and I'm here representing Jacqueline and Lowell Teal, the owners of this property. Um, it's, it's a 12-acre piece of property. There is two acres, approximately, that are in a wetland associated what's called, uh, with what's called uh, Walker Pond on the north side of their property there. And uh, we have been through the conservation area determination process with the county and um, have gone on record of that uh, wetland being recorded. Um, like Allison stated, they've lived here over 60 years. Uh, this is their house. They li uh, uh, live there, raise their kids there, and... Um, they operated an orange grove on the property as well. About 10 years ago, they were hit, just like every other uh, orange grove out in this area, were hit with greening. Um, so in a very short time frame, they, the, the greening um, decimated that grove. And then they did have a five-year uh, grace period uh, with their agricultural exemption, which has since expired and really wasn't practical for them at their age and living on the property to introduce a new crop. So faced with the loss of income and the additional cost of losing their ag exemption, they were compelled to look at doing something different with this property. And um, over the past few years, they have been approached uh, several times by developers and builders in the area who... Um, have offered to buy their property for development. And it's not uh, too hard, if we can go to the next slide, um, to anticipate what that, oh, sorry, what that development would look like. So uh, what you see there outlined in red are um, cluster plans or PDs that have lot sizes that range from half an acre to an acre in size. Immediately west of them is Windermere Grand, um, to the northwest is an approved but not yet built uh, subdivision called Lake Roberts Reserve. And to the northeast is uh, the reserve at Belmere, all with um, lots that net out to one unit per 10 acres, um, consistent with the rural settlement uh, requirements. And so we had looked at that initially with them, looked at how this property could be uh, Subdivided, going through a cluster plan approval, a preliminary subdivision plan, uh, divided up into 10 lots uh, that would meet all the requirements of the rural settlement. Um, but it didn't really work that well for them, uh, not only just the time and cost of going through that, but just that it didn't really work with them uh, staying on the property. And so we looked at as an alternative what you see there before you, dividing the property into seven lots. Um, them continuing to live on the one lot, and then being able to sell off the other lots individually to fund their continual living on that property for as long as they are uh, willing and able to do so. Um, 
so that uh, we did meet with Orange County back in the fall and they uh, said we should look at doing it as a lot split with the understanding and full understanding that it would be denied by staff um, that we could appeal that to the Board of County Commissioners so we under we understood that um, but it still was a better fit for them than selling off the property and allowing it to be developed and they are very much concerned with their community and what you see in there with the blue numbers are all the other non-platted lots that were historically the the character of this rural settlement they range in size from less than half an acre to over two acres um, what they're proposing on their property would all be over an acre each new lot um, it would not require as with a um, trying to maximize the development potential of the property building a road uh, all the additional grading the retention and the additional impervious surface that would be required to do that um, so you know we feel like this is less impactful and more fitting with the community it's consistent and compliant with all the lot size requirements of the existing zoning um, and uh, otherwise meets your code except that it exceeds the limit of three uh, total new lots that could be approved in a lot split with that I'm going to return it back to Allison thank you Kendall and what I handed out was the petition from the neighbors that are in favor of this um, again it is not a cookie cutter kind of neighborhood it is a rural settlement it's the kind of place where you don't want to have to add a road if you don't have to um, so we think it fits in and is cons more, more compatible um, than it would be if we did the PSP cluster um, this is the front yard of the teals looking across the street you can see the wall next to them that's the cluster neighborhood that is next to them and again it's a disconnected disjointed sort of cluster it's not people they know um, that they, they want to be part of their neighborhood um, with people in the rural settlement which um, you can see there's a house across the street of one of the people in favor um, this is what the land looks like it's a burned out orange grove on, on most of it except for their home um, again Kendall went over this but just to review no waivers are needed it meets or exceeds the one acre minimum requirement less wetland uh, no no wetland impacts and less impact to the environment that would that would occur if you had a cluster plan um, no paved infrastructure um, you know less than would be allowed with the cluster plan probably 10 would be allowed with the cluster plan um, and it's a very unique case there there's significant frontage on McKinnon Road which is part of how they're able to do this I don't think there's any parcel this large that has this kind of frontage which we think is important to point out because we think it has an extremely limited precedent we understand this is a very big ask and if there weren't such compelling circumstances we wouldn't be asking and if we thought it was going to create a precedent we wouldn't be asking but again huge parcel significant frontage very compelling personal situation for the teals you heard their story about wanting to age in place and then the greening shutting down their their orange grove this is what the uh, orange grove looked like and you can see their house in the corner um, and that's pretty much the gist of it we'd like to reserve the rest of our time for rebuttal thank you okay um are there members of the public present who wish to be heard on this item? Yes, Mayor, I have two speaker cards, uh, Martha Fiquet and John Fiquet. You're okay. Um, please state your name and address for the record, please. You'll have two minutes. John Fiquet, uh, my father-in-law, mother-in-law. Um, again, I think Kendall brought it up again with that yeah we're asking for a big ask we, we realize that and what we're we feel like with this uh, plan it is a win-win for everybody I think it wins for the environmental issue it wins for the neighbors they are all in uh, agreeable to it and it keeps them from having to either sell their whole piece 
and get it developed and move to another place at 90 years old, uh, I think that's, that's, that's a big ask. But, again, we know we're asking for something that is not normal, but I think this is, a, this is an abnormal piece. It is, it is totally different than what I think most of the time they're run up on with three uh, lot splits like this. So, thank you for your time. Appreciate it. All right, thank you, Mr. Fouquet. Uh, if no rebuttal comments by the applicant or no other members of the public that wishes to There are to no other speaker cards, Mayor. Then we'll close the public hearing. Um, before I go to the com district commissioner, uh, can someone maybe put the map up and kind of explain how they will access the seven lots? I, I see McKinnon Road, that one's kind of obvious, but some of the other lots, how would they access it? Absolutely, Mayor. Uh, so they're, uh, they're creating flag lots for the uh, standard 20-foot wide um, required access to a, a county road rights-of-way frontage, and you can see where 2 and 5 and 6 have the flag lots that come down that provide their access to those lots that are on the rear part of the proposed um, lot split and then lot three and seven have frontage along along McKinnon Road uh, if if this were to move forward uh, we had some discussions internally and, and would recommend that uh, joint access be provided between lots two and three and then uh, another joint access be provided between lots four five six and seven which would require which would require a cross access easement um, <coughs> Generally, those um, cross-access easements would have to be uh, 40 by 40 feet minimum in nature to allow um, uh, all four lots, four, five, six, and seven, to have access off of that joint driveway, and then lots two and two and three would have you know access off of a joint driveway as well, and then cross-access for them to get back to their properties. Um, that would be a, a, a suggestion or a request from staff if it were to move forward. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go to the district commissioner, but uh, Commissioner Wilson, uh, Commissioner Bonilla has uh, indicated a desire to speak, uh, have questions. So if you want to hear from her, uh, Commissioner Bonilla, you recognize? Yeah, I would highly suggest against the joint driveway because I have that in my district and neighbors don't get along. Um, one of them bullies the other and just they make life horrible for each other yeah. so it's best for them to have their yeah. own individual access okay. where they don't have to depend on each other um, so like I would highly suggest against joining it Commissioner Gomez Cadero so um, Commissioner Bonilla you saying that is is this individual um, entrance are they, uh, is that explained there, that individual? Like every lot has yeah. their own Yeah, entrance? so right now on this image showing that each lot has their own access. Exactly. What was suggested by staff was joining yeah, that access with so that shared, that. like a shared property, right? Mm -hmm. well, it, the, the underlying ownership would still belong to, um, for the uh, ones to the east or the right side of the uh, exhibit. Um, they would be, uh, the underlying ownership would be lots five and six. Um, uh, again, back a, a fair amount of distance, I would say at least 40 feet, to provide for uh, connectivity for that single driveway access. Um, and then um, they would use use a single driveway for those. But the ownership would belong to five and six. And that's why you would need the cross-access easement to allow lots four and seven to use, utilize the same driveway. Yeah, so they would have to work together on that road. And that's where things fall apart. People aren't always good at working together. So I would highly suggest against that. But um, given the, yeah, I, the, um, the, I guess the challenges with some access because of the, as I see the lots uh, kind of to the north, you will have some challenges uh, accessing those without having uh, this dual lot access is that correct well the challenge you have there mayor is that particularly lots five and six and you know you would have to have your um, 
15 foot ish driveway uh, located within a, a 20 foot access point. So you're going to have two driveways right pretty much on top of each other. You know, there, there'll be, there will be uh, some separation between the two, but they'll be very close to one another. Um, and that, that uh, can create some difficulties for, for coming in off of um, McKinnon Road, uh, just because they're so close to one another. Um, you know, when you're internal to a subdivision, that's one of the advantages of the, you know, the internal access is that you pull off of the main road, you go into subdivision, and then you can sort of slow down and stop and find where you're looking for uh, if you're looking for a particular driveway and you're not that familiar with it. Um, on this road, this is uh, still a local road, but it would certainly have a little bit more traffic than, you know, something that would be internal. So the, the separation there is just to allow for, uh, or the, the combined access is just more to allow for... Um, um, uh, less confusion, if you will, coming off of them, off of McKinnon Road. All right. Um, did that answer your question, uh, Co Commissioner Gomez? Uh, we'll go to Commissioner Uribe. If I may, um, Joe, actually yes. this is for you. So DRC denied this, correct? Correct. Why? Well, the um, challenge is the uh, looking at how the uh, item was processed and uh, keeping in mind the uh, uh, DRC uh, following of county code and policy and procedures was if there's very limited issues associated with a lot split more than three, you know, DRC from time to time will approve those lot splits. And, and typically we've gone like from three to four to five and five being, you know, on the higher end. Uh, and I think the opinion of the DRC was that um, this is, this is uh, more uh, of a um, issue beyond what the DRC should be making recommendation for. And, and that recommendation being finalized at the DRC. When we start getting into, again, seven is on the, you know, the higher end or the lower end, if you will, of a, of a formal subdivision. But um, we thought that, you know, this is just a little bit more than what we should be approving at DRC. And if the uh, applicant is so inclined, they can certainly bring it to the board and then the board could have the final say for, for recommendation or denial. Uh, did you guys recommend that they appeal to us? Uh, we identified that when we denied their uh, application that they have the right to appeal. Um, but the DRC did not recommend appeal. I don't think I recommended to make an appeal to the board. No, the um, I'm trying to recall if someone else may have said something of that nature. If Nick is saying no, but um, I know I would not have said that. Uh, you're, uh, I may have said that if you're, if, if you're so interested, your next step is to appeal to the board. But I would not have said I recommend you appeal to the board. Can, okay. if, if, if that distinction is, is clear, Commissioner. Okay. Can I interject in that? No. Okay. <laughs> uh, this discussion right now is between the board, but uh, Commissioner Scott. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, Joe or, or Brett or John, um, and you can ballpark it. Um, when was the uh, the policy of, of three lots? Like, when was that created? Or I don't need the exact, but if you can ballpark it, give me uh, a year uh, or the range. Oldest, the oldest DRC subdivision regulations I can recall are from, like, 1982. Okay. And I believe it was, in, it was included in that, D, in that uh, subdivision regulation. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know when it was created beyond that, Commissioner. Uh, Joel or may have a, a better understanding. We, we may be even going back further than the early 1980s into the 70s. So and I'm, I'm going to just assume that um, through Vision 2050, the, the lot splits will be addressed in terms of just updating that. I guess what I'm getting at is, is since this is, is this is significantly old, uh, I would look to have some conversations about that policy, How what, what is the threshold for it comes to us, whether you, you guys have said that you've approved four or five. And so what it sounds to me is just it's it's a level of comfortability with DRC as to why right. it came to us because you right. don't have precedent for this. I think the highest number you've done is five? Uh, I've, been, I've been told they've done six. So, uh, it, But, uh, but um, Commissioner, again, um, you know, there is, there is the, the possibility of, you know, setting precedent where 
someone says, well, you've done six and you've done seven. Why don't you do nine? Why don't you do 11? Um, you know, this is a sizable piece of property. Um, again, it, understanding what is being proposed by the applicant is a, a very nice plan. Uh, I won't say it's a bad plan. Uh, but, you know, there may be other scenarios that come in where, um, you know, we get, you know, minimal uh, frontage, minimal access, a lot of other issues that can create uh, uh, problems associated with um, lot splits that you want to try to avoid. So again, the, 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 uh, what I recall from the DRC was that it was uncomfortable with approving something of seven and allowed it to move forward. Thank you for that. Uh, again, just for me, just I would love to see some, some consistency because, like, you know, anyone can make the argument four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It just, it's, I would just want to see, for me, just, I'd want to see some consistency in what that number is where it comes to us. Right. Um, yeah, thank you. All right. um, one, one other thing, uh, Commissioner, with the, um, you know, the definition of a subdivision, and, and Joel can j jump in this as well, is that there is state statute that says anything over, over um, three lots, two lots is considered a subdivision and, and should be going through the subdivision process. Understood. Orange County has consistently said three is the number for us that you can go through uh, and do a lot split, and then the rest of those need to come forward to a subdivision process. Uh, again, yeah, thank you for that clarification. Okay. I appreciate it. I just... Like, things are changing. People's needs and uses are changing, and we need to be consistent with what those needs and uses are relative to people living longer, income sources. Just there's so many different things. And so for this policy to be as old as it is, given the advent in technology, there's just so many changes that have occurred that this policy needs to be looked at at some point. Um, at some point. That's, that's, that's all I'm saying. I do want to also mention that you do not get the benefits of stormwater right. management under a yeah. lot split. Yeah. So we talk yeah. This is not... Can I, can I, can I talk? You do that, you, you do lose that sense of, you know, overall stormwater management. We're coming to you, Commissioner Wilson, last. So <laughs> you don't have to jump in now. Uh, Commissioner Bonilla. Well, I, yeah, I just, there was so much information going on with this that I just wanted, what I understood about lot splits was that it could be up to three. Mm -hmm. And that, I mean, so let's say if it's in the rural service area, it's one house per 10 acres. Mm -hmm. Um, if they had 30 acres, they could split it, but each property still has to be 10 acres. Um, so, and this could happen in an urban service area or a rural service area, but it still has to stay, the lot has to stay the size within whatever that zoning requirement is. So that's how I understood it. That, that's correct, Commissioner. Just want to make sure it's, mm -hmm. you know, what I understood is still valid. All right, uh, we're going to go to the district commissioner, Commissioner Wilson, for any questions, comments. Yeah, well, I wanted a couple clarifications, and I think it's really important that we kind of rewind and look for, um, I think it's important, and I agree, we need to make sure that we're listening to the needs of the residents, and especially residents that want to stay on their land and, and, and be able to also, you know, have that be something that they can sell and alienate as part of property law, but there's no one in our reg saying they can't. It would just be if they wanted six, that they have to come in as a subdivision. Otherwise, they can lot split, it would just be three. And so, to your point about wanting the consistency, that is why we have code, and that is what the code says, and that's why the DRC denied. So whenever I hear the word precedent thrown around here, I'm like, we are not the Supreme Court, folks. <laughs> we go back to the code, we go back and make sure that our regs are, and then we can talk about, you know, uses later, but my rural settlement folks are very sensitive to the idea of a negotiated lot split. And so the consistency for me is that if, if we know that this is a rural settlement and there are options for these landowners who want to make sure that they're making the highest and best use of their land, they would be able to do that either coming through a subdivision plan or to do a lot split of three. So it's not that they don't have any options. It, the, the option that DRC evaluated was one that DRC didn't recommend. Does that, does that help? Okay. Yeah. So, what's well, I just want to make, well, I just wanted to make sure I was. I didn't want you all to think that I, I'm going to make an motion to actually um, to um, uphold DRC's decision in this, and, and hopefully we'll be able to, to help them out through a different method. Second. All right. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. So, uh, what does that mean? So the, 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 the. DRC denied this application mm -hmm. for this type of lot split. Okay? okay, it does not mean that they can't apply as a subdivision if they okay. want to do six, or because there really are considerations about 
access through people's properties and what those roads look like and stormwater management, which Walker Pond is going through all of that right now. Okay. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> all right. All in favor. There's a motion and a second. Commissioner Uribe, by the way, was the second on the motion. All in favor say aye. Nay. Aye. Opposed, no. No. Okay. We have two no's. Okay, the motion passes uh, five to two. All right. We'll move forward. Uh, next item on the agenda for this afternoon, we're going to move to I-20. We'll open the public hearing on this item and... Well, uh, with this item, uh, Mr. Sorensen, I'm going to ask you to come forward to frame this item. All right, thank you, Mayor. Good afternoon, Commissioners. This next item is a future land use map amendment as well as a rezoning, and this is located in District 2. The request is to change the future land use from low, medium density residential to commercial and change the zoning from R2 to C3 restricted. Uh, the existing use is a warehouse, um, a warehouse uh, which is non-conforming, so they're trying to legitimize the use through this process. Uh, again, we're located in District 2. The, currently, the future land use is low-medium density residential. The proposed future land use is commercial. Zoning is split between C3 and R2, and the proposed zoning is C3 restricted. This is an aerial of the subject property. 82 public hearing notices were sent to an area extending beyond 500 feet from the subject parcel. To date, we have received zero responses. A community meeting was held on March 20th with one resident in attendance with no objections to the request. At the local planning agency hearing, there were no speakers present to speak during public comment. The local planning agency and its staff are recommending that the amendment ordinance and rezoning be approved subject to one restriction. Staff is available for any questions. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sorensen. Is the applicant on this item present? If so, would you like to make any comments? Okay. He's indicating no. Uh, are there members of the public present who wish to be heard on this item? There are no speakers for this item, Mayor. All right. Then we'll close the public hearing. We'll go to the district commissioner. Commissioner Moore, would you like to offer a motion? Yes, I'd like to make a motion to approve. Second, Scott. All right. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Motion passes, and it is unanimous of those members of the board present. Uh, here's Commissioner Gomez Cordero is uh, absent at this time. Uh, we'll move forward to the next item on our agenda, and this is item I-21. I'll open the public hearing on this item. Um, I realize that my notes indicate that this is being requested to be continued, but I believe it was advertised, so we're going to open it up. Mr. Sorensen, I'm going to ask you to frame this item. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, we are asking for a continuance to this item. Uh, the applicant was unable to, to um, attend this hearing, uh, so we are requesting that this item be continued to um, July 11th at 2 p.m. All right. Um, with that, is the applicant on this item present? If so, would you like to come forward and offer any comments? Um, there are no speakers for this item. Okay. No uh, members of the public present either to speak. All right. Uh, then we'll close the public hearing on this item. We'll go to, district, uh, to the district commissioner. Commissioner Moore, would you like to offer a motion for continuance? Yes, I would. I'd like to make motion to continue. Second, you read Okay. It'll be continued to... Uh, July 11th at 2 p.m. Uh, we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion passes and it is unanimous. We'll move to the next item on our agenda. And this is item I-22. I'll open the public hearing on this item. And Mr. Sorensen, I'm going to ask you once again to frame this item. All right, thank you, Mayor. The next item is a future land use map amendment as well as a rezoning. The request is to go from low density residential future land use to medium density residential and a rezoning from R1A to R3 restricted. For uh, the proposal is up to 85 senior housing, multifamily dwelling units, plus the existing religious institution. We're in District 2. This is an aerial of the subject property. The 85 senior multifamily housing units would be located on the southern half of the parcel and the existing church would remain on the northern half of the parcel. Again, the future land use currently is low density residential. The proposed future land use is medium density residential. The zoning is R1A 
the proposed zoning is R3 restricted. These are the restrictions. Uh, the local planning agency did add a third restriction to limit height of the proposed buildings to a maximum of two stories within 100 feet of adjacent property zoned R1 or R1A. If this request is approved, they will need Board of Zoning Adjustment approval um, for anything greater than one story within 100 feet of residential zoned properties. 684 public hearing notices were sent to an area extending beyond 1,000 feet from the subject parcel. Today we have received two commentaries in favor and two in opposition. A community meeting was held on February 9th with 24 residents in attendance with concerns for site access, the proposed use, height of the buildings, and traffic. At the local planning agency hearing, there was one speaker present to speak in opposition of the request. The local planning agency and staff are recommending that the amendment, ordinance, and rezoning be approved subject to three restrictions. Staff is available for any questions. All right. Uh, is the applicant on this item present? If so, would you like to come forward and offer any comments? Otherwise, um, we'll go to public comments. He's indicating no. So we're going to uh, move to the public comment portion. Do we have members of the public present who wish to be heard on this item? I have no speakers for this item, Mayor. All right. Uh, then we'll close the public hearing. We'll go to the district commissioner. Commissioner Moore, I know you've been uh, uh, monitoring this whole No, I've activity. been monitoring. Yes, I have. We're quiet people in district, too. <laughs> right. So, no, I'd like to make a motion to approve. Second, Gomez. We have a second by Commissioner Gomez Cadero. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Uh, the motion passes, and it is uh, unanimous. And I think Commissioner Mr. Scott is the only commissioner that is absent at this time. We'll move to the next item on our agenda. This is J20, 20, J23. Um, this will include an item that was pulled from this morning's agenda, uh, H1. And so we'll open these items at this time. And I'm going to ask Mr. Jason Sorensen, our chief planner, once again to frame this item. Thank you, Mayor. The next request is a change to the future land use of uh, office to high density residential student housing and a rezoning or a change to the PD. It'd be a PD substantial change, the change uh, track 7B to office, from office to student housing. The proposal is 896 student housing bedrooms. We're located in District 5. Again, the future land use currently is office. The proposed future land use is high density residential student housing and the zoning is PD. This is the land use plan showing the PD substantial change to change the designation or split the parcel 7 into 7A, 7B, and to change the designation from office to student housing for 7B. This is the aerial of the subject property. This is a zoomed out aerial showing the subject property as well as the overall quadrangle PD. As you can see in this map, um, the orange colored properties indicate student housing parcels, and the red property in the middle is a multifamily property that was recently approved. There are six waivers associated with the request to reduce parking, eliminate a masonry wall along the right of way, reduce minimum unit size, increase building height, increase bedrooms, and increase lot coverage. 142 public hearing notices were sent to an area extending beyond 800 feet from the subject parcel. To date, we have received zero responses. A community meeting was held on September 19th, 2022, with eight residents in attendance with concerns for noise, traffic, incompatibility, and crime. At the local planning agency hearing, there were no speakers present to speak during public comment. Through coordination with the District 5 office and the applicant, there is an additional condition of approval to require a six foot high precast wall on the northern portion of the two parcels that are just to the north of the um, sub student housing property. The local planning agency is recommending that the amendment ordinance rezoning and development order be approved subject to 23 conditions, including the conditions shown on the previous slide. Staff is available for any questions. All right, thank you, Mr. Sorensen. Uh, is the applicant on this item present? And if so, would you like to come forward and offer any comments?
Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. Rebecca Wilson, 215 North Eola Drive, here on behalf of the applicant. Um, we're just here to answer any questions that you all may have. My understanding, I'll turn it over to Joel. Uh, Mayor, <clears throat> shortly before uh, this afternoon's uh, meeting began, we uh, learned that there was an issue with the uh, advertisement for the zoning portion of this request, the CDR. Uh, so with that, the CDR cannot be considered for uh, approval today, this afternoon. Um, but however, the comp plan amendment and the related ordinance can be considered for approval today. So I think that would be the applicant's pre preference, if I understand. Rebecca, is that you would you're, like to move forward with the You're correct, order? Joel. And, okay. and also the development order was properly noticed. So, so, the, so we would just bring back the CDR at the next available meeting. The development order, was that uh, for the CDR or is that? It's part of the um, DRI. Okay. So, Mayor, we can, uh, we can consider everything but the CDR this afternoon and the CDR could be re-advertised, as I understand, for the June 6th board meeting, which is in uh, two weeks. And, and, Mayor, if I may, in terms of the advertisement of that uh, CDR, the issue or the concern from staff is that that condition of approval that's added actually affects a different portion of the property than what was advertised. And so because we're only, only advertised the portion of the property where the student housing is going, the request for the wall is along track 7A, not along the track 7B that's more explicitly being considered as part of that CDR. Okay. Um, I'm going to presume that Commissioner Bonilla is aware of the issue with the posting and... It wasn't posting. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, well, the issue... The notice. Uh, the I, that it I was not aware of that, but as we were going through this, it did seem odd the way it was presented, so... I could see where the issue is. Okay, but uh, I'm just going to ask a question. In terms of the um, additional um, condition, mm -hmm. you were... Oh, yes, the condition, I was. The condition. So, yes. okay. But so, exactly, that's why, how, yeah. as it was presented, since I already was aware of the condition because we worked on it, it wasn't presented in a way that made that clear. So, so everyone is essentially on the same sheet of music here. Okay. Yeah. okay. All right. So, uh, with with that in mind, uh, thank you, Ms. Wilson, uh, for your comments. Um, do we have any members of the public present who wish to be heard at this time? I have no speaker cards for this item, Mayor. Okay. Uh, then we'll close the public hearing portion. And in terms of uh, when we go to Commissioner Bonilla, the requested action um, is on the screen. Does this uh, encapsulate all of what was just said. Okay. Yes. And so, so, Mayor, you have here on the screen, on the top portion of the slide, there's four different items. The item that would not be considered for approval is the third one that says CDR 2210-317. However, the other three, SS 2210-82, the ordinance, and then DO 2303-109 could be approved today by the board. And we will bring back the CDR portion at the June 6th, June 6th afternoon uh, meeting uh, uh, of yes. this year. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Bonilla, uh, with that in mind, you understand what the motion will be? Okay. Yes, I do. Okay. Is there a motion? Oh, so, um, yes, I do want to meet with you right after this, though, because there are a couple of conditions I want to talk about on the CDR, so this actually works out for me. Um, so I'm going to make a motion to go ahead and approve the SS 2210-082 and approve the ordinance and, if I could do this all together, continue the CDR and approve the DO. Second, Scott. Okay. Did you catch that? Yay. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. So as long as the control is, is, is they understand the, the motion. We have a motion and we have a second. Commissioner Scott, you were the seconder? Yes, okay. Uh, with that, I'm going to call the question. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. All right, the motion passes and it is unanimous. All right, uh, thank you all for your presence this afternoon.
Uh, with that, then we are going to move forward on our agenda. We're going to move to item K24, and we'll open the public hearing on this item. And Mr. Sorensen, I'm going to call on you once again to frame uh, the item before us. All right, thank you, Mayor. This next item is just a feature land use map amendment to go from commercial to low medium density residential. And this is in District 2. The property already has a duplex on it, which is non conforming. Uh, the proposal is to go through this process to uh, legitimize the duplex. Uh, we're in District 2. Right now, the future land use map is commercial. The proposal is low medium density residential. And it already has the R2 zoning, which would allow for the duplex, so there's no change to the zoning. And this is north of Victor Drive and east of South Orange Blossom Trail. 143 public hearing notices were sent to an area extending beyond 600 feet from the subject parcel. To date, we have received three responses in opposition. A community meeting was held on April 3rd with no residents in attendance. At the local planning agency hearing, there were no speakers present to speak during public comment. The local planning agency is recommending that the amendment and ordinance be approved, and staff is available for any questions. All right, thank you, sir. Uh, is the applicant on this item present? If so, would you like to come forward and offer any comments? I'm the, uh, representing the owners. They're right there sitting in the audience. All right. No my comments? Name's, my okay. name's Hector Vidal, and I'm representing the Castillo family. Any additional comments? No, sir. No additional comments. All right. Stand by there. Thank you. Uh, do we have any members of the public present who wish to be heard on this item? There are no speakers for this item, Mayor. Okay. Then we'll close the public hearing at this time. We'll go to the District Commissioner. Commissioner Moore, would you like to offer a motion? Yeah, sure. Um, this area, doesn't. while well, it doesn't have any duplexes, it certainly has multifamily in the area. And um, our board, we you know, have improved the road. Ed Sawak's are right near a school. And so... I, even though it was a little unusual, I think it made sense because we need housing. So I'm happy to make a motion to approve. Second. Second. Okay. Motion on the second by Commissioner Gomez no, Cadero. It was here. Okay. It He's pointing at you. Okay. It's powerful. Okay. okay. It's a okay. powerful second. Okay. <laughs> okay. Who was him? Okay. Commissioner I'll, Scott. I'll take a second. Is the second there okay. on the motion? All right. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Uh, motion passes, and it is not unanimous. Not unanimous, Mayor, with one Commissioner Benito out. Pardon me? Not. Minus Commissioner Benito. Oh, uh, yes. Minus, uh, minus Commissioner Bonilla is, is not present. Okay. Uh, with that, we'll move forward uh, then to uh, work session agenda. This is uh, the final item that was is on our agenda for this afternoon. And uh, thank you all for your presence. Uh, we're going to go to Mr. Alan Marshall, uh, the assistant to the Director of Planning and Environmental Development Services Department, uh, who will be making a presentation at this time uh, on the Tree Preservation and Removal Ordinance. Uh, it's for general information, though a specific action is being requested today, just general guidance from the board. And with that, Mr. Marshall, you are recognized. Thank you, Mayor, and good afternoon, Commissioners. Uh, all morning you had some data-heavy presentations, and you're going to get another one uh, right here. It's got about 55 slides. You've seen, uh, because you were able to uh, give some time, which I really appreciate last week in your schedules, uh, you've seen some portions of this, so I'll try to move through the presentation uh, fairly efficiently. This is a work session on the ordinance. We, we, what we wanted to do was bring you a draft to see how that framework starts to appear in, in code standards. And so before we write it down in pen, well, you'll get to take a look at it uh, in pencil. So our presentation today will bring you through the background. We've been through about a year and a half here of discussion in front of the board. And then uh, we'll do an overview of the new, uh, just the highlights really of the, the new provisions that are put in the draft. There are some other issues that are, that are, that are coming along uh, with the new code. We'll go over those, and then I'll sum up and do some next steps. So taking you back to August of 2021 was our first work session uh, where we talked about 
the role and value of trees in, uh, in Orange County and within the urban service area. We talked about what our comp plan uh, and, and our code language stated. It's some of the obvious there, the protection of trees is essential. We should be careful when we are removing them. We should value um, you know, high, you know, and preserve high value trees. Later, of course, we found out there wasn't, uh, wasn't a whole lot of, that, a lot of that going on with the ordinance, but our, our studies showed that we had uh, a pretty healthy urban canopy, and we showed some percentages uh, there of about 35, 36, 37 percent canopy, which showed us, uh, you know, fairly similar to other urban areas around the country. Um, so our canopy was in pretty good health. At the bottom, that bottom uh, uh, chart there, you see that for the most part, we have a lot of smaller trees. So the first, the tall bar, the ones next to it, those are um, you know, basically eight, nine inches and, and less. So a, lar a lot of small trees, but not a lot of larger trees. And I think that became instructional for us as, as we move forward. So a couple of months later, we brought back a work session where we laid bare the issues of our code. We discussed the fact that many trees are either excluded or exempted from the code. Uh, mitigation caps, uh, that 90 inch mitigation cap per acre leaves a lot of other trees out of the uh, equation for mitigation. If you look at the photo up there, you remember, probably remember that, uh, that, that photo showing that line of specimen oaks there. These are 24 inch or larger oaks along what would be uh, a roadway there. And in this particular project, just to show you um, the difficulties we had in trying to preserve trees, the developer just wanted the dirt under them and that was the rationale for taking them out. There really wasn't anything we could do about it. We, you know, impressed upon them that those are valuable trees, but ultimately they came out. And I think that was one of the driving forces uh, for uh, some of the standards that we're putting into the code now. So from that uh, discussion, we went into a very robust effort at uh, stakeholder engagement. We asked the development industry, the nursery growers and husbandry industry, which was Ag Advisory Board and others, planners and designers and environmental advocates to put together their teams. We said, give us your best 10 to 12 folks and we'll set up two hour work sessions. This is kind of back in the COVID days of, of WebExes uh, there. But we had, uh, you know, our, our team and, and their teams had excellent discussions. These were, these were instructional for, for both sides. We talked about our challenges, they talked about their challenges, they educated us where we needed to be educated because when we wanted to think about new code standards, we wanted to do it with a fuller understanding uh, of things. So very diverse uh, professional groups um, helped us, uh, you know, kind of begin to, to formulate what that new framework should be. So then in August uh, of last year, we came back to the board and had a discussion about the essentially what needed to change within the code. And they, the, the issue started to fall in four buckets, if, if you will. We knew we had to protect more trees, and we laid out a couple of examples of how that might occur. We knew we had to preserve high value trees, and we already had specimen trees, but we talked about some other designations or expanding designations, additional credits uh, for, for preservation. We also knew we had to take a, a good look at our urban service area, urban forests, and we talked about uh, you know, the need to quantify and understand and value our trees from outside this building all the way to the edges of the county as an urban forest, okay? They're, they're not uh, distinct and, and apart. Uh, it's, it's part of a whole. But we also wanted to look at residential exemptions and right-of-way trees, some of the things that have caused us issues uh, over, over time. Then when you get to planting trees, so this is where are we getting the right mitigation or do we have the right replanting standards? Um, are we studying our, our canopy moving forward? So we knew we had those four, four buckets and we've stayed, uh, there hasn't been any scope creep here. We've stayed you know, within these boundaries as we put together uh, this draft that, that we're seeing today. So I'm gonna go over uh, the, some of the main sections here, and they're, they're listed uh, on the screen. And I'll just hit the highlight of, of what the, either the specific language or just the philosophy of, of the change was for, for each of them. And of course, starting out with an ordinance, you have that finding of fact and purpose, and we wanted to focus on establishing that urban forest model and have a canopy goal. Um, so we had, uh, you know, talking about having a healthy urban forest, diverse with various species and ages of native and Florida-friendly vegetation, 
And I told you before about that AmericanForest.org. They seem to be uh, the, the, the biggest and, and most valuable entity that has studied urban forests across the country. And they talked about the need to, in, in combating uh, the effects of climate change and just growth in general, uh, that you should have a goal or a target uh, of canopy coverage. And they laid that target out at 43.3%. Um, and like I said, we're at about 35 to 37. And so we, we put that goal in into the code. The second, uh, second portion of it uh, starts to talk about that value of native and Florida-friendly species and also um, adding in the, that, that newer language on you know, resiliency and sustainability. So in essence, modernizing the, the purpose of the ordinance. There are uh, five definitions here that I'll highlight uh, on three slides that uh, largely are just belts and suspenders for, for us. We know the, the disagreements and the fights and the struggles that we've had over the last 20 plus years of the language in the previous code. And so we're trying to put in the language that A, we need that either, that either solidifies the philosophy that we know the current ordinance has or that it needs um, to be effective moving forward. So properly identifying what cleaning is, and that's, that's work that can be done without a permit that doesn't uh, have the effect of clearing trees, but identifying some additional um, qualifying language for clearing there. It doesn't include routine maintenance, such as mowing. Uh, so these are things that will help us if, use the ordinance more effectively and also be instructional for, for the, uh, the public and for developers. Developed property and development order um, help us identify different mitigation and exempt status. And so we've talked about that 90 inch per acre cap. And we, even though the, the ordinance didn't explicitly say it, that is for undeveloped property. So if you've already developed the property, you don't get another bite at that 90 uh, inch cap. But the language didn't exactly say it. We know it was the intent when we passed the ordinance 20 years ago, but we put that language in there now so that it's clear. And development order just helps understand the universe uh, of permits that you could have had that will, would satisfy the current ordinance and that you already got, uh, that you already had received uh, a tree permit or a tree authorization under the current or previous codes. Limit of work uh, is an issue for, for staff we want to make sure that the, the applicant is quantifying the, uh, the proper uh, clearance and also mitigation calculations. Sometimes when you get an application in and they'll say, well, we're going to clear here, but we're going to preserve all those trees in the back of the lot where we're not doing any work. Well, that's, that's not really part of the, the calculations. The preservation should be in the area that you're working, and so we're putting in a definition for a limit of work to make that clear. There is the opportunity for preservation outside the limit of work, and I'll cover that later on in the slide. Uh, we're looking to make sure that uh, there is a state uh, exemption for deteriorated or damaged trees, and we're just chewing up uh, our language in the code. Um, actually, I think I've got to check to see if it's uh, the occupied might be a different term, but we just make sure that that, uh, that language mirrors the, the state language. It's, it's not an exemption for any tree. It's just trees that are... Uh, deteriorated or damaged or, or otherwise uh, a potential danger on the property. We have right now um, a two acre or less uh, exemption for occupied residential dwellings. So if you're living in a house and you want to take a tree out, you don't need to have a permit or mitigation for it. Some of the fights and difficulties that we've had over the years have been with right-of-way trees. And so what we're doing is decoupling that those right-of-way trees from that exempt part of the residential property because they were put there or they have a value and we want to make sure that they follow um, at least mitigation standards uh, when they might have to come out because occasionally they do. They might be intruding on a pipe or something like that, but we want to make sure that the mitigation is there. <clears throat> so um, this, now we're getting into tree protection uh, during construction. So protective barriers, we require protective barriers now. What we're doing is widening that from six to 10 feet. So if you're gonna, you know, you'll have to have a, maybe a barrier, a circle barrier that goes around that tree. It's either 10 feet or the drip line. Um, you have to be a little flexible because sometimes trees might go off at an odd angle and the drip line might not clearly, you know, cover that area. So you have the opportunity for either the 10 foot or the drip line. 
Now we get into uh, one of the biggest issues, which is the preservation standards. So our current ordinance, as you know, has specimen trees. There are live oaks and magnolias of a certain size. Uh, we talked about expanding that list. You've seen this list at the, at the last uh, work session. And we chose these trees because of either unique services that they provide, whether it's uh, food for uh, you know, squirrels or other animals or uh, butterflies and other insects. They also have the ability, and specifically the longleaf pine as well, because that serves certain threatened and endangered species. Uh, but we also wanted to have species that existed on kind of that, that, that gradient from the edge of the edge of wetlands, sort of wetter soils where you have uh, the bald cypress, all the way up to more scrub species like the turkey oak. So we're just trying to make sure that we have the, that preservation availability, no matter if you're a high dry property or, or potentially have some, uh, some wetter lands. Obviously, our current wetland ordinance covers areas of wetlands. Um, but this handles uh, anything within the uplands, and, and all of those species can exist within uplands. Heritage trees, those are the live oak and, and magnolia at that larger size of 40 inches and, and 24 inches, and they um, have that kind of that unique status uh, in the county where they might, or they might be very explicitly uh, told to remain in residential areas, and we'll talk about that. Uh, we have, we're putting in some very specific uh, uh, numbers for enf enforcement violations, and all of these numbers on the screen are some relationship to the $106 per inch requirement for mitigation. So that 19,000 uh, uh, number is essentially two times the the number that you would be required for mitigation if you if you since we have that 90 inch per acre, 90 times 106 is 9,000 something, and twice that is 19 uh, 1990. So. That's uh, the first one is if you clear, you're going to get that penalty. If we can't determine the DBH inches that were taken out, if we do, it's calculated that, uh, at that $106. If there are specimen trees that are taken out, it's double, so 212. If there are permit identified trees, so you've already said on your plan that you're going to save this tree, and later it comes out, you're going to pay three times uh, that 106. And then for heritage trees, it's five times. <clears throat> so now this is part of getting more accurate uh, information or accounting on a site. So it tells the surveyors um, not only do they have to survey the trees, but all regulated trees and proposed preserved trees. So this is just giving our staff better information uh, on applications. And there's one other uh, site where we do that in the code as well. Now we start to get to general preservation. So we get into the actual permit requirements of the codes. So we start off or try to start off with some general preservation requirements. And essentially we're saying that regulated trees, those eight inches and above, um, we're not talking about noxious or invasive trees, but we're talking about trees on our recommended stock list. If they are located in open space areas, they are, uh, they have that general preservation status. If you're not building anything there, essentially leave the trees. There are times when you might have to activate a park, and our staff will work, you know, with those if they need a little bit of space. But essentially, it's not uh, you're not. And Commissioner Wilson did a good job showing that one site plan there with you know devoid of trees. That's that's not the situation that we're that we want to have moving forward. So, trees in areas of open space should remain, and heritage and specimen trees shall be preserved to the maximum extent practicable. So. Those are general conditions, and we'll get to more specific ones uh, in a few minutes. So this is one of the biggest challenges uh, that's out there, which is it just issues associated with grading. So changes to a site's existing grade. There are some standards in our code now, but they're very loose. They're essentially, they just say if you have to clear or grade for any, what, any purpose, you can take the trees out. But what we're saying here, getting a little bit tighter, saying that shall only occur when necessary to meet county code or other regulatory requirements. So if you've got to maybe meet the height of a crown of a road or there's some base flood elevation or something, uh, you're going to have to show us what, why they're trying to achieve that height if, if they're bringing in fill. And that fill, uh, and this is only in areas where it's going to take out trees, obviously. But if they're bringing in only you know, up to 24 inches of fill, and this isn't a scientific determination. We sat around and you know tried to determine what was that what was that height where you could grade it back down reasonably uh, to save some trees, and we agreed on 24 inches, so two feet of fill. 
So if you're bringing in two feet of fill, you should be able to pull that back down and save some trees. But if you've got to bring in a lot more fill than that, we're not looking to make tree swimming pools, you know, or other potentially hazardous situations, but you should be able to kind of work within the land there to save some trees. The second one there, trees may be relocated to other areas of the development site to accommodate grading challenges, um, not just because you want to, but grading challenges. Relocated trees uh, may be subject and frankly will be subject to a monitoring period with success criteria. And that is something that I think will have to happen unique to each site. So different kinds of trees are going to require potentially different uh, monitoring periods, success criteria, things like that, whether it's five years, whether it's 10 years, whatever it is, the intent is for that tree, if it's moved, to live. If it doesn't, it's going to be mitigated the same way that you would um, anything else um, in, the, in the ordinance. So now uh, I said there was other areas where we're trying to give our reviewers better information. So this brings down that essentially the details of our, in our landscape plan onto our, our PSP plans, our construction plans. So there's not going to be a situation where you're looking at a set of plans and it doesn't show the trees on it because that's where our staff need that information to say why or to ask the question why. Um, if, if a tree is coming out because of, uh, you know, a building or something like that or, a, or um, a, you know, some type of parking or whatever. It just gives our staff an understanding of why trees need to come out. It's just not uh, a, a blank site. <clears throat> so now we get to those more specific standards. So you're going to see standards for residential com and commercial on this in this one section, and then the second one will be for industrial. So starting out with those preservation standards. So now we're talking about specimen and heritage trees. <coughs> Excuse me. So tree removal associated with residential, commercial, institutional, or recreational development plans, uh, again, shall make reasonable attempts to preserve specimen and heritage trees. In addition, specimen and heritage trees may not be removed within property line setback areas or buffer areas. So essentially on the outside, if they're there, leave them there. If they're located in an area where you're proposing a parking lot or an area where you're proposing a stormwater pond, figure out a way to work them into the design. And I'll show you some examples of that uh, a little bit later on of how that might work. <clears throat> Excuse me. Though, so the most onerous uh, standard that's in here is, is number three, and that's for heritage trees. So heritage trees must be incorporated into the design of a single-family residential subdivision plan. Those are the plans that have the most flexibility in, in their design. Typically, a commercial site is going to be a big building, a parking lot, and a pond. <clears throat> but residential sites have the ability to have some variability in them. And so essentially, if you've got heritage trees in there, work it out. Number four is that check and balance for when it's possible that on certain sites, there's going to be a lot of these big trees, okay? And we, we're not trying to hamper development here. We're trying to get a certain level of preservation where we had none before. So right there is a, a, a cap, essentially, of three specimen or heritage trees. It can be any combination of them per acre, okay? So industrial is a step down uh, there. We're not looking to provide habitat necessarily or, or wildlife areas on industrial sites, but essentially if you've got specimen or heritage trees around the outside in those buffer areas, leave them there. If you happen to have a parking lot that is for guests or for your stand, you know, for workers, leave it there. But we're not talking about parking lots that might be used for your concrete trucks or your delivery trucks and other kinds of things like that, okay? <clears throat> just where it shows or it has that value. And then again, the three trees per acre. <coughs> Sorry about that. Now we get down to individual, obviously the smallest here, individuals, uh, single family and duplex uh, lot development. Um, essentially, we're just telling them, make reasonable efforts to preserve those trees. If it's, if it's far enough away from, from the house where it's not impeding anything on, on a small lot, uh, make every attempt uh, to preserve them. And the next slide is just now for, for individual. So it's essentially the same standards for individual, uh, commercial, and industrial <coughs> in those multifamily lots. Now we start talking about uh, tree replacement and off-site mitigation. So specimen and heritage trees would have to be replaced on a 3 to 1 and 5 to 1 ratio. Just regulated trees, not specimen and heritage, would be, uh, would be the same as it is now as with 1 to 1. <clears throat> that mitigation cap we've talked about, that 90-inch per acre cap. 
we are leaving that cap as it is, but we are not including inches from specimen or heritage trees. So it's 90 plus. It's 90, and then if you have any inches from specimen or heritage trees, you're going to mitigate for them as well. <clears throat> this next slide talks about um, replacement credits. So when trees are taken out, you start to you build up a tally, a number of inches that come out. You can buy that number down by doing replanting on the site. And our landscape code requires a two-inch uh, replacement tree. <clears throat> but if you put a little bit larger, a three-inch replacement tree, you can start to buy that down. And that's in our current code. This is just moved language, so it looks underlined. But the difference here being that specimen or heritage trees, so the inches for specimen and heritage trees must be re uh, replaced with a five-inch caliper uh, tree. And we're still discussing whether or not <clears throat> there will be a requirement for the same species. You know, we just deciding whether there's a, a need for that type of a restriction or whether it can be any other tree at, at five inches. Preservation credits, these are, this is uh, important. We're, we're trying to incentivize preservation throughout this ordinance. And so if we want to give as much credit as possible, and, and we are giving the same amount of credit as we took if it's coming out, three to one and five to one, for preserving more specimen and heritage trees above that three per acre requirement. So and, and a good way to buy down some of that number is to preserve more of, of these trees. So when you see D there, uh, trees located outside the proposed limit of work may only count towards preservation with an easement. So essentially, if, you're, if you've got an area of your development site that's not within the limit of work, has trees on it, and you're going to say, I'm going to preserve those trees for taking these out, we have to have some surety that there's not going to be development there later. And so what you do is you put a conservation easement. We do this with wetlands all the time. <coughs> conservation easement turns the development rights over to the county. And so we know we have um, an area that's going to remain as is. Last slide here, uh, essentially on the code, is uh, where we're trying to cook some biodiversity into the plans. So when you're, when you're uh, assessing and going to clear trees off of a site, <clears throat> the things that have lived on that site, the animals and the insects, birds, um, have been using those trees, okay? And so they're accustomed to uh, the, you know, the specifics of those species. And so we want to make sure that we put some of those species back, okay, so that they have that recognition. Um, and so that requirement is in with uh, essentially what will be in with their landscaping plan. And then uh, depending on how many trees they remove, we want to make sure that they're putting not just a monoculture of the, the, the best tree that they got a good deal on, you know, at the, you know. <laughs> so three, three different species or five or seven. The last thing is we're moving uh, the recommended stock list and the requirements for residential lot trees to Chapter 24. It just, it just lives better there. That's where you would go for that information. And so there will just be that, um, that throw from 15 over, uh, over to 24. So I told you I'd show you some examples. Um, obviously, you don't have you know, plans that are designed for, for the new code. But what we did is tried to find plans that have been approved that show some of the effects of what we're looking for. Okay, moving forward. And so first, we we'll have one that talks about open space uh, saving trees, uh, specimen heritage near stormwater ponds, and one for parking lots, and then preservation cap per acre. This, <clears throat> up at the top, you see a, you know, a fairly small residential uh, subdivision there, one street in. Everything in purple, uh, those are mostly oaks, and everything in blue are, are pines. So these areas now, uh, uh, this, this situation, Call, this particular property called for extra open space, but this is really what we're looking to gain out of uh, having a requirement to keep open space trees. You see all those numbers in there. There's, you know, I'm trying to look at it. It's easier to see here. 22s and 18s and 16s and 24s. There's big trees in there, and they've saved that all throughout uh, those open space uh, areas. This was their, the circle at the top was their sort of their activity area, and they actually did a great job saving the pine trees there as well. Pine trees are exempt. They could have taken them out. Uh, but big oaks in there and, and good pines. So, a, you know, it's a good plan, but this is kind of what we're looking for moving forward. I also want to give them credit for keeping those uh, oaks around the outside. Now, so just kind of pretend that those 22s are 24. 
um, and they would be um, required uh, to stay there under under the new uh, proposal because they'd be around sort of that outside buffer. This is a commercial site. Uh, up in the upper left is uh, what, what, what will be a gas station convenience store. But what we're really looking at is where they're going to put their stormwater pond. <clears throat> it's a dry pond down here at the bottom of the property. So in our code, it says that if you have specimen trees or heritage trees in, in or near where you're proposing parking lots or stormwater ponds, you have to incorporate them into the design. So that inset is that dry pond. This 60-inch live oak, which came out, would have been right about there in the, you know, that corner of the dry pond. So I'm going to show you what we're looking for here with these new standards on a different site plan. So up in the upper left, you see the proposed dry pond. That's what we're looking for. Okay, some artistic uh, consideration given to the, the edge of that pond to save the tree. I also want to give these folks good credit for a parking plan that didn't take out. They, they probably could have gone in there and just did a big rectangle and, and taken those trees out. And again, we're just here speculating that they're specimen, at least specimen uh, species in size. Here's a more intensive, uh, this site was completely treed and it was completely scraped. Uh, it's a you know, fitness center, it's got uh, heavy, heavy parking on it. And just overlaying the tree plan on top of it, you see all the trees you know, that were coming out. And this is just the, obviously the area for parking. So what you're going to be looking for, designers are going to be looking for, okay, where are my specimen and heritage trees? Well, there they are. And when you drop out the tree plan and look at that over top of what the, at least their intentional design was, you see that some of those trees <coughs> are in the drive line or drive lanes. But if you drop them out, you can see where there are opportunities to save those large, mature, valuable trees. You move those islands over a little bit, and there's, you know, three, four, five, uh, six trees there that... Uh, that probably could live a long life even in that even in that parking lot. So I'm going to show you that accounting. We talked about those three trees uh, per acre. <clears throat> Very small subdivision here, just one lane in. Uh, you're kind of skewed to the top because that's really where the trees were. There weren't many just down below. So I've just kind of skewed it to the top. But they did a good job here. I mean, they saved these two 40-inch oaks, this 42 and a 60, these two 30s, this 44. Um, and even this 26-inch uh, oak along the front of one of the properties, <clears throat> they actually did uh, a pretty good, interesting design with their wall, too, to, um, you know, so that they didn't have to take those trees out. So you know, kudos for them for, for a good plan. But now if you're looking at about 3.3 acres and three trees per acre, that's 10 or so uh, trees that, that we would be looking to see if there's that opportunity. So you start to see those that 44 there, this 41, and this 29. These are opportunities, okay, where and I can't say whether, maybe there's a reason why they can't be, but it's, it's at least those are the decisions that, that planners are going to be looking for um, for saving trees. They've also got an opportunity down here in the front of uh, a lot there with that 26-inch oak. So just kind of showing you how that accounting might work on, on one uh, set of plans. So now moving to show you how the mitigation will work uh, differently under this new code. Now, if you remember, pine trees were exempt and are exempt now under our code. Uh, the, in, in the draft, they are not exempt. So the, this particular site, 4.7 acres, I'll show you the, <clears throat> the tree plan there. A after the wetland permit, you probably have you know, three, three and a half acres, something like that, maybe it's three acres um, of developable area. Under the old code, um, 97% of these trees are pines, uh, and there were a couple of oaks and maples, and they were in the A's and C zones where they got taken out. So out of the several hundred trees that were on that site, um, only four were mitigated at 45 inches. So that was $4,770. Under the new code, everything eight inches and above uh, would, would count. So then you'd, you'd put your, apply your 90. Now, there are no specimen or heritage, so there's no plus there, it's just the 90 cap, and so you're at least mitigating 270 inches at uh, 28,620. So this site is a Publix, okay? We all know what Publix look like in the box, that's where the building uh, is, and we've talked a little bit already about how we handle the areas on the outside, and we've talked a little bit about how we handle trees in the parking lots, now we're talking about here's where the building is. Really, this is where trees have to come out. <clears throat> but those trees that they're identifying there, those are all specimen oaks, okay? They're all 24 inches, and so that's the plus, 
Okay, so you're going to they're going to hit their 90 inch per acre for sure um, with all the, that tree canopy that that had to come out uh, for um, for parking and otherwise. Again, this these examples are illustrative. They're not perfect, you know, but that's where we'd be looking for that additional mitigation. Okay, that that, that mitigation for the loss of those trees that we consider most valuable. Um, they are those specimen and heritage trees. So that's. 20, an additional $20,000 in mitigation uh, right there for those. Now, they have the ability to buy that down. They put five-inch trees in. They work them into their uh, plan. They can build that down. Um, and uh, I guarantee you the site will, will look a lot better over time for that. So um, that's, that's essentially the, the end of that ordinance review. We, when we got the first draft, we didn't just hang on to it until it was perfect. We kicked it out to everybody. Um, just so they could start to see the kinds of concepts that we're talking about, we sent them to your office, to the Greater Orlando Builders Association focus group, <coughs> environmental groups, advisory boards. Um, we gave presentations to our Environmental Protection Commission and Sustainability Advisory Board. We got positive comments from them. Had a meeting with the GOBA focus group. We've got another one set up here in a couple of weeks. Um, but uh, essentially, there, the developers were wanting to make sure we still had flexibility to deal with design challenges, and we believe we do uh, within there. And they also said just be cautious about p potential mitigation costs. So we'll continue those discussions with them moving forward. So those other issues that I said come along with this, uh, it's been 20 plus years. Uh, so we did a fee analysis, getting their current labor costs. And essentially, since we know we're going to have to be doing more inspections, what is that cost of the arborist uh, site inspection? So it's about 2.7 hours of staff time and some travel and ancillary costs. So what you see in that, um, and then scaled obviously to property, you have small properties and, and large properties and you, you, don't want, you want to make sure that you're treating them appropriately with the amount of their fee. So you have the current uh, fees in that first column, our draft proposed fees, and again there's some new fees there, but those are essentially the cost recovery for inspections. You know, we're just doing more inspections now and doing the cost recovery for that. And so you see, you know, very nominal increases there, or $124. They're, the development community isn't concerned about those kinds of numbers. If they were going up 1,000, 2,000, uh, that might be a concern. But essentially what we're doing here is just chewing up the labor cost and then calculating, getting that cost recovery for additional inspections. Our tree replacement trust fund, we, uh, you, we, this is where money that, uh, if mitigation amounts aren't done on site, they're paid to the county, goes into that fund. We've talked before about how we use that with tree giveaways with IFAS and planning on county <coughs> property, which in, in recent years has been in road right of way. But we have other opportunities for neighborhood enhancement projects. But what I want to talk to you about is that data-driven uh, effort that we're trying to employ now uh, for this and also our requirements with, for that equity lens that's uh, in our Title VI uh, plan. And I'll show you what kind of how that looks on, on a chart here. So our Title VI non-discrimination uh, plan uh, last adopted has environmental justice indicators. You see the six of them there from low-income households to older adults and overcrowded households. Once you start to get three or more of those in a particular census area, you create a SEPA, County Equity Priority Area. So what this means is in these areas, when we are offering services and programs and when we're providing information, we should start to gravitate toward these areas and provide extra resources. And you start to see where those are, you know, are occurring around the county. And I'll point out just one here. Um, because not only is it uh, the, uh, has a six in that uh, SEPA score, but it also has uh, one of the lowest is 10% canopy coverage, and that's the Sky Lake area there. So these are things that we would use in trying to plan for uh, programs, whether it's you know, starting to invest in our communities with trees. We also have the layer for county properties, easements, ponds, parks, green place. I pulled up you know, one that's the Michigan complex there, and you can see that on part of it, it's saying it's 30%, 20%, 10%. But again, these are just resources for us to try to make more educated plans about where we're going to plant trees. So in summary, protection and um, preservation of trees is critical for our future. Um, everyone benefits uh, from a healthy tree canopy. Our county's urban forest uh, must be properly managed to develop a diversity of species and ages, and that's what that preservation is doing, and also some of the biodiversity standards. <clears throat> when we, when uh, developers plan 
uh, sites, they need to minimize impacts to trees and, and maximize preservation. And when we plant trees, we need to make sure that we have the highest and best use of those trees and uh, the needs of our community in mind. That snip on the side, even though it has sort of an artistic little edge to it, that's actually out of a, an application or a plan set, plan set that we have. I think it might be a park, but either way, if it's something could show what we're striving for here, at the top it says specimen tree inches removed, zero. Non-specimen tree inches removed, zero. Specimen tree inches preserved, one at 24 inches. Non-specimen tree inches preserved, 1,350. So whatever it was, it was built and it didn't impact um, any of the trees. And so just a little bit of inspiration there uh, for something that actually um, is in our files. So our next steps are um, you know, taking the comment of the board today, because we're here to see, are we, are we getting close to the mark? Is there something big that, or, or you know, uh, meaningful that has been left out or needs to be discussed? but then go into that final round of discussions with uh, the builders and uh, advisory boards like our development advisory board, then put together a work session for planning and zoning and look to come back to the board sometime in probably September. When we do uh, come back in September, there will be several actions that we'd be looking for, which is uh, to update that <coughs> or to adopt that fee schedule. And uh, there probably will be some staffing resources uh, needs that will come along with that along with the ordinance adoption and probably with an effective date at least uh, January 1st. It's going to take a little time to, to ramp up uh, for us. We've got to update our current processes and our, and our equipment, our land development management system, hire some people, do training, and then there's a lot of outreach and assistance that needs to be, you know, in the forefront of this uh, for, our, for, for the public. So, Mayor, that's the end of the presentation. Thank you. All right. Um, <clears throat> Uh, great job as usual, pretty comprehensive uh, as we move forward. Uh, we're opening up for any questions or comments uh, about members of the board. We'll start with Commissioner Wilson. Oh, my gosh. I even, wait. I even waited this time. I thought I was going to be super. <laughs> sure. But I also might be the most excited person, like jumping around in my seat. I don't know. If, potentially the Lorax in the back of the room is also super excited. Raise your hand, Jim Ward, for being the person that I can make eye contact with when I start to get anxiety up here about our, our canopy situation. Humongous thank you for the deep dive and the comprehensive layout of this for us today. I know it's not perfect, and, and we talked about this, but we've got to get moving, so this is that, right? And we've got really tangible items of update that are going to be very, I think, impactful and consequential. Um, I did want to raise a couple things that had come up in my conversations with people in the community and their concerns. Um, I know that most um, single-family housing in Orange County, you know, it's a luxury item if you get to do two-plus acres. Um, you're probably in a rural settlement where there are certain open space requirements anyway. Um, what is the opportunity that we have potentially in that under two acre? Because I saw that it's exempt from. Well, uh, the board can discuss and decide whether that is an investment that you'd like to make. Obviously, <clears throat> once you start to bring in single family to this, then number one, you've got, really got to get out and talk to single family homeowners. Essentially, this, this code deals with developers, essentially. Okay, and We've done a lot of stakeholder work with them. Plus, you start to get into the issues of capacity, okay? Because now, now you're adding in a significant multiplier of the potential for issues and calls and permitting. Um, I think the other thing that might be useful to, to consider is that the, the costs for, for mitigation um, for developers might be a little different than how you might treat a, a homeowner. Okay, so if I were to tell you you're going you know, to take that 30-inch oak out in your yard, if I told you that now you owe me $11,000, I mean, you're probably going to pay $11,000 to have the tree taken out, you know, but, but that mitigation. So we'd probably have to get back into some discussion about how to build uh, a matrix, uh, a watch that works mm -hmm. for single-family homeowners versus developers yes. in, in general. So we've, we've had those discussions internally, and I think we've, to this to date, mm -hmm. we've sort of moved away from that. Um, plus, we've not heard, it's not necessarily an outcry that's that's yeah. there, um, but it's obviously the board's desire. Well, and I was going to say, and just to make sure that we sort of all understand maybe opportunities for 
education of existing neighborhoods. And, and you know, I think we had, we had the experience of going out and discussing things right. where you realize there were two groups arguing that were arguing the same side because, you know, they, they really wanted the value that the trees were bringing, but it just, you know, as things rolled out over time, right. um, it, you know, they needed to figure out how they were going to make that work in that space. And I think, um, you know, that brings me to um, the educational component of this, right? So understanding that obviously you're involving so many different stakeholder groups and have since we started this conversation, since you all started working on this. And, you know, how does that look internally? Because I do, you know, we have such a huge workforce that's out there. And, you know, we think about those, um, those guys that really do the hard work in our public works teams. And how is that training going to happen as this is adopted in the future? Right. Yeah, and that's some of that, that delay that's on the screen right there, that, that 90 days is really for us to make sure that public works and utilities and, and all the field people, anybody that might be associated with assessing trees or having any kind of authority for, you know, for them and their care, have an understanding of what our code provisions require and what processes we have. So and as, as you know, we're kind of focused on that right now as well. Yeah, perfect. And I think um, the other one that seems to come up, bubble up within the environmental groups is the interest in the scrub oak. And, you know, I know that we had had a brief conversation, but if you want to just maybe address it, hit on that real quick so that we can sort of better understand the, the trees that made the list and why. Right. So the issue uh, with scrub oaks is, is, is a valid thing, certainly for, for discussion. Obviously, the, our, our current code is and, and has been eight inches or less. So um, we, we have an understanding of how that might have been Im implemented in the past. But of course, we also know that as we develop, we're getting less and less and less you know, undeveloped property. But scrub oaks are smaller uh, trees, and uh, they it might take quite a bit for them to get to eight inches, okay? And so if you have a, a property with a lot of scrub oak on it, and they're all eight inches and below, they can all come out without a permit, okay? And so for us to consider that uh, without creating too difficult uh, a set of circumstances where you have different kinds of trees with different size limits, that may be something we've got to talk about internally about talking about a community or, or a particular density of them or percentage of them Okay, so there might be a couple of different ways we could think about that. Scrub oaks, these are important communities, and uh, you know, it's it's our Sierra Club and and you know Orange Audubon who are bringing this forward, and and I've talked with them. I said this is a, this is a valid thing. We just need to talk about how it could be implemented right. if and there's I, something there. Well, and that's pretty much what I I think was important that mm -hmm. you're rearticulating and, right. and that I've tried to explain too was that that is part of the conversation about the entire habitat. So. Mm -hmm. Like that upland, valuable upland habitat right. needs to continue to be something that we're keeping an eye on and figuring out ways to, to preserve. And then um, as far as the equity lens, I, I have to point out that though I understand the incentivizing of affordable housing is complex and we need to do it, that incentivizing by saying they don't need to preserve trees or to mitigate trees doesn't seem fair. Poor people need trees too. And so I don't know if I love that in, in the language. Yeah, well, I, I don't I actually, that might be a misunderstanding either okay. of, of us or, or with you, because I think all it's doing is saying that they don't have to pay the $80 application fee. Oh, so they don't have, so there is Which the is same current, standard, the same development standard. standards are across yeah. the board. Okay. Yeah. Then I it's did. just I, application fees. Okay. Okay. That's what and I wanted not, to make sure. And if it's not, we'll talk about oh, so it. Yeah. I wanted to make sure, because I'm like, okay, that. Yeah. When I saw that in the email, I was like, okay, I don't think. I think somebody read it really fast. Okay, but. so it is purely the application fee for yeah, a we'll double check it. Okay. Yeah. Um, and the part that I, I think I raised to you all earlier when we were looking at that map, um, our existing code that we're updating right now, um, much like the one now, requires a certain, um, this to come forward and for these, the, the plan, right, the existing code said that we had to make sure there was a plan at the PSP stage. And that picture, um, the aerial was several years ago, so today we reviewed the PSP. It has been cleared for five years. And so my, you know, my final question just is how do we make sure that even the things that were required by the old code as far as the timing on that grubbing or clearing that we're enforcing it and able to really be able to have some confidence in, in I think, the work that's gone into this? So right now in the code, I believe it says that you cannot do the clearance and there's no more zones or anything like that before, because before that had right. something to do with it. But essentially, you can't clear until you're 90 days out from the actual development, okay? That's in the existing code. Well, that's in 
in this draft as well. Okay, that, yeah. I know, and I understand that. And that's why I was pointing out that that has not clear. I mean, there is nobody that follows right. that, or maybe three people in the whole county. Right. So, no, we, I mean, we talked about internally if there was something else we needed to amend to that, um, but essentially, it's just enforcing it. That's, and that's <laughs> yeah. my that's my question. That's yeah. my point. Is just trying to make sure. I, the words have all the meaning that we want to put into them and that they are followed up by action because, you know, there was, like I said, I mean, we're talking, you know, 90 days plus three years, 90 mm -hmm. days plus five years. So I, I think right. we just have to make sure that there's some enforceability addition. <laughs> so, Agreed. but thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm, I'm super grateful. And I just wanted to cheer when I saw this today. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Bonilla. Yes, I was, I mean, I was going to bring up everything that you brought up. It was the same email I got from, from the Audubon Society on those same issues. But I will say that um, when you were mentioning the, the scrub oak, you know, I was reminded of the line from Disney's Pocahontas, how high will a sycamore grow? You'll never know if you cut it down. <laughs> so, you know, I definitely, I mean, scrub environment is just so important and it's you know it's going away quite quickly here in Florida and so I really would like to make sure that we do think about the that ecosystem and that we're preserving that thank you all right, thank you. All right. well mr. Marshall you and your team you have come to that part of the day where you're off the hook I'm waiting all day Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, obviously, this will be coming back before us, and um, but um, kudos to our staff. They've been doing the yeoman's work of uh, staying focused uh, with, with bringing these um, proposals before us. So uh, with that, uh, if there is nothing else, um, we stand adjourned.